Demonstrators lined up outside the Charlotte Convention Center over the weekend. Most were peaceful with few major reported incidents. This afternoon, Republicans officially renominated both President Trump and Vice President Pence. The president spoke for nearly an hour today. He again cast unsubstantiated doubts on the safety of mail-in voting and claimed without evidence that Democrats plan to take the election away from him. Bad things happened last time with the spying on our campaign, and that goes to Biden and that goes to Obama. And we have to be very, very careful. We have to be very, very careful. And this time, they're trying to do it with the whole post office scam. They'll blame it on the post office. You could see them setting it up. Be very careful and watch it very carefully, because we have to win. This is the most important election in the history of our country. Mr. Trump is expected to speak at the RNC during each of the four days. His full remarks will come Thursday evening from the White House. Tonight, we'll hear from Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina, one of just three black United States senators and the only Republican. Other primetime speakers will include House Minority Whip Steve Scalise, House Oversight Ranking Member Jim Jordan, former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Nikki Haley, and the president's son, Donald Trump Jr. A number of conservative activists will also speak. What's less clear is the agenda from the Republicans this week and the next four years. The party is not voting on a platform at the convention. The platform typically lays out the party's policy goals if they reclaim the White House. Instead, Republicans are vowing their, quote, strong support for the president and his America First agenda. For his part, the president has unveiled his pledges for a second term. They include returning to normal in 2021, holding China accountable for the coronavirus, and draining the swamp. The Trump campaign has not laid out how the president intends to achieve these goals. Let's bring in our panel, Ed O'Keefe, Caitlin Huey Burns, and Liz Goodwin. Ed is a CBS News political correspondent. Caitlin is a CBSN political reporter. And Liz is deputy Washington bureau chief for the Boston Globe. Welcome to you all. Ed, I want to get right to you. I hear you have some breaking news on Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. What have you learned? That's right, Elaine. Look, after several days of questions about this, the Biden-Harris campaign now says that the Democratic nominee and vice presidential nominee will be tested regularly for COVID-19 and that the staff that comes into contact with them regularly also will be. There were questions over the weekend and, and since Thursday when they were together at the convention in Wilmington about whether or not, especially the vice president, former vice president, had been tested at all for the virus. Uh, the campaign continued to say that he hadn't been. And then yesterday on one of the Sunday shows, one of his uh, spokespeople was asked about it again, said he doesn't have it, but he hasn't been tested, which caused a lot of confusion and questioning as to how she would know that if he hadn't in fact been tested. So today now they're saying he will be. They say this is uh, in keeping with the advice of medical professionals. And notably, Elaine, and, and let's remember this in the event that we learn about something later, the campaign says that if either of them tests positive, they will tell the world that, uh, that that, in fact, has happened in a bid with transparency. Again, all of this, they say, is, is keeping with the responsible behavior they've been trying to promote. I suppose the only question is why it took them so long to announce this. Uh, but they concede that part of this is because the two of them may begin traveling soon across the country. There's currently no plan for them to do that. In fact, this week they're keeping a very light schedule focused mostly on virtual events for Senator Harris. Uh, but it's a sign that they acknowledge it's something that has to be done and will be done in the future. Well, that was going to be my question, Ed, is about why it took so long, several days, you said, to get a definitive answer on this. It's just not clear right now. It is a good question. And, and, and you know, uh, part, of, part of the frustration, frankly, for reporters has been, uh, A, we've been asking it pretty relentlessly over the last several weeks, but B, reporters who were there in the room last week to witness Harris and Biden's speeches, remember, they gave them in what was essentially a converted television studio to make it look like the convention hall. But in each instance, there were about 20 reporters from the various news outlets who were part of the so-called pool in the room who'd had to undergo rigorous testing beforehand in order to be there, in order to get clearance to attend. Not only to clear a, 
Secret Service uh, clearance, of course, at this point now, but you also have to pass a medical test. So the question was, well, if we have to do it, why isn't the candidate doing it, especially given his age and the potential risk? So now the campaign saying it will happen. Uh, we'll see uh, again uh, what that looks like and if they tell us on a regular basis how often or after which events. Uh, and most importantly, their vow to let us know if, in fact, one of them does test positive. Obviously, we don't want that to happen. Nobody would wish that on anyone right, right now. Uh, but it's a sign that they're going to be transparent about this uh, in, if there was any concern that perhaps part of the reason he hadn't been tested or that they wouldn't tell us was because of some kind of a cover-up. Apparently they're saying that's not the case. All right, we look forward to seeing what the results are and if more questions are answered moving forward here. Um, Caitlin, let me turn to you uh, and the Republican convention. We know President Trump is breaking with tradition and will speak every night of this convention. Do we know if he plans to speak on or off script? Are there general themes that he plans to cover? Well, if today was any indication, and actually if the past four or five years have been any indication, you can expect an off-script Donald Trump. Uh, today he appeared in front of delegates to the National Convention in Charlotte in person. He was supposed to give remarks, ended up being nearly an hour, um, where he kind of went off several different tangents, one of which was railing against uh, mail-in voting and, and claiming that it's going to be fraudulent uh, without any verification of that, as you mentioned at the top. Um, so he is breaking with tradition and in, in appearing in some form uh, every day, but also remember that last week, Joe Biden appeared pretty much every night of the convention in some way as well. He did, um, you know, kind of virtual town halls with people. Um, he made appearances here and there throughout the week. So uh, we could expect something like that from Donald Trump. The campaign hasn't said it explicitly what they will do in terms of these appearances. Uh, but you could tell today, given his remarks, that he was eager to be out there campaigning, eager to uh, talk about whatever he wants to talk about, especially the election itself and voting itself. Uh, and you could tell that because he hasn't been able to have rallies over the past few months uh, that he sees this convention this week as a way to uh, to hold similar types of events. Well, Liz, let me ask you, when you listen to the rhetoric that we're hearing now from the president and from Republicans, how does 2020 compare to what the president and the party promised in 2016? Yeah, I think that's a, a major theme of this convention because Trump came in with a lot of promises on the economy in particular. And that was a big emphasis of his speech today, even though, as Caitlin mentioned, there were a lot of detours into, um, you know, mail-in ballots and things like that because he is off script. But a big theme of what he was trying to say today is, you know, the stock market is doing amazing. We added all these jobs. And I think that's gonna be a bit tough um, as an overall message. I think for the base, um, that could fly. But because you know we have double-digit employment right now, people are really worried about the future. Um, the fact that the president seems to be painting a very rosy economic picture right now and saying, you know, I came in as the businessman and look what I delivered, look at this economy. Uh, I think it's, it's a little bit of a, a rough message right now for him overall. Um, that said, he still does have higher ratings on the economy than Joe Biden. So it's still an edge he has. It makes sense for him to press that edge. But um, the rosiness of the picture he's painting overall, I think, is, is a bit um, stretches uh, credulity, I guess. Well, let's talk more about this idea of rosiness. Uh, Ed, last week on CBS This Morning, Vice President Pence criticized Joe Biden for what he said was an overwhelmingly negative Democratic National Convention. Let's play those remarks. I found not just uh, those words by Joe Biden last night, but so many of the speeches at the Democratic National Convention were so negative. They presented such a grim vision for America. Then today at his vice presidential nomination acceptance speech, Pence closed his remarks with this message to Republicans. With your continued support and with God's help, we're going to make America great again. Again. 
Ed, talk to me a little bit about the messaging issue, perhaps, for Republicans in this convention. Well, I, I just, I don't think they quite know what they're for anymore, other than getting the president reelected. I think that's pretty, come pretty evident pretty quickly. We have seen the president bounce around on slogans. We've seen the president bounce around on attack lines against Joe Biden. And even today, we, we see them essentially recycling uh, the taglines and rhetoric they used exactly four years ago at their convention. And it, it just signals that, that, that they have no sense of, of what it is they're supposed to be about. And look, it may work. Uh, you know, he has his base of support. Uh, that, that kind of sort of consistent messaging worked for them four years ago. Of course, we didn't have a pandemic. We didn't have the kind of challenger that Joe Biden is. We didn't have evidence that Joe Biden might be peeling away people simply because he's an alternative from the president. Uh, but, but uh, you know, unless or until the president this week starts to articulate a little more clearly what exactly they want to get done in a second term, which is what voters often want to hear from an incumbent, uh, you know, it's going to be really tricky to determine what it is they're supposed to be about. There's been some excellent uh, reporting on this done uh, by people we talk to on a regular basis on this program about, uh, you know, how the president has struggled uh, with incumbency and running as the incumbent and with what exactly the Republican Party is supposed to be going forward other than a cult of personality for the president. Uh, you know, I, I, can see the, the, I can see the vice president's point about last week that there wasn't much there in terms of what Democrats would do. That is a fair argument. Beyond Joe Biden broadly sketching out plans to deal with the pandemic and make better use of the Defense Production Act and, you know, that mask mandate that he's calling for and some general theories on who would get taxed and who wouldn't and protecting Social Security, there wasn't much specificity, despite polling that showed that people wanted specifics on what exactly a Biden-Harris administration would do. This week, the Republican polling that we did shows much the same, that Republicans want to hear what the president and vice president would like to continue doing if they get four more years. We'll see if there's any actual conversation about that this week. All right, so Caitlin, let's dig into one aspect of the uh, president's agenda. So the president's fighting for you second term agenda does not mention anything about race related issues. And we should note this platform was unveiled hours after video surfaced appearing to show Kenosha, Wisconsin police shooting Jacob Blake, a 29 year old black man, multiple times in the back while he was trying to enter his car. Caitlin, how do Republicans plan to address this issue of race at the RNC this week? Well, in a little bit of a preview, the president today referenced opportunity zones. You'll hear from Tim Scott tonight uh, speaking at the RNC, who has been a big champion of that. He'll likely also talk about criminal justice reform uh, and actually a bipartisan effort uh, led by this White House that um, people like Cory Booker and others uh, signed on to uh, but have been demanding more in terms of policy. Um, but other than that, he really hasn't addressed it at all and, in fact, has kind of gone the other way and really kind of focused on uh, what he has lamented as cancel culture and he's also uh, been attacking mayors of cities where there have been demonstrations um, and he's also been use using um, racist rhetoric to talk about um, a, a transformation in the suburbs that he's supposedly warning about. Um, so we haven't really seen him uh, embrace this discussion in any thoughtful or meaningful way, but I expect that he and others will point to those two things as, as a reason for that. But this comes, as you mentioned, uh, a, a, against the backdrop of yet another shooting and an issue that we have seen um, become a, a, a rallying force uh, around the country, not just in cities, but in suburbs and small towns, and something that the president has not um, addressed in a meaningful way. Well, Liz, last week we saw Democrats attempt to reach across the aisle with former Republicans who laid out why they're voting uh, for the president. Is the president doing anything this week to expand his electorate beyond the Republican base? So there is one um, Democratic House member in Georgia, Georgia State House, um, who is now a supporter of Mr. Trump, who has a, a speaking slot at this convention. Uh, to my knowledge, that's the only um, sort of Democratic voice they're spotlighting, but I could be wrong. They're, they're adding people. But it's definitely not the same intensity of focus. You saw the DNC last week where uh, so many Republicans were featured to kind of create a permission structure 
for um, more conservative people in the country who might be uncomfortable with Trump to back Joe Biden. It was a lot of sort of vouching for Biden from the conservative perspective from John Kasich, Colin Powell, um, even just regular Republicans and videos, regular voters talking about it. That does not seem to be a focus here. And that makes sense when you think about it, because I think um, President Trump is probably governed toward the base more than any um, president in, in recent memory. And, that, and it's just not really his style um, to be reaching out, especially to people who might not support him. Um, so I, I doubt that will be a, a big focus of, of this week. Hmm. All right. I misspoke a moment ago. These were former Republicans, uh, or Republicans rather, who said they would not be supporting President Trump this year. Uh, Ed, let me turn to you. While the convention goes on, one of the president's top advisors, Kellyanne Conway, is leaving the White House. Now, she'll still speak at the RNC this week, but why is she stepping away, Ed? And remind us of how vital she was to the president's victory back in 2016. Sure, a longtime Republican pollster who was brought into the 2016 campaign to right size it towards the end uh, has remained a loyal and in many ways at times behind the scenes strategist in the West Wing who, you know, comes out and, and, and does interviews and, and defends the president when necessary, but otherwise has played a, a pretty behind the scenes operator role in recent years. She says she needs to focus on her family. She and her husband, George Conway, have four children. Uh, and it appears the pressures of uh, the work she does and the work he'd been doing are, uh, you know, complicating things. It's understandable as working parents. Uh, Conway, her husband, George Conway, is one of the founders of the Lincoln Project, this Republican anti-Trump group that is now running millions of dollars worth of ads across the country to try to convince people to vote against the president. She, of course, a loyal lieutenant to the president. It's been the cause of uh, some, you know, drama, uh, not only uh, in their family, apparently, but also, of course, in the press talking about how it is that this you know, couple could possibly be on either end of this debate. Uh, Mr. Conway, of course, had been considered briefly for a Justice Department role at the beginning of the administration and took a pass. So she will appear in her personal capacity Wednesday at the convention. And then after that, she says, is essentially going to be stepping back in the coming days. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the longest serving Trump aides and survivors, really, uh, not only of the campaign, but of the administration, and, and one the president surely is, uh, is sad to see go. Right, and particularly notable, Ed, as you said, because uh, that longevity, despite that very vocal opposition to the president by her husband. All right, Ed O'Keefe, Caitlin Huey right. Burns, and Liz Goodwin, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Postmaster General appears on Capitol Hill after suspending controversial changes to the Postal Service. What Louis DeJoy told lawmakers about the safety of mail-in voting this fall. Stay with us. You're streaming Red and Blue. To all Americans tonight, in all of our cities and in all of our towns, I make this promise. We will make America strong again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And we will make America great again. God bless you and good night. I love you. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. 
It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBS and Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. CBS and Pittsburgh, your neighborhood news, streaming 24-7. Anytime, anywhere. Find it on KDKA.com and on all your favorite devices. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. The Postmaster General faced another grilling from lawmakers on Capitol Hill today over recent mail delays, delays that some worry could impact mail-in voting come November. Louis DeJoy testified before the House Oversight and Reform Committee and defended the Postal Service's ability to deliver mail-in ballots in the general election. House Democrats also pressed DeJoy, who is a major GOP donor and close Trump ally, about his relationship with the president. Do your mail delays fit Trump's campaign goal of hurting the post office, as stated in his tweets? I'm, Are your I'm, mail I'm delays not, implicit not, campaign I'm not contributions? These types of questions. I'm here. I'm here to represent the postal service. It has nothing to do with. All my actions have to do with improvement in the postal service. May this. Am I the only one in this room that understands that we have a ten billion dollar a year loss? Right. Am I the only will, one in this room will you that give this committee, OIG reports Will you that give this committee up? your communications with Mark Meadows, with Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, Go with ahead the and president? Do that. CBS News Chief Congressional Correspondent Nancy Cordes joins me now. Hi there, Nancy. Well, we just heard a very heated exchange between Representative Jim Cooper and Louis DeJoy, who faced a number of questions from Democrats about whether those changes were to benefit President Trump. How did DeJoy address right. those concerns? Well, he insisted, Elaine, that he hasn't spoken to President Trump about the Postal Service and that he is fully capable of being independent at the Postal Service, despite his long relationship with the president and his, um, his position as a chief fundraiser for the president dating back to 2016. He argues that all of the changes that he has made at the Postal Service recently have been in the name of efficiency, saving money. And he argues that at the end of the day, when these changes fully take effect, that actually mail delivery will speed up rather than slow down. But Democrats argue that that's not what the data shows, that uh, for at least a month and possibly more, there was this significant slowdown in mail processing. And we don't know whether that slowdown continues till today because USPS and DeJoy in particular have been reluctant to hand over more recent data. So another point of tension, as you know, Nancy, was about the Postal Service removing hundreds of high-speed mail sorting machines. What did DeJoy say about not putting those machines back online? So this was very interesting. DeJoy insisted today and also in a, a hearing that he appeared at in the Senate last week that he had nothing to do with the decision to dismantle, remove hundreds of mail sorting machines around the country. And despite the firestorm has, that has been created in recent weeks over this, he also says he hasn't tried to find out who made the decision to remove all of those sorting machines. Um, and, and yet at the same time, even though he doesn't seem to know much about who didn't, did it and why they did it, he insists that it was the right thing to do and that those machines aren't needed and that he's not going to hook them back up. So that is a major source of frustration for Democrats who feel that he either doesn't know or isn't saying exactly how and why 
this took place and, and who are also frustrated that even uh, even with the slowdown in, in the mail, in mail processing, even with the appearance of a conflict of interest here, that Postmaster DeJoy isn't willing to go ahead and hook these machines back up. Now, what he argued and what many Republicans in this committee argued was that this is routine, that, uh, you know, in another election year, 2012, when we had a Democratic president, there were also not just mail sorting machines that were eliminated, but entire mail facilities that were shut down. And nobody accused President Obama at that time of some kind of uh, major conspiracy to interfere with the election. Um, but you know what, what, what really has Democrats suspicious is the fact that they have asked for all kinds of documentation to back up um, why the postmaster decided to make some of these changes in the first place and how the mail processing system is being affected by it. And they haven't been able to get anything from DeJoy himself. They're getting documents from whistleblowers, but not through official channels from the Postal Service. Interesting. Well, today's hearing comes after the House passed a bill Saturday, which would provide an additional $25 billion to the Postal Service. What specifically does the bill provide funding for? Well, the bill basically helps the Postal Service make up a shortfall that it's experienced because of coronavirus, all the costs that have been associated with handling the mail during a pandemic. Um, you know, this, the Postal Service routinely runs a shortfall, so uh, the, the Postal Service often needs some help regardless. And $25 billion is what the Board of Governors of the Postal Service recommended that Congress provide. But they're getting a different message from the Postmaster General. He says he only needs about $10 billion, and that's the number that the White House and Republicans seem to be comfortable with as well. So the big question now that the House has passed this $25 billion, will the Senate, when it comes back in mid-September, put a bill on the floor that grants $10 billion to the Postal Service? And if it does, what happens then? Because as we've seen throughout the course of this summer, Elaine, the two sides really haven't done a great job negotiating. And so um, even if a majority of members of Congress say they want to give at least some money to the Postal Service, that doesn't mean that they will uh, successfully negotiate a, a compromise at the end of the day. Hmm. Um, Nancy, I want to turn to tonight's Republican convention. Today, more than two dozen former GOP Congress members endorsed Joe Biden for president. We also know a number of Republican senators have opted to skip the convention. What kinds of reasons are they giving, if any? Many of them haven't said why they are not attending the, or speaking at the convention. A, a couple of a couple of them have. Susan Collins, for example, who's locked in a tight race for re-election uh, as a senator of the state of Maine. She said last month that she wasn't going to be speaking or attending. She just got it out of the way then, and she said she normally doesn't go to the convention when she's running for re-election. Uh, but we haven't heard from a number of the other senators who are also locked in tight races around the country, people like Cory Gardner of Colorado, Steve Daines of Montana, Tom Tillis of North Carolina. So it is interesting that so many of these senators in competitive races aren't, uh, aren't being given or aren't requesting speaking roles. Typically, a convention is a great way for a candidate to get more publicity, get more attention, particularly in a year where they can't do the kind of traditional campaigning that they're used to. Think of uh, Doug Jones of Alabama, for example, a Democratic senator who is locked in a very difficult race, and he popped up almost every night of the Democratic convention last week. He gave a speech one night, and he was featured in videos throughout the week because it's great publicity for him. But in the Republican convention, uh, the only Republican senator locked in a difficult race who's got a major speaking role is Joni Ernst of Iowa. And so clearly there are many Republicans who don't believe that appearing at this convention is helpful for their reelection prospects. But there's another issue at play here as well, which is that President Trump isn't happy with some of those Republicans because they really have been downplaying their relationships with him on the stump. He doesn't like that. He has always argued that that's a bad move for Republican candidates. Um, he, uh, he described some of them as trying to be cute 
by um, downplaying their relationships with him. And so it's possible that uh, when this list was being drawn up that the president himself uh, or you know, the, or those in his inner circle didn't want some of these senators to, to speak at the convention. So I think it's a two-way street. All right, really complicated calculus for some of these Republicans, it sounds like. Nancy Cordes, Nancy, thank you very much. Always good to see you. You're welcome, Elaine. The toll of the coronavirus pandemic continues to ravage the U.S. The country's death toll is nearing 180,000. Despite this, schools and businesses nationwide are trying to navigate a path back to normalcy. Nichelle Medina reports. Miami's Hard Rock Stadium will welcome as many as 13,000 fans for the Dolphins' home opener against the Buffalo Bills next month. Masks are required, and one popular pastime is prohibited. We can do everything right in the stadium, but people will congregate in the, in the parking lots. So uh, we're eliminating tailgating. South Florida remains a COVID hotspot, but the state's governor announced some encouraging trends. Right now, statewide, uh, the number of the people who are hospitalized with COVID positive diagnosis is down over 50% over the last month. This comes as the Food and Drug Administration authorized emergency use of convalescent plasma, which comes from the blood of people who recovered from COVID. So this is not a dramatic advance, but it's an advance. Here in California, one of the state's most populous counties has managed to get its case count low enough to get off of the COVID watch list. Some two dozen private schools in Orange County already obtained waivers to open for in-person learning Monday. We've taken the precautions and we know what we're supposed to do. and. You know, we're praying for the best, faith over fear. A downward infection trend means all students in the county may be able to head back to school next month. And the party's over in Los Angeles County. Airbnb is cracking down on problematic house parties, removing more than 50 listings that have violated the platform's policies. Nichelle Medina, CBS News, Los Angeles. Coming up after a break, ahead of the RNC, we decided to poll the party's voters. Why a majority of Republicans say the U.S. is better off now than it was four years ago. Stay with us. You're streaming Red and Blue. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. CBSN Pittsburgh, your neighborhood news, streaming 24-7. Anytime, anywhere. Find it on KDKA.com and on all your favorite devices. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad.
Our latest CBS News Battleground tracker finds a majority of Republican voters say the U.S. is better off now than it was before President Trump took office. That's something one can expect to be front and center during the party's national convention this week. Yet the party's view is in contrast with most Americans, with just 35 percent of overall voters saying they feel similarly. For more, let's bring in CBS News Director of Elections and Surveys, Anthony Salvanto. Hi there, Anthony. So what is the main reasoning for why Republicans feel the U.S. is better off now than four years ago? Uh, hey there, Elaine. Yeah, as you mentioned, and I'll show it to you here, that big difference between how Republicans say America is doing and how all voters do, the reason that they give when asked among a list, number one, confidence that they have in President Trump at 82 percent. The U.S. economy, which most of them are still feeling good about, optimistic about. And then another one that struck me, too, which is 70 percent saying, because Democrats are not in power. And you may hear a lot of that at the convention, too. So two big tests. One is going to be whether the Republicans can convince and persuade more Americans to share that positive view, because you see that difference. And the other one, possibly we may hear them convincing or trying to convince the public that they are standing between them and the Democrats agenda. You often hear a lot of that at political conventions too, Elaine. Hmm. Well, President Trump has been running hard on the economy. However, right now you have millions of Americans who are unemployed in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. Where do Republicans currently stand on the administration's economic track record? Yeah. Let me show you a couple of other parts of our poll. Um, the condition of the national economy, again, big difference, as we mentioned, 67 percent, two-thirds of Republicans saying that it's at least in somewhat good, if not very good shape, but only a third of voters agree. So here again, setting up that dynamic of can the Republicans convince, persuade the voters out there who mentioned either to share that view or to be optimistic about the president's potential handling of the economy going forward. Republicans give him very high marks. They have throughout the crisis and the downturn. But again, almost two-thirds of voters not agreeing, Elaine. Wow, it's a big gap. More broadly, Anthony, what were the biggest disparities between parties when it comes to the president's handling of the pandemic? Ah, this is a big one because we see in state after state, Elaine, People with negative views, a majority holding negative views of how the administration has handled the pandemic, they're voting against the president. So it's been a strong correlate of vote. And you see overall, you've got 73 percent of Republicans say that the U.S. handling of the virus is going at least somewhat well. But again, we're in the mid-30s here, 38 percent of Americans overall, voters overall, saying that it's going well. So again, that difference, that challenge for Republicans. And I would add that a lot of the states that have been really hard hit, Florida, Arizona, Texas, all these states in the Sun Belt, they're all in play now in part because of what voters are saying is a negative response, being negative toward the response of the, of the administration. So this could be one of the critical things to watch in the conventions if they can start to move that needle Elaine. All right. So what are Republicans hoping to hear about during this week's convention, Anthony? And is there any indication that's what we should expect to see? Uh, good things. I'm going to flip through to this slide, Elaine. What's the uh, main reason you're, re you're a Republican? Th most say they like what Republicans stand for, but there's four in ten that say they're Republicans because they dislike what the Democrats stand for. So that's part of it. But the other part, Elaine, if I flip through, what do you want to hear at the convention? Well, they'd prefer by 90 percent to 10 to hear good things about the president and Vice President Pence, and only 10 percent want to hear more criticism of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. 
Why? Well, because by and large, Republicans have already made up their mind who they're going to vote for. And that brings us to a larger point, which is often these conventions now are about rallying the base, rallying current supporters to go and turn out. And I think that was certainly true in the Democratic convention, may very well be true for the Republicans. And in this year, when there may be extra hurdles to voting, you may have to fill out more forms to cast a mail ballot, you may have to stand in line longer if polling places are closed, rallying the base could be even more important than it's been in past years. Plus, it's mostly Republicans who may end up watching the convention in the first place, just like it was mostly Democrats who watched the Democratic convention only. Right. Okay. So although most of the convention will be virtual, there are some scaled back events happening in Charlotte, North Carolina this week, Anthony. President Trump won the state in 2016 by less than four percentage points. Where does the race there stand at this moment? Okay, um, I can take you to the map here, Elaine. Let me show you. Uh, this is the way the race stands at the moment. If we tally it in terms of electoral votes, of course, the states decide the presidency, right? The electoral votes that are leaning towards Joe Biden versus those that are leaning towards the president. And if you look at North Carolina, we currently have that rated as a toss up. There have been some polling, some of our analysis can put Joe Biden up there slightly, but it's really within the margin of error plus the recent history of voting Republican. So we're going to call that a toss-up at the moment. North Carolina clearly important to the president's map. It is not the only state that's important to him, but it really is. It really is a critical one because, look, even if I were to say, let's give him that state, right, if he wins that state, he's still got to go and go through the Sun Belt, and he's got to win Georgia, and he's got to win Florida, and a whole bunch of other states. So North Carolina is really the start as you go through that Sun Belt, which has long been so critical to Republicans, and will be again this year, Elaine. All right, Anthony Salvanto, thank you so much for that snapshot. Appreciate it. Thanks. President Trump is breaking with convention tradition this week. He'll make appearances on every night of the RNC, leading up to his full remarks on Thursday night from the White House. Let's bring in CBS News 2020 campaign reporters Nicole Skanga and Lecrae Mitchell. Nicole has been following the Trump campaign, and Lecrae is on the ground at the convention in Charlotte, North Carolina. Welcome to you both. Um, Nicole, let me start with you. Why does the Trump campaign want to show as much of the president as possible? I think I can guess. <laughs> Well, as you well know, Elaine, not only is this president the commander in chief, he's also the entertainer in chief. You'll recall that before he became president and was a New York City business mogul, he spent over a dozen seasons hosting The Apprentice. And actually, the creator of The Apprentice, Mark Burnett, is working on the Republican National Convention festivities uh, as a consultant who is leading in that production. Uh, in addition to that, you know, we saw the president make an appearance today. Weren't sure if it was going to be a quick appearance on site at the GOP convention uh, during the roll call in Charlotte, North Carolina. He spoke for 55 minutes. And what we'll also see, uh, you know, this week, in addition to the president surfacing every single day, is a number of uh, members of the Trump family. Uh, so Donald uh, Trump Jr. will be speaking today. We'll hear later in the week from Eric Trump, from Ivanka Trump, of course, from the First Lady, from Tiffany Trump as well. We'll also be hearing from a number of close Trump allies. These are politicians who made their careers by tying themselves close to the president, a rising star, Kim Classic, who is a congressional candidate currently running for Representative Elijah Cummings' uh, seat in Baltimore in that area. We actually just got some of the speech excerpts now uh, from the Trump campaign. She'll talk a little bit about safety in our neighborhoods, quote, we want jobs and innovation, like tapping the potential of the Port of Baltimore to create manufacturing jobs for Americans. So she'll be speaking tonight. We'll also so hear from Sean Parnell, who is a congressional candidate in Pennsylvania, 18, going up against Democrat Connor Lamb there. Uh, he'll talk about his grandfather, according to these speech excerpts, who was a lifelong union Democrat trying to convince Democrats to come over to the Republican side. But again, these are politicians that are very close to the president. You heard Nancy Cortez speaking about how a lot of vulnerable Republicans in vulnerable Senate races will not 
not be heard tonight. Lastly, Elaine, not on stage. No former U.S. presidents, including uh, former President George Bush. He will not be in attendance at any of the festivities this week. A source close to the Bush family tells CBS News that is because some of the leftover animosity from the 2016 race, where then-candidate Donald Trump uh, headed off against, uh, of course, Jeb Bush. Right. Yes, we all remember very well. Um, that was very heated, contentious uh, back and forth between Jeb Bush and Donald Trump. Uh, all right, so Lecrae, it's been fascinating to watch how these campaigns have navigated in this new world and tried to adjust. Tell us about what's been happening in Charlotte. What's the scene like there at the convention? I'll tell you, Elaine, it definitely doesn't feel like it would, I believe, if it were a full-scale convention. You know, with restaurants packed and sort of the, the city teeming a bit, it's not really that feeling. And outside of the convention center where I was today, as the official business was taking place, it was actually pretty uneventful and quiet. Um, when I left outside of that barricaded area where media was throughout the event, there were a couple of Trump supporters, and they had flags, and they were wearing shirts. And there was some back and forth that took place with them and other demonstrators, and it was unclear if they were Trump supporters. But throughout the weekend, you have seen some demonstrations that have taken place overnight, Friday night, Saturday night, and even last night, where there have been some arrests that the Charlotte-Mecklenburg Police Department reported, and also people chanting and, and getting together and coming face-to-face -face with police officers in some cases. But for the most part, I think about an event that I attended last night where you had a couple of advocacy groups that are here based in Charlotte, and they met up and projected pictures of people who are unemployed and have been unemployed since the coronavirus pandemic really struck. And they said that that form of protest for them, projecting these pictures of unemployed workers who have really been suffering throughout this time, was their form of protest. And it wasn't as high key as some of the images of protesters and demonstrators that we sometimes see, um, you know, when they come face to face with police officers. But to this group, it was important. And they said that it was important that Republican officials think about this as they meet this week and throughout the week. And they're talking about, you know, making this country in their in what they would say making this country better or great again um, but I can't stress uh, enough well, that the scene here it definitely doesn't feel like a full convention yeah I imagine I imagine not Lecrae well let me ask you Lecrae so Republicans say that they plan to focus on a more positive message for the country this week how do they plan to do that well, throughout the week, you'll see that there are more than 70 speakers that are scheduled to give, or nearly 70 speakers that are scheduled to give remarks and in honoring the great American story. And that's the overall theme for this year's RNC, honoring the great American story. And there are also daily themes throughout the week that the campaign announced, including celebrating a land of promise, a land of opportunity, a land of heroes, and a land of greatness. And I think what it really boils down to is you're going to hear messages from Republican leaders and from other guests that they've invited. And depending on where you fall and stand on some of these key issues that they'll discuss will be your take on whether or not it's a positive message. I can't help but think that I'm sure that criminal justice will come up Criminal justice reform will come up this week as the president touts regularly the First Step Act and the role that he played in that. I have a feeling that, you know, we will definitely hear about coronavirus response throughout different states, as he mentioned briefly in his remarks today. And so I think what you're going to find is that voters and supporters of the president may find the messaging this week very positive. And I would I dare say that people who are not fans of him might not think that the messaging this week is, is that positive. So it depends on where you fall on some of these key issues. All right, Nicole Skanga and Lecrae Mitchell. In another universe, our whole red and blue team would be right there with you, Lecrae, <laughs> covering this convention. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, wonderful to see you both. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. 
Coming up after the break, Republicans may be descending on North Carolina this week, but the general election isn't the only tight race there. There's a national spotlight on the state's open Senate seat at Governor's Mansion. Stay with us. You're streaming Red and Blue. Yes, we have all seen the polls and the pundits who say our party is dead. I've heard that before. So did Harry Truman. I'll tell you what I think. The only polls that count are the polls the American people go to on November 2nd. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh! Boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da -da -da. and truly original That's recording. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Even really young kids are feeling what's going on right now. How should parents be talking to them about this whole question of racial justice? How do we embrace this moment and turn it into real change? What we really must focus on is moving from protesting to policy. Join Gail, Anthony, and Tony on CBS This Morning. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. You can watch CBSN 24 7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. Despite the majority of Republican convention events being canceled in Charlotte, North Carolina this week, President Trump appeared there earlier today to directly address local supporters. He met with delegates after being officially renominated. Before the pandemic hit, Charlotte was meant to be the site of Mr. Trump's pitch for another term. His messaging will still be crucial in the state as it remains a toss-up, according to our CBS News Battleground tracker. Nick Oxner covers all things North Carolina politics. He's the chief investigative reporter at our Charlotte affiliate, WBTV, and joins me from Charlotte with, I'm told, a five-second delay. <laughs> Nevertheless, Nick, nice to have you on Red and Blue again. So the president won North Carolina by about 170,000 votes out of some 5.5 million in 2016. How has the electorate changed in recent years? 
Not a whole lot, Elaine, is really the answer to that. Our population keeps growing, but when you look at the electoral breakdown or the party registration breakdown, what you see is we still have majority Demo a majority of voters are registered Democrats. They've got about 400,000 more registered Democrats in North Carolina than registered Republicans, but actually there are even more registered unaffiliated than registered Republicans in North Carolina. But the bottom line remains that North Carolina continues to be a generally uh, rural and urban state. And so in the more rural and suburban areas, you tend to have more uh, conservative voters in the urban areas, places like Charlotte, Raleigh, Greensboro, Durham, you have more liberal voters. And so there's that contrast and tension between those two. And that's basically stayed the same since 2016. Well, we know there were demonstrations for the third straight night Sunday in Charlotte over the RNC. Do we know, Nick, who's behind these demonstrations? Yeah, it's a number of different groups. There have been a total of 14 people arrested over those three nights. Um, we expect, we know there are some events, I think, happening right now and more planned for later this evening. Uh, there's a couple different groups uh, lined with the Black Lives Matter movement, another group called uh, Charlotte Uprising that, again, are, are uh, protesting throughout uh, this time in the last few weeks and months. Well, the president and vice president both spoke earlier today in Charlotte. How did they go over and is their disappointment about the convention largely being moved out of the state? Yeah, huge disappointment from people uh, that the convention has moved out of the state. Local Republicans, both local here to Charlotte and local uh, across North Carolina, have been working for more than two years to bring the convention here. And so naturally, they were disappointed that it got reduced to, you know, a three or four hour gathering of about three to five hundred people. Uh, that being said, Republicans on the ground here were very receptive. I think they were pleasantly surprised that the president and vice president came. Of course, this was passed off as a surprise appearance, although it's kind of hard for the president. President, Vice President to move anywhere uh, clandestinely, at least within the United States. Um, and so they're happy to see them. They were excited to see them. Uh, and that may be the most excitement that we're going to get this week for local Republicans that thought they'd be partying uh, for the rest of the week here. Yeah, a much different picture right now. Well, Republican Senator and Trump ally Tom Tillis is also up for re-election. There's heavy spending on both sides of the race with a lot of money coming in from outside the state. Who is running against Tillis and what does it look like his chances are right now? Yeah, so uh, Tom Tillis' Democrat opponent is a guy named Cal Cunningham, a relatively young uh, uh, candidate with a relatively moderate profile. At least that's what they're trying to strike him out to be. He's a military veteran. Uh, and the race is pretty close. And if you look at, at most of the recent polling, it hasn't really changed a ton over the last month or two. It has Cunningham ahead by a few points, Tillis behind by anywhere from about three points to five points. The bigger problem for Tom Tillis is that he's trailing significantly in most polls behind Donald Trump. He, uh, and so if Tillis is going to win, he's got to excite the base. We know that that the base is not excited about Tom Tillis in North Carolina. I was at a Trump rally last September where Tillis got booed when he got it was announced and took the stage. Um, and so Tom Tillis has an enthusiasm gap. Democrats are rallying behind uh, Cal Cunningham. The only kind of saving grace for Tillis uh, might be that that Cunningham's not polling super high either. There's still a lot of undecideds. There's still a lot of people who frankly don't know either of these men. Interesting. All right. Well, Nick, I also want to ask you about mail-in voting and accusations from President Trump of potential voter fraud. As you've reported on our program last year, a Republican operative was charged with election fraud for what happened in North Carolina's 9th Congressional District. What's been done since then to make sure it doesn't happen again? Yeah, so it's actually the, the role or the tale of what has happened since the 9th Congressional District scandal in North Carolina is really fascinating because the Republican-led General Assembly, the Republicans control the House and Senate uh, here in North Carolina, passed a, a host of reforms uh, to the absentee ballot process, uh, stiffening penalties, uh, changing the way that you can't send pre-filled out absentee uh, ballot request forms anymore. You have to sign if you assisted someone with their 
ballot. Uh, so they made a host of changes since that time. Now this year, Democrat and Democrat aligned groups have come in and challenged some of those reforms that were in response to the 9th Congressional District scandal. Um, that being said, uh, we are off the charts in terms of the number of absentee ballot requests in North Carolina. And Elaine, even the North Carolina Republican Party is sending out blank absentee ballot request forms with President Trump's face on it. And a tweet from him trying to distinguish between an absentee ballot and a vote by mail, if you can make much of a distinction there. Yeah, you wonder if voters are actually going to be able to kind of grasp the, the, the nuance uh, when the message over and over uh, may be confusing to some. All right, Nick Oxner, always great to have you reporting. Thank you so much, Nick. That does it for Red and Blue today at 7 p.m. Eastern. We'll have a look at the rest of the day's headlines. And at 8 p.m., we'll look ahead to tonight's RNC speakers and bring them to you live with analysis when they begin. And when tonight's speeches come to an end, we'll be here to break it all down. We'll be right back. You're streaming CBSN. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. CBSN Pittsburgh, your neighborhood news, streaming 24-7. Anytime, anywhere. Find it on KDKA.com and on all your favorite devices. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You were donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. You can watch CBSN 24-7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. Kihano, it's good to be with you. Thanks for joining us. Tonight, Republicans will make their opening arguments to the American people about why President Trump should get another four years in the White House. The Republican National Convention is already underway in Charlotte, North Carolina. The four-day festivities will be mostly remote, with live speeches also coming from the D.C. area later in the week. Demonstrators lined up outside the Charlotte Convention Center over the weekend. Most were peaceful with few major reported incidents. This afternoon, Republicans officially renominated both President Trump and Vice President Pence. The president spoke for nearly an hour today. He again cast unsubstantiated doubts on the safety of mail-in voting and claimed without evidence that Democrats plan to take the election away from him. Bad things happened last time with the spying on our campaign, and that goes to Biden, and that goes to Obama. 
And we have to be very, very careful. I have to be very, very careful. And this time, they're trying to do it with the whole post office scam. They'll blame it on the post office. You could see them setting it up. Be very careful and watch it very carefully, because we have to win. This is the most important election in the history of our country. Mr. Trump is expected to speak at the RNC during each of the four days. His full remarks will come Thursday evening from the White House. Tonight, we'll hear from Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina, one of just three black United States senators and the only Republican. Other primetime speakers will include House Minority Whip Steve Scalise, House Oversight Ranking Member Jim Jordan, former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Nikki Haley, and the president's son, Donald Trump Jr. A number of conservative activists will also speak. What's less clear is the agenda from the Republicans this week and the next four years. The party is not voting on a platform at the convention. The platform typically lays out the party's policy goals if they reclaim the White House. Instead, Republicans are vowing their, quote, strong support for the president and his America First agenda. For his part, the president has unveiled his pledges for a second term. They include returning to normal in 2021, holding China accountable for the coronavirus, and draining the swamp. The Trump campaign has not laid out how the president intends to achieve these goals. Let's bring in our panel, Ed O'Keefe, Caitlin Huey Burns, and Liz Goodwin. Ed is a CBS News political correspondent. Caitlin is a CBSN political reporter. And Liz is deputy Washington bureau chief for the Boston Globe. Welcome to you all. Ed, I want to get right to you. I hear you have some breaking news on Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. What have you learned? That's right, Elaine. Look, after several days of questions about this, the Biden-Harris campaign now says that the Democratic nominee and vice presidential nominee will be tested regularly for COVID-19 and that the staff that comes into contact with them regularly also will be. There were questions over the weekend and, and since Thursday when they were together at the convention in Wilmington about whether or not, especially the vice president, former vice president, had been tested at all for the virus. Uh, the campaign continued to say that he hadn't been. And then yesterday on one of the Sunday shows, one of his uh, spokespeople was asked about it again, said he doesn't have it, but he hasn't been tested, which caused a lot of confusion and questioning as to how she would know that if he hadn't in fact been tested. So today now they're saying he will be. They say this is uh, in keeping with the advice of medical professionals. And notably, Elaine, and, and let's remember this in the event that we learn about something later, the campaign says that if either of them tests positive, they will tell the world that, uh, that that, in fact, has happened in a bid with transparency. Again, all of this, they say, is, is in keeping with the responsible behavior they've been trying to promote. I suppose the only question is why it took them so long to announce this. Uh, but they concede that part of this is because the two of them may begin traveling soon across the country. There's currently no plan for them to do that. In fact, this week they're keeping a very light schedule focused mostly on virtual events for Senator Harris. Uh, but it's a sign that they acknowledge it's something that has to be done and will be done in the future. Well, that was going to be my question, Ed, is about why it took so long, several days, you said, to get a definitive answer on this. It's just not clear right now. It is a good question. And, and, and you know, uh, part, of, part of the frustration, frankly, for reporters has been, uh, A, we've been asking it pretty relentlessly over the last several weeks, but B, reporters who were there in the room last week to witness Harris and Biden's speeches. Remember, they gave them in what was essentially a converted television studio to make it look like the convention hall. But in each instance, there were about 20 reporters from the various news outlets who were part of the so-called pool in the room who'd had to undergo rigorous testing beforehand in order to be there, in order to get clearance to attend. Not only to clear a Secret Service uh, clearance, of course, at this point now, but you also have to pass a medical test. So the question was, well, if we have to do it, why isn't the candidate doing it, especially given his age and the potential risk? So now the campaign saying it will happen. Uh, we'll see uh, again uh, what that looks like and if they tell us on a regular basis how often or after which events. Uh, and most importantly, their vow to let us know if, in fact, one of them does test positive. Obviously, we don't want that to happen. Nobody would wish that on anyone right, right now. Uh, but it's a sign that they're going to be transparent about this uh, if there was any concern that perhaps part of the reason he hadn't been tested or that they wouldn't tell us was because of some kind of a cover-up. Apparently they're saying that's not the case. All right, we look forward to seeing what the results are and, and if more questions are answered moving forward here. Um, Caitlin, let me turn to you uh, and the Republican convention. We know President Trump is breaking with tradition and will speak every night of this convention. Do we know if he plans to speak 
on or off script? Are there general themes that he plans to cover? Well, if today was any indication, and actually if the past four or five years have been any indication, you can expect an off script Donald Trump. Uh, today, he appeared in front of delegates to the National Convention in Charlotte in person. He was supposed to give remarks, ended up being nearly an hour, um, where he kind of went off several different tangents, one of which was railing against uh, mail-in voting and, and claiming that it's going to be fraudulent uh, without any verification of that, as you mentioned at the top. Um, so he is breaking with tradition and in, in appearing in some form uh, every day, but also remember that last week, Joe Biden appeared pretty much every night of the convention in some way as well. He did, um, you know, kind of virtual town halls with people. Um, he made appearances here and there throughout the week. So uh, we could expect something like that from Donald Trump. The campaign hasn't said it explicitly what they will do in terms of these appearances. Uh, but you could tell today, given his remarks, that he was eager to be out there campaigning, eager to uh, talk about whatever he wants to talk about, especially the election itself and voting itself. Uh, and you could tell that because he hasn't been able to have rallies over the past few months uh, that he sees this convention this week as a way to uh, to hold similar types of events. Well, Liz, let me ask you, when you listen to the rhetoric that we're hearing now from the president and from Republicans, how does 2020 compare to what the president and the party promised in 2016? Yeah, I think that's a, a major theme of this convention because Trump came in with a lot of promises on the economy in particular, and that was a big emphasis of his speech today, even though, as Caitlin mentioned, there were a lot of detours into, um, you know, mail-in ballots and things like that because he is off script. But a big theme of what he was trying to say today is, you know, the stock market is doing amazing. We added all these jobs. And I think that's going to be a bit tough um, as an overall message. I think for the base, um, that could fly. But because, you know, we have double digit employment right now, people are really worried about the future. Um, the fact that the president seems to be painting a very rosy economic picture right now and saying, you know, I came in as the businessman and look what I delivered, look at this economy. Uh, I think it's, it's a little bit of a, a rough message right now for him overall. Um, that said, he still does have higher ratings on the economy than Joe Biden. So it's still an edge he has. It makes sense for him to press that edge. But um, the rosiness of the picture he's painting overall, I think, is, is a bit um, stretches uh, credulity, I guess. Well, let's talk more about this idea of rosiness. Uh, Ed, last week on CBS This Morning, Vice President Pence criticized Joe Biden for what he said was an overwhelmingly negative Democratic National Convention. Let's play those remarks. I found not just uh, those words by Joe Biden last night, but so many of the speeches at the Democratic National Convention were so negative. They presented such a grim vision for America. Then today at his vice presidential nomination acceptance speech, Pence closed his remarks with this message to Republicans. With your continued support and with God's help, we're going to make America great again. Again. Ed, talk to me a little bit about the messaging issue perhaps for Republicans in this convention. Well, I, I just I don't think they quite know what they're for anymore other than getting the president reelected. I think that's pretty, come pretty evident pretty quickly. We have seen the president bounce around on slogans. We've seen the president bounce around on attack lines against Joe Biden. And even today, we, we see them essentially recycling uh, the tag lines and rhetoric they used exactly four years ago at their convention. And it, it just signals that, that, that they have no sense of, of what it is they're supposed to be about. And look, it may work. Uh, you know, he has his base of support. Uh, th that kind of sort of consistent messaging worked for them four years ago. Of course, we didn't have a pandemic. We didn't have the kind of challenger that Joe Biden is. We didn't have evidence that Joe Biden might be peeling away people simply because he's an alternative from the president. Uh, but, but uh, you know, unless or until the president this week starts to articulate a little more clearly what exactly they want to get done in a second term, which is what voters often want to hear from an incumbent, 
uh, you know, it's going to be really tricky to determine what it is they're supposed to be about. There's been some excellent uh, reporting on this done uh, by people we talk to on a regular basis on this program about, uh, you know, how the president has struggled uh, with incumbency and running as the incumbent and with what exactly the Republican Party is supposed to be going forward other than a cult of personality for the president. Uh, you know, I, I, can see the, the, I can see the vice president's point about last week that there wasn't much there in terms of what Democrats would do. That is a fair argument. Beyond Joe Biden broadly sketching out plans to deal with the pandemic and make better use of the Defense Production Act and, you know, that mask mandate that he's calling for and some general theories on who would get taxed and who wouldn't and protecting Social Security, there wasn't much specificity despite polling that showed that people wanted specifics on what exactly a Biden-Harris administration would do. This week, the Republican polling that we did shows much the same, that Republicans want to hear what the president and vice president would like to continue doing if they get four more years. We'll see if there's any actual conversation about that this week. All right, so Caitlin, let's dig into one aspect of the uh, president's agenda. So the president's fighting for you second term agenda does not mention anything about race related issues. And we should note this platform was unveiled hours after video surfaced appearing to show Kenosha, Wisconsin police shooting Jacob Blake, a 29 year old black man, multiple times in the back while he was trying to enter his car. Caitlin, how do Republicans plan to address this issue of race at the RNC this week? Well, in a little bit of a preview, the president today referenced opportunity zones. You'll hear from Tim Scott tonight uh, speaking at the RNC, who has been a big champion of that. He'll likely also talk about criminal justice reform uh, and actually a bipartisan effort uh, led by this White House that um, people like Cory Booker and others uh, signed on to, uh, but have been demanding more in terms of policy. Um, but other than that, he really hasn't addressed it at all and, in fact, has kind of gone the other way and really kind of focused on uh, what he has lamented as cancel culture and he's also uh, been attacking mayors of cities where there have been demonstrations um, and he's also been use using um, racist rhetoric to talk about um, a, a transformation in the suburbs that he's supposedly warning about. Um, so we haven't really seen him uh, embrace this discussion in any thoughtful or meaningful way, but I expect that he and others will point to those two things as, as a reason for that. But this comes, as you mentioned, uh, a, a, against the backdrop of yet another shooting and an issue that we have seen um, become a, a, a rallying force uh, around the country, not just in cities, but in suburbs and small towns, and something that the president has not um, addressed in a meaningful way. Well, Liz, last week we saw Democrats attempt to reach across the aisle with former Republicans who laid out why they're voting uh, for the president. Is the president doing anything this week to expand his electorate beyond the Republican base? So there is one um, Democratic House member in Georgia, Georgia State House, um, who is now a supporter of Mr. Trump, who has a, a speaking slot at this convention. Uh, to my knowledge, that's the only um, sort of Democratic voice they're spotlighting, but I could be wrong. They're, they're adding people. But it's definitely not the same intensity of focus. You saw the DNC last week where uh, so many Republicans were featured to kind of create a permission structure for um, more conservative people in the country who might be uncomfortable with Trump to back Joe Biden. It was a lot of sort of vouching for Biden from the conservative perspective from John Kasich, Colin Powell, um, even just regular Republicans and videos, regular voters talking about it. That does not seem to be a focus here. And that makes sense when you think about it, because I think um, President Trump is probably governed toward the base more than any um, president in, in recent memory. And, that, and it's just not really his style um, to be reaching out, especially to people who might not support him. Um, so I, I doubt that will be a, a big focus of, of this week. Hmm. All right. I misspoke a moment ago. These were former Republicans uh, or Republicans rather who said they would not be supporting President Trump this year. Uh, Ed, let me turn to you. While the convention goes on, one of the president's top advisors, Kellyanne Conway, is leaving the White House. Now, she'll still speak at the RNC this week. But why is she stepping away, Ed? And remind us of how vital she was to the president's victory back in 2016. 
Sure, a longtime Republican pollster who was brought into the 2016 campaign to right size it towards the end uh, has remained a loyal and in many ways at times behind the scenes strategist in the West Wing who, you know, comes out and, and, and does interviews and, and defends the president when necessary, but otherwise has played a, a pretty behind the scenes operator role in recent years. She says she needs to focus on her family. She and her husband, George Conway, have four children. Uh, and it appears the pressures of uh, the work she does and the work he'd been doing are, uh, you know, complicating things. It's understandable as working parents. Uh, Conway, her husband, George Conway, is one of the founders of the Lincoln Project, this Republican anti-Trump group that is now running millions of dollars worth of ads across the country to try to convince people to vote against the president. She, of course, a loyal lieutenant to the president. It's been the cause of uh, some, you know, drama, uh, not only uh, in their family, apparently, but also, of course, in the press talking about how it is that this you know, couple could possibly be on either end of this debate. Uh, Mr. Conway, of course, had been considered briefly for a Justice Department role at the beginning of the administration and, and took a pass. So she will appear in her personal capacity Wednesday at the convention. And then after that, she says, is essentially going to be stepping back in the coming days. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the longest serving Trump aides and survivors, really, uh, not only of the campaign, but of the administration, and, and one the president surely is, uh, is sad to see go. Right, and particularly notable, Ed, as you said, because uh, that longevity, despite that very vocal opposition to the president by her husband. All right, Ed O'Keefe, Caitlin Huey right. Burns, and Liz Goodwin, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Coming up after the break, the Postmaster General appears on Capitol Hill after suspending controversial changes to the Postal Service. What Louis DeJoy told lawmakers about the safety of mail-in voting this fall. Stay with us, you're streaming Red and Blue. To all Americans tonight, in all of our cities and in all of our towns, I make this promise. We will make America strong again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And we will make America great again. God bless you and good night. I love you. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. CBSN Pittsburgh, your neighborhood news, streaming 24-7. Anytime, anywhere. Find it on KDKA.com and on all your favorite devices. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad.
The Postmaster General faced another grilling from lawmakers on Capitol Hill today over recent mail delays, delays that some worry could impact mail-in voting come November. Lewis DeJoy testified before the House Oversight and Reform Committee and defended the Postal Service's ability to deliver mail-in ballots in the general election. House Democrats also pressed DeJoy, who is a major GOP donor and close Trump ally, about his relationship with the president. Do your mail delays fit Trump's campaign goal of hurting the post office, as stated in his tweets? I'm, Are your mail I'm delays not, implicit not, campaign I'm not contributions? Answer these types of questions. I'm here. I'm here to represent the postal service. It has nothing to do with all my actions have to do with improvement into the postal service. May this. Am I the only one in this room that understands that we have a ten billion dollar a year loss? Right. Am I the only will, one in this room will you that give this committee, OIG reports Will you that give this committee up? your communications with Mark Meadows, with Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, Go with ahead the and president? Do that. CBS News Chief Congressional Correspondent Nancy Cordes joins me now. Hi there, Nancy. Well, we just heard a very heated exchange between Representative Jim Cooper and Louis DeJoy, who faced a number of questions from Democrats about whether those changes were to benefit President Trump. How did DeJoy address right. those concerns? Well, he insisted, Elaine, that he hasn't spoken to President Trump about the Postal Service and that he is fully capable of being independent at the Postal Service, despite his long relationship with the president and his um, his position as a chief fundraiser for the president dating back to 2016. He argues that all of the changes that he has made at the Postal Service recently have been in the name of efficiency, saving money. And he argues that at the end of the day, when these changes fully take effect, that actually mail delivery will speed up rather than slow down. But Democrats argue that that's not what the data shows, that uh, for at least a month and possibly more, there was this significant slowdown in mail processing. And we don't know whether that slowdown continues till today because USPS and DeJoy in particular have been reluctant to hand over more recent data. So another point of tension, as you know, Nancy, was about the Postal Service removing hundreds of high-speed mail sorting machines. What did DeJoy say about not putting those machines back online? So this was very interesting. DeJoy insisted today and also in a, a hearing that he appeared at in the Senate last week that he had nothing to do with the decision to dismantle, remove hundreds of mail sorting machines around the country. And despite the firestorm has, that has been created in recent weeks over this, he also says he hasn't tried to find out who made the decision to remove all of those sorting machines. Um, and, and yet at the same time, even though he doesn't seem to know much about who didn't, did it and why they did it, he insists that it was the right thing to do and that those machines aren't needed and that he's not going to hook them back up. So that is a major source of frustration for Democrats who feel that he either doesn't know or isn't saying exactly how and why this took place and, and who are also frustrated that even uh, even with the slowdown in, in the mail, in mail processing, even with the appearance of a conflict of interest here, that Postmaster DeJoy isn't willing to go ahead and hook these machines back up. Now, what he argued and what many Republicans in this committee argued was that this is routine, that, uh, you know, in another election year, 2012, when we had a Democratic president, there were also not just mail sorting machines that were eliminated, but entire mail facilities that were shut down. And nobody accused President Obama at that time of some kind of uh, major conspiracy to interfere with the election. Um, but you know what, what, what really has Democrats suspicious is the fact that they have asked for all kinds of documentation to back up um, why the postmaster decided to make some of these changes in the first place and how the mail processing system is being affected by it. And they haven't been able to get anything from DeJoy himself. They're getting documents from whistleblowers, but not through official channels from the Postal Service. Interesting. Well, today's hearing comes after the House passed a bill Saturday, which would provide an additional $25 billion to the Postal Service. What specifically does the bill provide funding for? 
Well, the bill basically helps the Postal Service make up a shortfall that it's experienced because of coronavirus, all the costs that have been associated with handling the mail during a pandemic. Um, you know, this the Postal Service routinely runs a shortfall, so uh, the, the Postal Service often needs some help regardless. And $25 billion is what the Board of Governors of the Postal Service recommended that Congress provide. But they're getting a different message from the Postmaster General. He says he only needs about $10 billion, and that's the number that the White House and Republicans seem to be comfortable with as well. So the big question now that the House has passed this $25 billion, will the Senate, when it comes back in mid-September, put a bill on the floor that grants $10 billion to the Postal Service? And if it does, what happens then? Because as we've seen throughout the course of this summer, Elaine, the two sides really haven't done a great job negotiating. And so um, even if a majority of members of Congress say they want to give at least some money to the Postal Service, that doesn't mean that they will uh, successfully negotiate a, a compromise at the end of the day. Hmm. Um, Nancy, I want to turn to tonight's Republican convention. Today, more than two dozen former GOP Congress members endorsed Joe Biden for president. We also know a number of Republican senators have opted to skip the convention. What kinds of reasons are they giving, if any? Many of them haven't said why they are not attending the, or speaking at the convention. A, a couple of a couple of them have. Susan Collins, for example, who's locked in a tight race for re-election uh, as a senator of the state of Maine. She said last month that she wasn't going to be speaking or attending. She just got it out of the way then, and she said she normally doesn't go to the convention when she's running for re-election. Uh, but we haven't heard from a number of the other senators who are also locked in tight races around the country, people like Cory Gardner of Colorado, Steve Daines of Montana, Tom Tillis of North Carolina. So it is interesting that so many of these senators in competitive races aren't, uh, aren't being given or aren't requesting speaking roles. Typically, a convention is a great way for a candidate to get more publicity, get more attention, particularly in a year where they can't do the kind of traditional campaigning that they're used to. Think of uh, Doug Jones of Alabama, for example, a Democratic senator who is locked in a very difficult race, and he popped up almost every night of the Democratic convention last week. He gave a speech one night, and he was featured in videos throughout the week because it's great publicity for him. But in the Republican convention, uh, the only Republican senator locked in a difficult race who's got a major speaking role is Joni Ernst of Iowa. And so clearly there are many Republicans who don't believe that appearing at this convention is helpful for their reelection prospects. But there's another issue at play here as well, which is that President Trump isn't happy with some of those Republicans because they really have been downplaying their relationships with him on the stump. He doesn't like that. He has always argued that that's a bad move for Republican candidates. Um, he, uh, he described some of them as trying to be cute by um, downplaying their relationships with him. And so it's possible that uh, when this list was being drawn up that the president himself uh, or you know, the, or those in his inner circle didn't want some of these senators to, to speak at the convention. So I think it's a two-way street. All right, really complicated calculus for some of these Republicans, it sounds like. Nancy Cordes, Nancy, thank you very much. Always good to see you. Coming up after a break, ahead of the RNC, we decided to poll the party's voters. Why a majority of Republicans say the U.S. is better off now than it was four years ago. Stay with us. You're streaming Red and Blue. So, I've got a question for you. What if you could watch all the CCO news you want and see all your favorite CCOers anytime, anywhere? Well, you can. Go ahead and grab your phone. Come on, I know it's close by. And go to WCCO.com or get the app and poof, there we are, right next to all those other networks you stream. Bonus time, it's free. You heard right, zip not a zilch, free. CBSN Minnesota, built by CBS News, powered locally by WCCO. Wherever you are, wherever you go, 
Breaking Bay Area News, live. This is CBSN Bay Area. I'm Michelle Griego. CBSN Bay Area. In your hand, on demand, and absolutely free. Highly updated top local stories and weather where you live. Available everywhere. Powered by KPIX 5 News. CBSN Bay Area. Always on, always free at KPIX.com. We spoke to black officers all around the country about the challenges that they face. When you're not in uniform, are you ever concerned for your safety? Out of uniform, I'm, I'm just another guy. I'm a black man first. CBSN Pittsburgh, your neighborhood news, streaming 24-7. Anytime, anywhere. Find it on KDKA.com and on all your favorite devices. Our latest CBS News Battleground Tracker finds a majority of Republican voters say the U.S. is better off now than it was before President Trump took office. That's something one can expect to be front and center during the party's national convention this week. Yet the party's view is in contrast with most Americans, with just 35 percent of overall voters saying they feel similarly. For more, let's bring in CBS News Director of Elections and Surveys, Anthony Salvanto. Hi there, Anthony. So what is the main reasoning for why Republicans feel the U.S. is better off now than four years ago? Uh, hey there, Elaine. Yeah, as you mentioned, and I'll show it to you here, that big difference between how Republicans say America is doing and how all voters do, the reason that they give when asked among a list, number one, confidence that they have in President Trump at 82%. The U.S. economy, which most of them are still feeling good about, optimistic about. And then another one that struck me, too, which is 70 percent saying because Democrats are not in power. And you may hear a lot of that at the convention, too. So two big tests. One is going to be whether the Republicans can convince and persuade more Americans to share that positive view, because you see that difference. And the other one, possibly we may hear them convincing or trying to convince the public that they are standing between them and the Democrats' agenda. You often hear a lot of that at political conventions, too, Elaine. Hmm. Well, President Trump has been running hard on the economy. However, right now you have millions of Americans who are unemployed in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. Where do Republicans currently stand on the administration's economic track record? Yeah. Let me show you a couple of other parts of our poll. Um, the condition of the national economy, again, big difference. As we mentioned, 67 percent, two-thirds of Republicans saying that it's at least in somewhat good, if not very good shape, but only a third of voters agree. So here again, setting up that dynamic of can the Republicans convince, persuade the voters out there who mentioned either to share that view or to be optimistic about the president's potential handling of the economy going forward. Republicans give him very high marks. They have throughout the crisis and the downturn. But again, almost two thirds of voters not agreeing, Elaine. Wow, it's a big gap. More broadly, Anthony, what were the biggest disparities between parties when it comes to the president's handling of the pandemic? Ah, this is a big one because we see in state after state, Elaine, People with negative views, a majority holding negative views of how the administration has handled the pandemic, they're voting against the president. So it's been a strong correlate of vote. And you see overall, you've got 73 percent of Republicans say that the U.S. handling of the virus is going at least somewhat well. But again, we're in the mid-30s here, 38 percent of Americans overall, voters overall, saying that it's going well. So again, that difference, that challenge for Republicans. And I would add that a lot of the states that have been really hard hit, Florida, Arizona, Texas, all these states in the Sun Belt, they're all in play now in part because of what voters are saying is a negative response, being negative toward the response of the, of the administration. So this could be one of the critical things to watch in the conventions if they can start to move that needle a lane. All right. So what are Republicans hoping to hear about during this week's convention, Anthony? And is there any indication that's what we should expect to see? Uh, good things. 
I'm going to flip through to this slide, Elaine. What's the uh, main reason you're a, you're a Republican? Most say they like what Republicans stand for, but there's four in ten that say they're Republicans because they dislike what the Democrats stand for. So that's part of it. But the other part, Elaine, if I flip through, what do you want to hear at the convention? Well, they'd prefer by 90% to 10 to hear good things about the president and Vice President Pence, and only 10% want to hear more criticism of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Why? Well, because by and large, Republicans have already made up their mind who they're going to vote for. And that brings us to a larger point, which is often these conventions now are about rallying the base, rallying current supporters to go and turn out. And I think that was certainly true in the Democratic convention, may very well be true for the Republicans. And in this year, when there may be extra hurdles to voting, you may have to fill out more forms to cast a mail ballot, you may have to stand in line longer if polling places are closed, rallying the base could be even more important than it's been in past years. Plus, it's mostly Republicans who may end up watching the convention in the first place, just like it was mostly Democrats who watched the Democratic convention only. Right. Okay. So although most of the convention will be virtual, there are some scaled back events happening in Charlotte, North Carolina this week, Anthony. President Trump won the state in 2016 by less than four percentage points. Where does the race there stand at this moment? Okay. Um, I can take you to the map here, Elaine. Let me show you. Uh, this is the way the race stands at the moment. If we tally it in terms of electoral votes, of course, the states decide the presidency, right? The electoral votes that are leaning towards Joe Biden versus those that are leaning towards the president. And if you look at North Carolina, we currently have that rated as a toss up. There have been some polling, some of our analysis can put Joe Biden up there slightly, but it's really within the margin of error, plus the recent history of voting Republican. So we're going to call that a toss up at the moment. North Carolina clearly important to the president's map. It is not the only state that's important to him, but it really is. It really is a critical one because, look, even if I were to say, let's give him that state, right? If he wins that state, he's still got to go and go through the Sun Belt and he's got to win Georgia and he's got to win Florida and a whole bunch of other states. So North Carolina is really the start as you go through that Sun Belt, which has long been so critical to Republicans and will be again this year, Elaine. All right, Anthony Salvanto, thank you so much for that snapshot. Appreciate it. President Trump is breaking with convention tradition this week. He'll make appearances on every night of the RNC, leading up to his full remarks on Thursday night from the White House. Let's bring in CBS News 2020 campaign reporters Nicole Skanga and Lecrae Mitchell. Nicole has been following the Trump campaign, and Lecrae is on the ground at the convention in Charlotte, North Carolina. Welcome to you both. Um, Nicole, let me start with you. Why does the Trump campaign want to show as much of the president as possible? I think I can guess. <laughs> Well, as you well know, Elaine, not only is this president the commander-in-chief, he's also the entertainer-in-chief. You'll recall that before he became president and was a New York City business mogul, he spent over a dozen seasons hosting The Apprentice. And actually, the creator of The Apprentice, Mark Burnett, is working on the Republican National Convention festivities uh, as a consultant who is leading in that production. Uh, in addition to that, you know, we saw the president make an appearance today, weren't sure if it was going to be a quick appearance on site at the GOP convention uh, during the roll call in Charlotte, North Carolina. He spoke for 55 minutes. And what we'll also see, uh, you know, this week, in addition to the president surfacing every single day, is a number of uh, members of the Trump family. Uh, so Donald uh, Trump Jr. will be speaking today. We'll hear later in the week from Eric Trump, from Ivanka Trump of course, from the First Lady, from Tiffany Trump as well. We'll also be hearing from a number of close Trump allies. These are politicians who made their careers by tying themselves close to the president, a rising star, Kim Classic, who is a congressional candidate currently running for Representative Elijah Cummings' uh, seat in Baltimore in that area. We actually just got some of the speech excerpts now uh, from the Trump campaign. She'll talk a little bit about safety in our neighborhoods, quote, we want jobs and innovation, like tapping the potential of the Port of Baltimore to create manufacturing jobs for Americans. So she'll be speaking tonight. We'll also 
also hear from Sean Parnell, who's a congressional candidate in Pennsylvania 18, going up against Democrat Connor Lamb there. Uh, he'll talk about his grandfather, according to these speech excerpts, who was a lifelong union Democrat, trying to convince Democrats to come over to the Republican side. But again, these are politicians that are very close to the president. You heard Nancy Cortez speaking about how a lot of vulnerable Republicans in vulnerable Senate races will not be heard tonight. Lastly, Elaine, not on stage. No former U.S. presidents, including uh, former President George Bush. He will not be in attendance at any of the festivities this week. A source close to the Bush family tells CBS News that is because some of the leftover animosity from the 2016 race where then candidate Donald Trump uh, headed off against, uh, of course, Jeb Bush. Right. Yes, we all remember very well. Um, that was very heated, contentious uh, back and forth between Jeb Bush and Donald Trump. Uh, all right, so Lecrae, it's been fascinating to watch how these campaigns have navigated in this new world and tried to adjust. Tell us about what's been happening in Charlotte. What's the scene like there at the convention? I'll tell you, Elaine, it definitely doesn't feel like it would, I believe, if it were a full-scale convention. You know, with restaurants packed and sort of the, the city teeming a bit, it's not really that feeling. And outside of the convention center where I was today, as the official business was taking place, it was actually pretty uneventful and quiet. Um, when I left outside of that barricaded area where media was throughout the event, there were a couple of Trump supporters, and they had flags, and they were wearing shirts. And there was some back and forth that took place with them and other demonstrators, and it was unclear if they were Trump supporters. But throughout the weekend, you have seen some demonstrations that have taken place overnight, Friday night, Saturday night, and even last night, where there have been some arrests that the Charlotte-Mecklenburg Police Department reported. And also people chanting and, and getting together and coming face to face with police officers in some cases. But for the most part, I think about an event that I attended last night where you had a couple of advocacy groups that are here based in Charlotte. And they met up and projected pictures of people who are unemployed and have been unemployed since the coronavirus pandemic really struck. And they said that that form of protest for them, projecting these pictures of unemployed workers who have really been suffering throughout this time, was their form of protest. And it wasn't as high key as some of the images of protesters and demonstrators that we sometimes see, um, you know, when they come face to face with police officers. But to this group, it was important. And they said that it was important that Republican officials think about this as they meet this week and throughout the week. And they're talking about, you know, making this country in their in what they would say making this country better or great again um, but I can't stress huh, enough well, that the scene here it definitely doesn't feel like a full convention yeah I imagine I imagine not Lecrae's well let me ask you Lecrae so Republicans say that they plan to focus on a more positive message for the country this week how do they plan to do that well, throughout the week, you'll see that there are more than 70 speakers that are scheduled to give, or nearly 70 speakers that are scheduled to give remarks and in honoring the great American story. And that's the overall theme for this year's RNC, honoring the great American story. And there are also daily themes throughout the week that the campaign announced, including celebrating a land of promise, a land of opportunity, a land of heroes, and a land of greatness. And I think what it really boils down to is you're going to hear messages from Republican leaders and from other guests that they've invited. And depending on where you fall and stand on some of these key issues that they'll discuss will be your take on whether or not it's a positive message. I can't help but think that I'm sure that criminal justice will come up criminal justice reform will come up this week as the president touts regularly the First Step Act and the role that he played in that. I have a feeling that, you know, we will definitely hear about coronavirus response throughout different states, as he mentioned briefly in his remarks today. And so I think what you're going to find is that voters and supporters of the president may find the messaging this week very positive. And I would I dare say that people who are not fans of him might not think that the messaging this week is, is that positive. So it depends on where you fall on some of these key issues. 
All right, Nicole Skanga and Lecrae Mitchell. In another universe, our whole red and blue team would be right there with you, Lecrae, <laughs> covering this convention. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, wonderful to see you both. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Coming up after the break, Republicans may be descending on North Carolina this week, but the general election isn't the only tight race there. There's a national spotlight on the state's open Senate seat and governor's mansion. Stay with us. You're streaming Red and Blue. Yes, we have all seen the polls and the pundits who say our party is dead. I've heard that before. So did Harry Truman. I'll tell you what I think. The only polls that count are the polls the American people go to on November 2nd. So, I've got a question for you. What if you could watch all the CCO news you want and see all your favorite CCOers anytime, anywhere? Well, you can. Go ahead and grab your phone. Come on, I know it's close by. And go to WCCO.com or get the app and poof, there we are, right next to all those other networks you stream. Bonus time, it's free. You heard right, zip not a zilch, free. CBSN Minnesota, built by CBS News, powered locally by WCCO. Wherever you are, wherever you go, breaking Bay Area news, live. This is CBSN Bay Area. I'm Michelle Griego. CBSN Bay Area. In your hand, on demand, and absolutely free. Highly updated top local stories and weather where you live. Available everywhere. Powered by KPIX 5 News. CBSN Bay Area. Always on, always free at KPIX.com. We spoke to black officers all around the country about the challenges that they face. When you're not in uniform, are you ever concerned for your safety? Out of uniform, I'm, I'm just another guy. I'm a black man first. CBSN Pittsburgh, your neighborhood news, streaming 24-7. Anytime, anywhere. Find it on KDKA.com and on all your favorite devices. Despite the majority of Republican convention events being canceled in Charlotte, North Carolina this week, President Trump appeared there earlier today to directly address local supporters. He met with delegates after being officially renominated. Before the pandemic hit, Charlotte was meant to be the site of Mr. Trump's pitch for another term. His messaging will still be crucial in the state as it remains a toss-up, according to our CBS News Battleground tracker. Nick Oxner covers all things North Carolina politics. He's the chief investigative reporter at our Charlotte affiliate, WBTV, and joins me from Charlotte with, I'm told, a five-second delay. <laughs> Nevertheless, Nick, nice to have you on Red and Blue again. So, the president won North Carolina by about 170,000 votes votes out of some five and a half million in 2016. How has the electorate changed in recent years? Not a whole lot, Elaine, is really the answer to that. Our population keeps growing, but when you look at the electoral breakdown or the party registration breakdown, what you see is we still have majority Demo majority of voters are registered Democrats. They've got about 400,000 more registered Democrats in North Carolina than registered Republicans, but actually there are even more registered unaffiliated than registered Republicans in North Carolina. But the bottom line remains that North Carolina continues to be a generally uh, rural and urban state. And so in the more rural and suburban areas, you tend to have more uh, conservative voters in the urban areas, places like Charlotte, Raleigh, Greensboro, Durham, you have more liberal voters. And so there's that contrast and tension between those two. And that's basically stayed the same since 2016. Well, we know there were demonstrations for the third straight night Sunday in Charlotte over the RNC. Do we know, Nick, who's behind these demonstrations? Yeah, it's a number of different groups. There have been a total of 14 people arrested over those three nights. Um, we expect, we know there are some events, I think, happening right now and more planned for later this evening. Uh, there's a couple different groups uh, lined with the Black Lives Matter movement, another group called uh, Charlotte Uprising that, again, are, are uh, protesting throughout uh, this time in the last few weeks and months. 
Well, the president and vice president both spoke earlier today in Charlotte. How did they go over and is their disappointment about the convention largely being moved out of the state? Yeah, huge disappointment from people uh, that the convention has moved out of the state. Local Republicans, both local here to Charlotte and local uh, across North Carolina, have been working for more than two years to bring the convention here. And so naturally, they were disappointed that it got reduced to, you know, a three or four hour gathering of about three to five hundred people. Uh, that being said, Republicans on the ground here were very receptive. I think they were pleasantly surprised that the president and vice president came. Of course, this was passed off as a surprise appearance, although it's kind of hard for the president and vice president to move anywhere uh, clandestinely, at least within the United States. Um, and so they're happy to see them. They were excited to see them. Uh, and that may be the most excitement that we're going to get this week for local Republicans that thought they'd be partying uh, for the rest of the week here. Yeah, a much different picture right now. Well, Republican Senator and Trump ally Tom Tillis is also up for re-election. There's heavy spending on both sides of the race with a lot of money coming in from outside the state. Who is running against Tillis and what does it look like his chances are right now? Yeah, so uh, Tom Tillis' Democrat opponent is a guy named Cal Cunningham, a relatively young uh, a candidate with a relatively moderate profile. At least that's what they're trying to strike him out to be. He's a military veteran. Uh, and the race is pretty close. And if you look at, at most of the recent polling, it hasn't really changed a ton over the last month or two. It has Cunningham ahead by a few points. Tillis behind by anywhere from about three points to five points. The bigger problem for Tom Tillis is that he's trailing significantly in most polls behind Donald Trump. He, uh, and so if Tillis is going to win, he's got to excite the base. We know that that the base is not excited about Tom Tillis in North Carolina. I was at a Trump rally last September where Tillis got booed when he got it was announced and took the stage. Um, and so Tom Tillis has an enthusiasm gap. Democrats are rallying behind uh, Cal Cunningham. The only kind of saving grace for Tillis uh, might be that that Cunningham's not polling super high either. There's still a lot of undecideds. There's still a lot of people who frankly don't know either of these men. Interesting. All right. Well, Nick, I also want to ask you about mail-in voting and accusations from President Trump of potential voter fraud. As you've reported on our program last year, a Republican operative was charged with election fraud for what happened in North Carolina's 9th Congressional District. What's been done since then to make sure it doesn't happen again? Yeah, so it's actually the, the role or the tale of what has happened since the 9th Congressional District scandal in North Carolina is really fascinating because the Republican-led General Assembly, the Republicans control the House and Senate uh, here in North Carolina, passed a, a host of reforms uh, to the absentee ballot process, uh, stiffening penalties, uh, changing the way that you can't send pre-filled out absentee uh, ballot request forms anymore. You have to sign if you assisted someone with their ballot ballot. Uh, so they made a host of changes since that time. Now this year, Democrat and Democrat aligned groups have come in and challenged those reforms that were in response to the 9th Congressional District scandal. Um, that being said, uh, we are off the charts in terms of the number of absentee ballot requests in North Carolina. And Elaine, even the North Carolina Republican Party is sending out blank absentee ballot request forms with President Trump's face on it and a tweet from him trying to distinguish between an absentee ballot and a vote by mail, if you can make much of a distinction there. Yeah, you wonder if voters are actually going to be able to kind of grasp the, the, the nuance uh, when the message over and over uh, may be confusing to some. All right, Nick Oxner, always great to have you reporting. Thank you so much, Nick. That does it for Red and Blue today at 7 p.m. Eastern. We'll have a look at the rest of the day's headlines. And at 8 p.m., we'll look ahead to tonight's RNC speakers and bring them to you live with analysis when they begin. And when tonight's speeches come to an end, we'll be here to break it all down. We'll be right back. You're streaming CBSN. Doctors and scientists in a race against time to cure coronavirus will show just how close they are racing to a cure on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 
15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. CBSN Pittsburgh, your neighborhood news, streaming 24-7. Anytime, anywhere. Find it on KDKA.com and on all your favorite devices. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You were donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. You can watch CBSN 24 7. We've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBS. Hi everyone, I'm Elaine Quijano. It's good to be with you. Thanks for joining us. Republicans and the Trump campaign will begin to lay out their arguments for re-election tonight. The first night of speeches will feature some of President Trump's supporters on Capitol Hill, his family members, as well as other supporters and conservative activists. The president appeared to give a preview of some of the arguments which will be made over the coming days during a surprise visit to the in-person portion of this year's convention in Charlotte, North Carolina. CBS News White House correspondent Ben Tracy has more. Just minutes after being nominated for a second term by delegates in Charlotte, President Trump took the stage and once again made the unfounded attack that Democrats are rigging the election through mail-in voting. What they're doing is using COVID to right. steal an election. Right. Right. They're using exactly. COVID to defraud the American people, all of our people, of a fair and free election. What the heck are you doing? The gentleman's doing? time is expired. Thank you. On Capitol Hill, Postmaster General Louis DeJoy, a Republican mega donor, said the president's attacks on mail-in ballots are not helpful. DeJoy denies ordering the removal of hundreds of mail sorting machines and blue mailboxes, moves that could slow down election mail, but says he won't reverse the changes. You won't put the machines back, though? No, back. I will not. You will not? Will not. You will not. Well, there you go. As the Republicans' four-day convention kicks off, the president is facing several new threats. Today, the New York Attorney General confirmed she's investigating the Trump Organization's finances and wants a judge to force Eric Trump, the president's son, to testify. President Trump's longtime aide, Kellyanne Conway, is leaving the White House to focus on her family after her 15-year-old daughter tweeted this weekend that she's devastated her mother is speaking at the Republicans' convention and is officially pushing for emancipation. President Trump is also facing scathing new criticism from his own sister, retired federal judge Marianne Trump Barry. According to audio first obtained by the Washington Post, Barry was recorded by her niece, Mary Trump, slamming the president. The change of story is a lack of preparation, the lying, the holy sh**. He has no principles. I'm none. None. And there are reports that a forthcoming book by a former confidant of First Lady Melania Trump contains audio recordings of her disparaging the president and her stepdaughter, Ivanka Trump. Meanwhile, today, Joe Biden's running mate Kamala Harris told young people it's essential they vote. I don't need to tell you what is on the line in this race. 
Donald Trump reminds us every day who he is and how much worse it can get with a second term in office. Let's bring in Joel Payne and Sandra Solon. Joel is a CBS News political contributor and Democratic strategist, and Sandra is a Republican strategist and founder of Capital Solutions. Hello, Sandra and Joel. Welcome to you both. Sandra, let me start with you. Hi. What messages can we expect to hear from Republicans tonight? You know, the, the primary theme is the great American story, and what we're going to hear tonight is really about that which President Trump has delivered upon the promises that he set out at the beginning of his um, campaign in 2016 and worked towards um, this re-election um, campaign. And so you're going to hear a lot of themes about um, that which folks feel Im are important to their person, whether it's their own economic circumstance or their personal safety, and um, how the Pre President Trump can begin to deliver upon that promise yet again in four years. Well, some of the items on the president's second term agenda include a return to normal in 2021 during the swamp and an America first foreign policy. Sandra, which do you think is going to be most important for the president to emphasize? And didn't the president address uh, many of these uh, issues during his first term? He did indeed. I think it, it's a continuation of the things that he felt were really important um, through the first term and a continuation, as we see in most um, um, on most presidential reelect campaigns, we see themes of continuation of the good that um, he believed he he believed brought forward and um, you know putting America first and in international um, international relations is really important and we'll continue to hear about that more as a as an important theme um, as we look towards 2021 um, so I think that's really critical and has been in many respects lost in the conversation around COVID which of course is so important but there are certain things that prior to COVID this country was in a very good place economically and hearkening back to that which he was able to deliver for the American people in his first term will be really, really critical for the Trump administration and all the speakers who we will hear from tonight and through the um, course of the next four days. Um, again, asking folks to rem recall um, pre-COVID the economic um, position they were in, um, which President Trump can certainly take significant credit for. Well, Joel, let me ask you, how do you think the Biden-Harris campaign then needs to respond to the arguments that are going to be laid out by Republicans over the next few days? You know, I'm not sure the best way to handle a convention is to do counter-programming. I know that that's kind of a topic du jour, right? Uh, the Republicans tried to do it last week with the Democratic convention. I think the Democrats will probably do some of that this week. But I, look, I think conventions are what they are. They are celebrations of the party. The president is going to speak. Apparently, he's going to speak every night. Um, and I actually think that from the Biden campaign perspective, that's the best thing they can hope for, because every time Donald Trump opens his mouth, um, he is registering more voters and juicing Democratic excitement more than Joe Biden probably ever could. Um, the entire strategy for the Biden campaign is to put the words and the action of Donald Trump back in front of voters. So in terms of counter-programming, I think maybe the best counter-programming that Democrats could do is advise uh, swing voters, people who haven't made up their mind to turn into the RNC, because I don't think a lot of Democrats feel like the message is going to be that compelling. Interesting take. All right. Well, Sandra, in recent days, we have seen President Trump attack mail-in voting and criticize Goodyear. I wonder if there is a concern among some Republicans that he may not be rebutting some of the arguments that Democrats made during their convention last week. Um, well, I think it's unfortunate we have sort of had this distraction around some of these other topics when um, when the Democrats did certainly outlined an agenda that is worthy of debate and discussion about what it is they intend to deliver for the American people, higher taxes, uh, a, a, a complete change in approach from where we what we've encountered thus far over the course of our American history, quite frankly, the, the possibility of real progressive agenda items around socialism and the Green New Deal and so forth. And so uh, I, I personally would have preferred to have seen President Trump spend some time speaking to and um, those types of agenda items um, as well. But 
as was noted a moment ago, conventions have a certain purpose. They are intended to to talk about the very things that um, that the candidate wants to deliver in their time as president, and they are an important part of the process. And um, and we then begin as soon as these conventions are over, we begin to look forward and have a more detailed debate about the, the policy agendas of each of the candidates. Well, Sandra, I want to turn to the topic of policing. The president's agenda was released hours after video surfaced, appearing to show Kenosha, Wisconsin police shooting Jacob Blake, a 29-year-old black man, multiple times in the back while he was trying to enter his car. How important, Sandra, do you think it is for Republicans to address issues of race and policing this week? Well, certainly it cannot be ignored. It is um, of high mind on the American voter um, in terms of both um, racism, um, systemic racism, policing, law enforcement, public safety, a very a tremendous amount of emotion around all of these issues, and it certainly can't be ignored. Um, and but it's important that they also highlight the very things that they intend to do. Um, law enforcement and public safety is really critical to the overall platform of the Republicans, and highlighting that for the American voters, I think, will be really essential. And um, and I fully anticipate you'll begin to see some of that. But it's a um, it's a sticky issue, of course, and the emotion around it warrants a very um, a very careful words around the issue. And Joel, on that point, both Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have both faced criticism, as you know, from the left on the issue of criminal justice. How do you think their campaign needs to address this? Well, I don't know if it's a motion. I think it's more outrage is the um, word that I would use to describe uh, how everybody should feel about it. And I think that Biden and Harris have both demonstrated that outrage. Um, certainly, um, they are vulnerable to criticisms for um, votes and statements in their past. But I think in terms of who has the forward-looking agenda to make sure that African Americans feel safe with policing, feel safe with systemic racism and, and, and you know, counter efforts to fight systemic racism, I think the Biden-Harris ticket has done pretty well. I will also say this, you know, Republicans talk a lot about their desire to appeal to African-American voters. And look, this is not the only issue that African-Americans care about. But I do think it is a difficult argument to make if Republicans claim that they're serious about giving African-Americans a choice in this election in terms of who's going to fight systemic racism and who's going to fight, uh, you know, uh, errors in policing. And then they have someone like Daniel Cameron, who is the attorney general of Kentucky, who has failed to prosecute Breonna Taylor very famously. That has been a social media um, discussion for months and months and months. The, Breonna Taylor, of course, the young woman in Louisville who was brutally murdered in her own apartment for no reason at all. So to have Republicans showing off a speaker like that who has aired in that way, um, whatever efforts the president might use to try to counter himself with Joe Biden, I think that they fall on deaf ears when you have an oversight like that. Hmm. Well, Sandra, I want to ask you about some of the people who are not speaking during the convention. Mm -hmm. The list includes a number of Republican senators up for re-election, including Lindsey Graham, Cory Gardner, Martha McSally, Susan Collins, and John Cornyn. Are Republican lawmakers trying to distance themselves from the president? What does that say more broadly about where the president stands in this current political landscape? I think each one of those races requires um, very thoughtful presentation of of their individual um, policies and the way in which they relate to their state. Um, I'm in Colorado. Cory Gardner, of course, is, um, is has a very difficult election here. He has, um, while he has the support of President Trump and he supports President Trump, he is um, making his own campaign his in a way that has managed to amplify the very good work that he's done in Colorado. And you're seeing similar efforts on the part of those candidates who you noted are not profiled at the, at the um, convention. And it's not unusual to see swing type election um, campaigns not particularly profiled in um, convention platforms. So not terribly surprised to not to um, not see those individuals at the conventions themselves. And again, as, as we see in Colorado, Cory Gardner is running his own race while he supports President Trump. Um, he is a man into himself and is running his own campaign. 
Well, Joel, former Arizona Republican Senator Jeff Flake recently announced that he is supporting Joe Biden, and we heard a number of Republicans speak in support of Biden during last week's Democratic convention. How does that type of bipartisan support factor into the campaign's message? Look, I think uh, whether or not Republicans think that Jeff Flake, you know, is a singular person is an important uh, endorsement for Joe Biden to get just the drumbeat, right? I think the campaign announced probably something in the neighborhood of 40 or 50 former Republican office holders um, who endorsed the former vice president today, Republicans endorsing the Democratic candidate. I think that's the bigger point that there is a trend here of Republicans, former Republicans who are coming out to support Joe Biden. And I think that's a tough story for the campaign to to tell. I will say also, just to Sandra's point, I think she makes a good one about um, these, you know, Republican members needing to run their own races in, in different parts of the country. The problem is the president won't allow that to happen. The president famously has not allowed his allies to have any room to run the way they need to run locally. If you don't run with Trump, the president takes that very personally. So with Susan Collins in Maine, it's not healthy for her to run with Donald Trump. He's unpopular there. That might cost them that race. Cory Gardner in Colorado has a different race to run. Martha McSally, is pulled down by one her own personal unpopularity but also the president's rising unpopularity in a state like Arizona that's trending more blue but the president doesn't allow people in his own party to do that it's something that President Obama allowed Democrats to do in 2012 when he was less popular it's something that President Bush allowed Republicans to do in midterm elections presidents generally allow people in their party to to run the way they need to run this president is different in that way yeah, we've seen at various rallies President Trump has name-checked those he has felt were not perhaps sufficiently loyal in his view. Um, but uh, we'll see what happens with this convention, this unconventional convention, yet another one this year. All right, Joel Payne, Sandra Solon, thank you both very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank a quick programming note for you. We will have full coverage ahead of tonight's Republican National Convention. Our pre-show begins at 8 p.m. Eastern, right here on CBSN. Postmaster General Louis DeJoy returned to Capitol Hill Monday to testify on the growing concerns over mail delays ahead of the presidential election. DeJoy continued to defend the agency's ability to handle and sort mail-in ballots. He also fielded multiple questions regarding his admitted loyalty to President Trump. The testimony comes after the Democratic-led House passed legislation on the weekend to allocate $25 billion to the USPS. The bill would also reverse operational changes the agency has made since DeJoy assumed office in June, but it's unlikely to pass the Senate. CBS News Chief Congressional Correspondent Nancy Cordes joins me now. Uh, Nancy, nice to see you again. So Louis DeJoy began his testimony with a promise that the Postal Service will do everything it can to deliver mail-in ballots securely and on time. Uh, we're less than 70 days out from the election. Has he outlined any specific plan to ensure this will happen before the election? Well, he did say that he would ensure, Elaine, that uh, postal workers could work overtime if they needed to in the final weeks leading up to the election. He promised lawmakers that mail-in ballots will be treated on par with first-class mail, in some cases even get priority over first-class mail. But beyond that, uh, he hasn't really said much about how he is going to make sure that mail-in ballots do get to their destination on time, that there isn't a lag. And Democrats are clearly very suspicious about what is going on at the Postal Service. Nothing that DeJoy said, had to say in this House hearing really assuaged their concerns that there is a slowdown in mail service that doesn't need to be taking place. Um, and, and the fact that they're still missing so much data that would explain where things stand right now, what led DeJoy to make the changes that he made in the first place, that has left them very concerned that there is going to be a slowdown in November. Uh, Republicans, on the other hand, argue that this is all overblown. Uh, they say that everything that DeJoy is doing is simply to save money and to make sure that USPS stays solvent. So the two sides really uh, looking at completely opposite sides of the coin at this point. Well, DeJoy was also asked specifically about mail sorting machines that have been removed uh, from use over the past few weeks. And I want to play an exchange between him and Democratic Congressman Stephen Lynch. Let's listen. Well, you actually put the high-speed machines No, back. I will not. You will not. Will not. You will not. Well, they agree.
go. All right, so Nancy, why is the Postmaster General so opposed to reinstating these machines? That is a great question, Elaine, and one that he really hasn't answered to Democrats' satisfaction. On one hand, he has been saying that he is not the person who decided to remove so many of these sorting machines, hundreds around the country, in the first place. Um, and yet, at the same time, he's saying that it was the right thing to do and that he's not going to go back on it. He says he hasn't looked into who decided to do it and why, which means that you know he doesn't have all the facts, even though he is the person who runs the postal service, and yet he is um, insisting that that it was it was done because those machines aren't needed, and so therefore he's not going to reinstate them. Well, the chair of the House Oversight Committee, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, is threatening to subpoena Louis DeJoy if he doesn't turn over internal USPS documents on mail delays dating back to June when he took over the agency. What does the committee hope that will mm -hmm. accomplish? Well, they want to understand two things, Elaine. First, they want to know what it was that led him to make the changes he made in the first place. What kind of data was he relying on? He has uh, declined to share that with them. Remember that Louis DeJoy only took over as Postmaster General in mid-June. He had never worked for the Postal Service before. That's fairly unusual for a Postmaster General. He had worked, uh, he had run a, a transportation delivery company, came in from the outside, and within a month, he was making fairly major changes, not only to operations, but really reorganizing the entire reporting structure of upper management to him. And so uh, Democrats believe that those were fairly radical changes for someone to make who's only been on the job a few weeks. They want to know what kind of information he relied on to make those changes. And then what they also want to understand is where things stand right now. They were able to get some internal USPS documents over the weekend, not from DeJoy, but from other individuals that shows that there was a slowdown, a pretty marked slowdown in mail delivery that lasted at least a month starting in mid-July, but that data cuts off in early August. So while DeJoy told lawmakers that actually last week was a pretty good week and things are starting to bounce back, they don't really have any proof of that. All they know is that they're hearing from hundreds of constituents who say they're not getting their mail, they're not getting their medications, and what they really want to know is how big the problem is. And since DeJoy himself is declining to hand over that information, they're now threatening to try to get it some other way. Right. It sounds like that data is uh, critical. Uh, well, the U.S. Postal Service is, of course, uh, an independent government agency. The Postmaster General is not typically a partisan position. But, Nancy, how politicized has the office of the Postmaster General become? And what could this potentially mean down the road? Uh, it's become incredibly politicized incredibly quickly. It really isn't a job that is typically handed out as a plum position to some uh, presidential friend or, or, or fundraiser. But in this case, not only uh, is DeJoy a major donor to the president, he was actually one of the top donors back in 2016, but he came in late in the process. The Postal Service had hired uh, an executive search agency to gather names that, uh, of individuals who might be appropriate to run the Postal Service. DeJoy was not one of them. He was brought in by a, a fellow Republican on the Board of Governors late in the process after many people had already been interviewed. So he was a late ad, um, according to David Williams, who was the vice chair of the Board of Governors, just resigned in April because he was so upset about by what he saw happening. He said DeJoy was nowhere near the strongest candidate and yet somehow ended up with the job at the end of the day. And so uh, it raises a lot of red flags for Democrats, as does the fact that DeJoy still has millions of dollars worth of investments in companies that compete with the U.S. Postal Service. DeJoy said in the hearing that he has no conflict of interest, that he has followed all the ethics rules at the Postal Service to the letter, and um, that it, there, if there is anything wrong with what he's done, that uh, either the ethics office or an inspector general at the Postal Service would 
uncover it. So he says he can do his job and that it doesn't matter that he supports the president. And he frankly uh, broke with the president in the hearing several times. He said he does believe that mail-in ballots are safe and he's going to do everything he can to safeguard them, even though the president, as, as you've been discussing, has repeatedly railed about mail-in balloting and has all kinds of theories about how it's going to ruin the election. All right, a lot of people are learning a lot more about the leadership of the U.S. Postal Service, probably not something most of us thought of uh, before this time. Nancy Cordes, thank you so much for bringing some clarity to this. Really appreciate it. Coronavirus cases have topped 23 million worldwide, and more than 5.7 million of those cases are in the U.S. Florida has become a hotspot for new infections. But despite that, the state still plans to open up to thousands of sports fans next month. Manuel Bojorquez is in Miami with more. Scientists in Hong Kong say they've confirmed the world's first known coronavirus reinfection in an apparently young and healthy patient who tested positive for COVID-19 four and a half months after the first infection. The news comes amid more concerning behavior. This video shows a maskless crowd packed into a bar near Auburn University. I think it's painful. Dr. Renata Roldan warns progress against the virus can be easily reversed, especially if people let their guard down, as many did on Memorial Day. We still have a long way to go. Yes, we do. There is no pill that I can give you to change your behavior overnight. In the meantime, a Florida judge sided with the state's largest teachers union, halting a state order to reopen schools to in-person instruction. But fans will be in the stands for the Miami Dolphins home opener next month at 20 percent capacity. That's still 13,000 people. Manuel Bojorquez, CBS News, Miami. Coming up after the break, protests erupt in a Wisconsin community after a police officer shoot an unarmed black man. Now the state's governor has called in the National Guard. Plus, a pair of tropical storms are threatening parts of the Gulf Coast. How emergency crews are preparing amid a pandemic. And massive wildfires continue to burn in Northern California. Officials say it could be weeks until the flames are put out. This is CBSN, CBS News, always on. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original That's recording. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You were donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. 
even really young kids are feeling what's going on right now. How should parents be talking to them about this whole question of racial justice? How do we embrace this moment and turn it into real change? What we really must focus on is moving from protesting to policy. Join Gail, Anthony, and Tony on CBS This Morning. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, for anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. You can watch CBSN 24 7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. Over 600 wildfires have erupted across California due to dry lightning storms and record high temperatures. Jonathan Vigliotti reports on the worst of the fires. Tonight, wildfires have displaced more than nearly 200,000 Californians. Almost a million and a half acres the size of the Grand Canyon are in the firefighting lines. Much of it so rugged, the attack can only be by air. Included in the carnage, the state's oldest skyscrapers. These redwoods have lived hundreds of years, and we're told hundreds of them have been destroyed in what has been a historic and deadly nine days. Fire crews say it could take weeks to extinguish all of the flames. Overnight, 10 more fires started after lightning struck again. It's, it's a tough day today. It's possibly we have the hot, dry winds that may hamper some of our control efforts. Tough day and risk for 14,000 firefighters deployed, 96% of California's fighting force, up against the unimagined flaming roads. A firefighter videotaped this driving near Santa Cruz. Statewide, 12,000 structures have been destroyed and another 30,000 threatened. Millions of people along the Gulf Coast are bracing themselves for back-to-back -back storms. Tropical Storm Marco was downgraded from a hurricane overnight. It threatened to bring heavy rain as it made landfall Monday. But a bigger threat is on its heels. Tropical Storm Laura is expected to make landfall later this week, and experts warn it could become a major hurricane. The storm barreled through the Dominican Republic and Haiti on the weekend. At least 11 people died. Janet Shamlian is in Louisiana with more. Louisiana highways bumper to bumper. Evacuees trying to get out as a weakening Marco charges in, threatening storm surge and coastal flooding. Obviously, since Katrina, everybody is a little bit more sensitive to any kind of storm coming this way. This shelter in low-lying Plaquemines Parish filling fast, even amid COVID concerns. Teresa France and her daughter left their home. Others stayed behind. So I got two family members down there that we don't know if they're going to make it. Tonight, the Texas coast is bracing as a bigger threat. Laura is looming. We don't have the luxury of time, so the time to prepare is right now. That storm already plowed through Haiti and the Dominican Republic, leaving at least a dozen dead. Have you ever seen two storms at one time approach this region? This is unprecedented. Not only are we worrying about one hitting today, three days later we're worried about another one. For a closer look at what to expect, let's bring in CBS News weather producer David Parkinson. Hi, David. Welcome. So let's start with Tropical Storm Marco. What's the biggest threat right now? David, can you hear me? I think we're having some trouble with the connection to David. We will try to get David connected in a moment. Let's move on. California Supreme Court has overturned the death sentence of the man convicted of killing his wife, Lacey Peterson. The pregnant school teacher was murdered on Christmas Eve more than 15 years ago. Her husband, Scott Peterson, was found guilty. He has been housed on death row at San Quentin State Prison since 2004. The court threw out the death sentence Monday after it found a series of, quote, clear and significant errors that undermined his right to an impartial jury.
The decision leaves Peterson's murder conviction in place, but orders a new penalty phase trial. Prosecutors will be allowed to seek another death sentence during that trial. Peterson maintains his innocence. Wisconsin's governor is sending up to 200 National Guard troops to the city of Kenosha to manage protests. The demonstration started after police shot a black man in the back several times. Two of the officers involved have been placed on administrative leave. And a warning to viewers, the following footage is disturbing. Mola Lenghi reports. This 20 seconds of video taken by eyewitness Rayshawn White shows the moment 29-year-old Jacob Blake was shot in the back by a Kenosha police officer. At least seven bullets were fired. You can see as he walked to the driver's side of an SUV, an officer grabbing Blake's shirt as he got inside. Rayshawn White describes what happened before he started filming. One officer had him in a headlock. He was pulling his arm. The other officer had him in a headlock punching him in his ribs and he kind of maneuvered out the way and the female officer tased him. Police were responding to a domestic disturbance call on Sunday evening. Complainant says Jacob Blake isn't supposed to be there and he took the complainant's keys and refused, is refusing to get them back. Two of the officers involved in the shooting were placed on leave during the investigation. Overnight, anger turned to vandalism. Some set city vehicles ablaze while officers in riot gear clashed with others. This incident comes almost three months to the day George Floyd was killed in police custody. Attorney Benjamin Crump represents the Floyd family, and now the Blake family, too. It is foreseeable that these things are going to happen if you continue to engage in racism and discrimination in your policies and practices. Coming up after the break, as scientists around the world race to develop a coronavirus vaccine, one is in advanced trials. We'll take a closer look. Plus, thousands march in the capital of Belarus. Why protesters are still demanding action three weeks after a controversial presidential election. You're streaming CBSN. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original That's reporting. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. 
even really young kids are feeling what's going on right now. How should parents be talking to them about this whole question of racial justice? How do we embrace this moment and turn it into real change? What we really must focus on is moving from protesting to policy. Join Gail, Anthony, and Tony on CBS This Morning. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. You can watch CBSN 24-7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. In Health Watch, a coronavirus vaccine candidate is in advanced trials. Drug maker AstraZeneca claims it will be able to produce 3 billion doses of it. Charlie Daggett got an inside look. That could be the very solution to the pandemic the world is waiting for. Even before the final phase of testing and government approval. This is a process development lab. The vaccine is on a massive manufacturing drive. In that particular process, you will be making millions of, of vaccines. Millions. That, millions of vaccines. In that one run. Absolutely. The challenge, how to scale up from a small vial of vaccine to billions of doses fast. Dr. Clive Glover is director of strategy for Paul Corporation. That process would generally be measured in years. And, you know, five years is not unusual. We were able to design the process get the equipment into uh, one of our manufacturing partners and run the initial process within eight weeks. Eight weeks? Yeah, so it was a, uh, it was a sprint, <laughs> to say the least. That sprint is now a relay race, and this biotech lab on the south coast of England has the baton. The process starts with a small batch of vaccine. We grow the cells up within this particular bioreactor, and then we use some startup version of the vaccine. It infects the cells that are growing inside here and then allows the vaccine to, to, to actually make more of the vaccine itself. The rest is a complex filtering process that screens out impurities until you've got a bag full of vaccines ready for the vials and eventually your arm. This system will be used by manufacturers of the Oxford vaccine around the world, all waiting for the go ahead to start rolling out in record time. Charlie Daggett, CBS News, Portsmouth, England. Protests over Belarus's contested presidential election have entered their third week. The country's opposition supporters held a mass rally on the weekend, marking two weeks since President Alexander Lukashenko claimed victory. Chris Livesay has the details. From a savage crackdown to unbridled resistance, protesters in Belarus taking to the streets by the tens of thousands, demanding President Alexander Lukashenko step down after rigging the elections. What's going to happen to you? We met Olga Kavalkova, the spokeswoman for the opposition leader. She told us our voice cannot be ignored. Everything will be fine with me. But then, just this morning, unauthorized protests landed her and an opposition colleague in police custody, the last place several dissidents were ever seen or heard from again. President Lukashenko had tried to scare all of these people into staying home, but it's clearly backfired despite beating them, bludgeoning them, and even torturing them. Today, they've given up their fear and traded it in for anger and for courage as they stare down riot police and a president of 26 years. State media showed Lukashenko circling the protests in a helicopter, saying they flee like rats, then later descending, wearing a bulletproof vest and toting a rifle. He said he'll consider new elections over his dead body. Not enough to frighten away 16-year-old Yana. Will the protesters win? Yes, of course. I, I'm sure that we will win. 
The people are chanting, long live Belarus, and Lukashenko, go away. It's clear to everyone here that the man known as Europe's last dictator has lost legitimacy. But the question is, does he realize that, and how much longer is he willing to cling to power? Chris Lipsey, CBS News, Minsk, Belarus. While policing in America continues to be under scrutiny, it is not only an American issue. Holly Williams shows how Britain and countries in Europe are also dealing with the concern. If you're black, you're five times more likely to be stopped by the police. You're more likely to be charged with a criminal offence. That's the United Kingdom he's describing, not the US. And this is Michael Fuller, the most senior black officer ever to have served in the British police, now retired. People of colour are still underrepresented in the British police, and Fuller told us the racism he encountered was often unspoken. They would give me the dirty jobs to do, delivering death messages where, where relatives had died, searching dead bodies that had been pulled out of the river. Ultimately, I went for promotion and managed to get through some 12 ranks to get to the top of the police service. How difficult is it to tackle racism within an organisation? Well, it's, it's, it's very difficult. I was uncompromising uh, in tackling racism in that I would call people out where I could, but sometimes the people being racist were my bosses. Allegations of police racism cut across borders. But when you compare the US to the UK and Europe, any interaction with the police is much more likely to be deadly in America. The US police shot more than a 1,000 people dead last year, compared with three in the UK and zero in Denmark and Switzerland. If you've got a highly weaponised society, you've got the police highly weaponised. It, it is a disastrous cocktail. British police don't routinely carry guns, and under European human rights law, police are only allowed to use deadly force if it's absolutely necessary. Wait, 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 he didn't do it! Of course, nobody has all the answers. British police apologised last month to Bianca Williams, a champion track athlete who was handcuffed in front of her partner and son. Williams claims the incident was racially motivated. Police say it was a routine stop and search in a high crime area. Overall, though, there's been a push to make police officers better qualified, Michael Fuller told us. In some European countries, police training is in national academies and takes three years. In contrast, the US has no national standards and in many states, training lasts just a few months. Police officers have tremendous power. Uh, they have tremendous discretion. And what you want is for the police officers to use that discretion wisely, um, but in a way that demonstrates um, that they're non-discriminatory. And I think the better educated they are uh, in, in these issues, the more likely they are to, to make good decisions. Holly Williams, CBS News. Here's a look at some of the stories we'll be covering in our next hour. The U.S. has now recorded more than 5 million cases of coronavirus as concerns grow over whether people can get the virus twice. Plus, the Postmaster General testifies again on Capitol Hill. Why Louis DeJoy is standing by the changes he's made to the Postal Service. And the Republican National Convention kicks off. We'll have full coverage of night one. You're streaming CBS at CBS News, always on. So, I've got a question for you. What if you could watch all the CCO news you want and see all your favorite CCOers anytime, anywhere? Well, you can. Go ahead and grab your phone. Come on, I know it's close by. And go to WCCO.com or get the app and poof, there we are, right next to all those other networks you stream. Bonus time, it's free. You heard right, zip not a zilch, free. CBSN Minnesota, built by CBS News, powered locally by WCCO. Wherever you are, wherever you go, breaking Bay Area news live. This is CBSN Bay Area. I'm Michelle Griego. CBSN Bay Area. In your hand, on demand, and absolutely free. 
highly updated top local stories, and weather where you live. Available everywhere. Powered by KPIX 5 News. CBSN Bay Area. Always on, always free at KPIX.com. We spoke to black officers all around the country about the challenges that they face. When you're not in uniform, are you ever concerned for your safety? Out of uniform, I'm, I'm just another guy. I'm a black man first. CBSN Pittsburgh, your neighborhood news, streaming 24-7. Anytime, anywhere. Find it on KDKA.com and on all your favorite devices. Face coverings have been proven to curb the spread of the coronavirus. Now some people are using them as a fashion accessory. Nancy Chen has more. The necessary accessory of the summer has turned the San Antonio car salesman into an unlikely style inspiration. These are most all, all the ones now. Steve Montgomery went viral after matching his ties and face masks which his girlfriend sews from pocket squares. I've got over 107 ties, but mask I'm still working on. I think we've got like up to 20 now. So I have not worn the same mask since I started this. And how long ago was that? Uh, three weeks ago, I believe. Big brands are offering their own fashions for face masks, including designer Tory Burch. David's Bridal has a line of masks devoted to brides and grooms. And then there's this. An Israeli company calls it the most expensive face mask in the world, with 3,600 diamonds valued at $1.5 million. People are finding much more affordable designs online. More than 29 million masks were sold on Etsy in April, May, and June, enough to cover the distance between New York and London, and then some. Face mask accessories are also popular. Samantha Katz sells chains that hold masks when people take them off. You have your mask, and then you have your accessories, so you just can put it behind you, in front of you. They start at $20 and come in a variety of styles. It kind of completes a look, like a necklace might complete a look or a headband or a hat. Now your face mask accessories go into as well. Kat says the designs help people express themselves even while covering their face. Nancy Chen, CBS News, New York. In Health Watch, as families try to figure out what to expect this fall as many kids prepare to return to the classroom, children with allergies and asthma face additional concerns. Michael George has more on what parents need to know. Like many kids, 10-year-old Rachel Grace Wilborn is sort of looking forward to going back to school. I like seeing my friends, but I don't really like school in general. <laughs> The Wilborns had concerns because Rachel has asthma, allergies, and eczema, so they reached out to their allergist. My husband and I both had a lot of questions about that, um, and um, in the face of everything that's going on, she's also started a, a recent medication. There's not a one-size-fits-all answer for every child or every situation. Dr. J. Allen Meadows is president of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. He says now more than ever, it's critical your child's allergies and asthma are under control. If your asthma and allergies are out of control, then certainly that increases the risk of going back to school. Allergists say parents should prepare kids to wear masks. While some with asthma may feel masks make breathing more difficult, a mask shouldn't impair breathing in someone with well-controlled asthma. The school nurse and teacher should have a copy of your child's allergy and asthma action plan. All medications should be up to date and know the difference between the symptoms of COVID and asthma and allergies. If you've got a fever, that's not asthma, that's not sinus, that's not allergy, that's something that's viral. The Wilborn family feels confident in their decision to send their children back to school. I don't feel like it's going to be a significant uh, risk for her as compared to to anyone else at this point, um, and he felt that way because her asthma is well controlled. They're hoping for a happy, healthy school year. Michael George, CBS News. 
A nun broke a world record after running an entire marathon on a treadmill. Marissa Parra with our Chicago station WBBM tells us why she did it. Yeah, I'm feeling pretty bad, but I'm doing great. Bad, but great. That's one way of feeling after running 26.2 miles in sister Stephanie Beliga's shoes. The neighbors would be like, I heard about that nun running the marathon over there. So yeah, I'm like, they're like, that's me. Sister Beliga is used to running. She's been doing it her whole life. But today, her usual marathon was a little different. This is for us. <laughs> Standing on a treadmill flanked by nuns in face masks, holding phones next to Sister Beliga to live stream over Zoom. Celebrating that year with us. An idea they came up with just weeks ago after the Chicago Marathon was canceled due to COVID. And she said, I could raise $80,000. I came back to her and said, you're serious and you got to do it big. She's like, OK, but the hardest marathon of her life on the treadmill was also the most important one. There's no way I would have been just like getting on a treadmill and running a marathon and trail for no reason. The entire time she had the mission of Our Lady of Angels or Mission OLA on her mind. I'm uh, helping to run the project and I don't want any more delays. In West Humboldt Park, the neighborhood has been plagued by the virus, unemployment and social unrest. We were the only real place you could get food in our direct neighborhood for a week. So um, we've been and we've been so we've been serving three times as many people as normal. So knowing what every dollar and every mile was fundraising. I was in a lot of pain at like mile 23 or 24. She pushed through, but not without a little help from surprise guests, including oh, the <laughs> And now her own childhood hero gets to watch Sister Beligo break a Guinness World Record for the first female to record a marathon on a treadmill. Big day here on Iowa Street, yeah. Sister Beliga says she's raised over $92,000 for this fundraiser alone, which not only goes towards raising money for food, but finishing renovations for this building, which will also offer housing. Reporting from West Humboldt Park, I'm Marissa Parr with CBS 2 News. Four years ago, the L.A. City Council passed a resolution declaring 824 as Kobe Bryant Day. The date represents two numbers he wore as a Laker. August 23rd is the late star's birthday. Jamie Yukas shows us how the athlete is being remembered. Today is Kobe Bryant's 30th birthday, and we're going to see... To celebrate what would have been Kobe Bryant's 42nd birthday Sunday, Lakers star LeBron James shared this 2008 video reflecting on the loss of his friend who was killed along with his daughter Gianna and seven others in a helicopter crash in January. The touching tributes reach beyond the basketball court with the LA Dodgers on the diamond before Sunday's game and a new ad released by Nike. Better father, better father, better father. Those missing him most honored Bryant on social media with wife Vanessa posting, I wish you and Gigi were here to celebrate you and daughter Natalia, I love you forever and always. Mamba out. A legacy not just as a star athlete, but as a husband and father. Jamie Yukis, CBS News, Los Angeles. Here's a look at some of the stories we'll be covering in our next hour. The U.S. has now recorded more than 5 million cases of coronavirus as concerns grow over whether people can get the virus twice. Plus, the Postmaster General testifies again on Capitol Hill. Why Louis DeJoy is standing by the changes he's made to the Postal Service. And the Republican National Convention kicks off. We'll have full coverage of night one. You're streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on. The biggest names in politics. Whoa, that's news. Did the CDC let the American people down? Face the questions you want answered. Do you think that the president has the authority? The decision. When was it made? Who made it? What does that mean for the risk of reinfection? Good point, Margaret. Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan on CBS. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Todd. Yes, it's my comeback. 
<laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original <laughs> reporting. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Even really young kids are feeling what's going on right now. How should parents be talking to them about this whole question of racial justice? How do we embrace this moment and turn it into real change? What we really must focus on is moving from protesting to policy. Join Gail, Anthony, and Tony on CBS This Morning. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. You can watch CBSN 24-7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. See what's new under the sun this Sunday morning with Jane Pauley. It has been a day of raw emotion as this city and the country mourned a man whose death has inspired a movement. State police are here. Behind them, firefighters dousing the flames. What do you hope no one comes from this? This is what's coming from it. The change is here. You can watch CBSN 24-7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's good to be with you. Thanks for joining us. In less than 30 minutes, Republicans will begin making their case for President Trump's re-election to the American people. Tonight, we'll hear from Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina. Other primetime speakers will include House Minority Whip Steve Scalise, House Oversight Ranking Member Jim Jordan, former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Nikki Haley, and the President's son, Donald Trump Jr. A number of conservative activists will also speak. Earlier today, Republicans officially named President Trump and Vice President Pence as their candidates. Here's how the vice president summed up the campaign message to his party. With your continued support and with God's help, we're going to make America great again. Again. This afternoon, the president again made unfounded claims about the safety of voting by mail in his opening remarks. He also issued a stark warning to Republicans. Bad things happened last time with the spying on our campaign, and that goes to Biden, and that goes to Obama. And we have to be very, very careful. We have to be very, very careful. And this time, they're trying to do it 
with the whole post office scam. They'll blame it on the post office. You could see him setting it up. Be very careful and watch it very carefully because we have to win. This is the most important election in the history of our country. We expect to see the president every night of the convention. His official acceptance speech will be on Thursday in prime time. For more, let's bring in Major Garrett and Caitlin Huey Burns. Major is our CBS News chief Washington correspondent, and Caitlin is our CBSN political reporter. Hello to both of you. Welcome. Um, Major, let me start with you. What is the main message we can expect from Republicans tonight? Well, Elaine, it's the message tonight. It's the message of all four nights, that the economy was good before the pandemic. The president responded as best he could to the pandemic. Oh, and by the way, when you think about the pandemic, don't blame the president, blame China. Law and order is a real issue. Peaceful protesting is not only acceptable, it's constitutionally protected, but rioting and lawlessness isn't. Democrats coddle lawlessness and rioters. Republicans don't. And when President Trump says America first, he means it. And that's what's going to be pounded into the convention audience, however large it is, streaming or on television for these four nights. So, Caitlin, if that is the message, has the president actually laid out a clear, specific vision for what the next four years of a Trump administration would actually look like? Well, the campaign released a set of bullet points outlining what they want to say is the agenda moving forward, but it was pretty vague, including things like ending reliance on China, um, coming up with a vaccine by the end of this year, and, quote, returning to normal in 2021. But if we got any sort of preview about what the policy proposals will be, we heard from the president today who gave a surprise uh, appearance in front of delegates to the National Convention in Charlotte, and during his appearance there, which lasted almost an hour, he focused on the election itself and decided to focus his remarks on claiming that the election is going to be rigged, uh, claiming without any evidence that mail-in voting, which we're going to see more of this election cycle, is rigged and that Democrats are trying to take this election away from him. Again, claiming a lot of these things without evidence and describing uh, the process uh, in, in inaccurate terms. And so that gave us a preview of kind of how he's focusing. In our CBS News Battleground track, Tracker polling that came out out on Sunday, 90 percent of Republicans say that they want to hear a positive vision from Donald Trump and Mike Pence. The president uh, is, is focusing on the opposition at this time. As Major mentioned, he's facing the big challenge, of course, of a pandemic and an economy uh, on the collapse, even though he leads Biden on the economy in some measures. Well, Major, why isn't the Republican Party laying out a clear policy message, and how unusual is that? It's highly unusual. I mean, one thing that is true about this convention, like the Democratic convention, it is much smaller. It is not nearly as ambitious as originally planned. It doesn't even have a new platform. One of the curious things about this convention, Elaine, is Republicans are going to endorse last the platform from 2016. Well, of course, the platform for 2016 was written against the Obama administration. So it actually says the administration is a failure. Well, the administration that is a failure is the one that's in office. I know that doesn't mean, that's not what the platform means, but because this can't be conducted in any typical way, they're having to graft things on at the last minute. And this bullet point summary of a second term Trump agenda has that very feel to it, grafted on, pushed together rather rapidly. And I would just note this, there are five items related to China, five bullet points, four to the pandemic, two to education. That gives you an idea of the emphasis that the Trump campaign, at least in bullet point form, wants to lead with. One other thing I would point out, the state of the race is this. Donald Trump comes into this convention, the weakest incumbent in many, many years. As weak as Jimmy Carter, as weak as George Herbert Walker Bush. Both lost their bids for re-election, but there is one important difference, and this convention underscores that important difference. Both Jimmy Carter, and George Herbert Walker Bush faced primary challenges that were real and to a certain number of Republican voters of that time, at least partially debilitating. President Trump has not. No serious challenge emerged during the primaries against this sitting president. That makes him different from these other 
weakened incumbents with low approval ratings. So that means what? The president has consolidated what is the Republican base. He has that solidly behind him. And what Republicans leading into this convention were telling me, what we need from the president is four days of focused, optimistic, disciplined messaging. I talked to several after the president's somewhat rambling, discursive address this afternoon. They said to me, that's not what we're thinking about. Hmm. So, Major, I want to ask you about some developments just in the last 24 hours. We've learned that the president's former campaign manager and current White House counselor, Kellyanne Conway, is leaving her official capacity uh, to take care of family issues and prominent evangelical leader and vocal Trump supporter Jerry Falwell Jr. may be resigning his post as president of Liberty University. Remind us, Major, of their roles in the Trump campaign and administration, and how significant do you think these developments are? Well, they're distinct and very separate. I don't want to make sure that we conflate them in any way. Kellyanne Conway was a campaign manager in the final stages, the first woman to lead successfully a presidential campaign across the finish line, and has been an aggressive counselor and advocate for this president her entire term in the White House. She's an accomplished woman with significant political skills. She has fenced in public on social media with her husband. That has obviously created not just a rift between them, but a rift that appears to have affected at least one of their teenage children. And as parents, they are both pulling back from this public feud and this public spectacle to work on their family. That is clearly within her rights, clearly within her prerogative, and is not scandalous at all, other than it may be emblematic of the toxic culture of President Trump in politics. I don't know. People may reach that conclusion. Jerry Falwell Jr. is in the middle of a scandal, okay? His personal conduct is being scrutinized intensely. To some evangelicals, it may appear blasphemous and fully hypocritical. There are allegations of an extramarital affair that he was a willing partner in, essentially a threesome. You can read the details if you want, lurid as they are, but there is a component of his life now that looks very hypocritical. And he was a strong, vocal, and continuous supporter of Donald Trump during the primaries in 2015 and 2016, maybe not 2015, but certainly 2016, and an advocate during his presidency, and a strong advocate at the times when this presidency felt most under siege, the Mueller investigation, impeachment, and the like. So if you're asking yourself, are there dimensions of the Trump coalition that have components of either hypocrisy and others have used the word grifters. Lots of people I remember, Elaine, who were walking in the very tight inner circle of then candidate and nominee Donald Trump in Cleveland in 2016, either have been arrested, tried, convicted, or pled guilty. You want to be, I'll go over the names. Roger Stone, Paul Manafort, Rick Gates, Steve Bannon, Michael Flynn, and Michael Cohen. That's a rather large cadre of people who were once in a place of position, prominence, and power, now on the other side of the law, and quite obviously on the other side of the chasm from where the president is now and wants to stay and where they find themselves. Hmm. All right, um, Caitlin, let me turn back uh, to something Major touched on a bit earlier and this idea of what we heard and what we can expect to hear from the president during the week. Uh, this idea of being disciplined and focused in the messaging. How scripted do you expect the president's comments over the course of this week to be? Well, if today is any indication, and if the past four years are any indication, uh, not too scripted. We know that he is going to appear in some form or fashion every day of this convention. That's a departure from the norm. But remember, Joe Biden also departed from the norm last week. He appeared in some form, either through video, virtual, conferencing in, or appearing uh, in some form during uh, each night of the convention last week as well. Uh, but today gave us a good indication of how the president feels coming into this convention. He talked about his um, his having to move the convention from North Carolina to Florida back to North Carolina. Um, he aired a lot of grievances today, and I expect those to kind of continue because you could tell today that the president has not been able to be on the campaign trail in the the doing the rallies that he sees as um, a, a huge component of his presidency. Um, that was on display today, kind of using this appearance today in place of that. Um, and Major, 
I wonder who is actually sort of responsible, in addition to, of course, the president himself, uh, for shaping, though, what the at least prepared portion of the president's remarks are. Do we have a sense who's on that team helping to uh, kind of, you know, hone in on some of the themes that they do want to emphasize, understanding full well that, of course, as you and Caitlin and others have reported so many times before, it's ultimately up to the president to decide whether or not he sticks to those messages. Right. Think of this as a four-day television show and Donald Trump Jr. Donald Trump, rather, Donald J. Trump is the executive producer. Not Donald Trump Jr., Donald Trump the president. He's the executive producer, and when you're the executive producer, you get to make all talent decisions. And he's making the talent decision. He's the talent. He's going to be the lead spokesperson. And he's going to craft the message. He's going to stick with it or not. He did not stick with today's prepared remarks. He was not intended to speak for an hour extemporaneously and ramble on and on about largely fictitious and invented allegations about fraud to come. Nothing has happened yet. Yes, did it take some time to count ballots in New York? Yes, because they hadn't done it in that volume before. And to be accurate, it takes time. Time does not equivalent, time taken is not the equivalent of fraud. It is the exact opposite. It is time taken to be accurate and verifiable so you can prove the results you ultimately announce. But the president will take keys and cues from Jared Kushner, his daughter Ivanka, Bill Stepien, the new campaign manager, I've talked to many Republicans who believe for at least the last three or four weeks he has gotten the president's attention, built a little bit more of a disciplined and electoral strategy-based campaign that looks better and more active and more vigorous than the one that Brad Parscale had been putting together. Obviously, Stephen Miller, his chief speechwriter, will have a substantial role to play in this, as well as the Treasury Secretary, Steve Mnuchin, and his chief of staff, Mark Meadows. That, I would say, would be the very close inner circle. Kellyanne Conway, I'm sure, as she is preparing to leave, will also weigh in and probably with some influence. Last name to think about, Hope Hicks. She's back in the West Wing. She's always been among the most reliable and trusted advisors the president has on communication, tone, and style. Interesting. All right. Major Garrett and Caitlin Huey Burns. Major, before we let you go, my sources tell me that it is your birthday on this day. Uh, I don't think you have to confirm or deny if you don't want to. It is, if it is, however, I will just say hap happy birthday, Major. Thank you. As my uh, beloved uh, journalism professor, <laughs> the dearly departed Hal Lister said when I was a junior in the University of Missouri, that's not just a fact, Elaine. That's a true fact. <laughs> okay. On that note, Major Garrett, Caitlin Huey Burns, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Sure. Coming up after the break, a baseless conspiracy theory is seeping its way into U.S. politics, what QAnon is and how dangerous some experts think it can become. Stay with us. You're streaming Red and Blue. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh! Boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative. Da, 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 da. And truly original <laughs> recording. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. 
and yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Even really young kids are feeling what's going on right now. How should parents be talking to them about this whole question of racial justice? How do we embrace this moment and turn it into real change? What we really must focus on is moving from protesting to policy. Join Gail, Anthony, and Tony on CBS This Morning. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. You can watch CBSN 24 7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. A baseless conspiracy theory is making its way into U.S. politics. QAnon was born online, and the FBI has called it a potential domestic terror threat. Supporters of the fringe theory have been seen increasingly at the president's rallies. His son, Eric Trump, has promoted it, and it's even been linked to former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. However, the White House has been giving indirect answers lately about how President Trump feels about it. Well, I don't know much about the movement other than I understand they like me very much, uh, which I appreciate. But I don't know much about the movement. Uh, I have heard that it is gaining in popularity. Again, when I look at all the threats facing the homeland, this is not one that rises uh, to a significant level. There are many other threats here domestically as well as overseas that we're focused on, and we'll continue to uh, to look at those and, and, and address those. So I can't comment and, and not going to comment on every fringe element and fringe group out there. There are many. There are very, there are many. Does the president disavow? Does he condemn QAnon? Well, listen, we, we don't even know what it is. I can tell you, you've spent more time talking on it, Chris, than we have in the White House. I don't even, I don't know anything about that conspiracy theory. I don't know anything about QAnon. And, and I, I dismiss it out of hand. For more, let's bring in CNET senior producer Dan Patterson. He has reported extensively on QAnon. Hi there, Dan. Nice to see you again. Uh, if you could start by giving us some background on what this conspiracy theory is uh, and how it ties into politics. Yeah, good to see you, Elaine. And the word baseless is a good place to start with QAnon, uh, mostly because their origins are tied to uh, internet message boards. Uh, the 4chan message board uh, was uh, kind of the heart of QAnon. Now, 4chan uh, was known uh, for being fairly loose with their uh, rules and moderation. Uh, and as, for, as QAnon metastasized, uh, it migrated to other internet platforms, some mainstream like Twitter and Facebook, some not mainstream like 8chan. The conspiracy alleges um, that a shadowy figure known only as Q is leaving messages for uh, President Trump's supporters that there is a deep state conspiracy to remove the president through a revolution. And uh, Democrats are also in cahoots with large tech firms to traffic young children for sex. Uh, again, this is entirely baseless. And like a lot of things that happen on message boards, it tied in all sorts of other fringe elements, including Jeffrey Epstein conspiracies. Parts of QAnon have reached back to uh, some of the uh, Kennedy conspiracies. It it is become a, a snowball of conspiracies that really uh, ties into um, American politics in a number of different ways. But it, it is hard to pin down the one thing that QAnon is. Unlike other fringe political movements, such as the Tea Party, which grew into a large policy-oriented. A uh, group of people with uh, of Congress people, uh, QAnon has no one overriding policy objective other than their support of President Trump. Uh, 
in 2018 and 19, they then migrated to uh, 8chan. And I spoke with the founder of 8chan, uh, Fred Brennan, earlier today. And he says uh, that the site's current owner, a gentleman by the name of Jim Watkins, uh, keeps 8chan alive because it is uh, financially profitable for him, because it drives a lot of web traffic, and because it's notorious. It keeps him and the website in the news. Um, so this is hard to really, uh, it, these are allegations and it's hard to prove, uh, but 8chan has been rebranded. It is hosted in Russia and there are a lot of shady elements associated, uh, with the current site's owner. Well, I know that you've had some personal interactions with people who believe in the conspiracy theory. How did those come about? Well, look, Elaine, like all reporters, I never want a story to be about me. But like reporters who cover QAnon and other conspiracy theories, it's impossible not to interact with these groups. After uh, reporting stories or doing segments about the group, uh, I and other reporters would receive thousands, tens of thousands of – it's called a brigade of messages on Twitter and other social networks. Um, they find your email address and they send you death threats or what they call doxing. Uh, this is releasing like your home address and your social security number on the internet. Uh, some of these people even sent uh, to my home address uh, snail mail, actual pieces of, mess of mail. This is intended, uh, the FBI said this is intended as a threat uh, and as intimidation to prevent reporters from continuing to, to talk about this organization and uh, their support of the president. That's really troubling to hear, Dan. Um, let me ask you about this. Prominent politicians who were already elected or worked in the Trump White House have ties to QAnon. In May, the Daily, D the Daily Beast reported then-Congressman John Ratcliffe had an official campaign Twitter account, which followed other accounts that promoted QAnon. He's now the director of national intelligence. And on July 4th, former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn had this to say. Where we go one, we go all. Where we, we go, go one, we go, go all. God bless America. God, God bless, bless America. America. <laughs> So General Flynn isn't in the Trump administration anymore, but how do QAnon followers interpret these lack of denials? Uh, they see this as an absolute endorsement. Um, they feel that as though they have a direct connection. Whether they do or not, we can't prove. But they feel as though they have a direct connection with President Trump, with Vice President Pence, and a number of members of the president's uh, administration. They also have manifest themselves uh, in police and law enforcement organizations as well as the military. So whether there is a reciprocal relationship, we can't prove and we don't know. But we do know, and you can read many of the thousands of posts from QAnon across social media, that they do believe that when the president or the vice president speaks about the group, even these denials affirm the group's uh, vali uh, validity and purpose. All right. We'll continue to watch and see uh, as the questions continue. I'm sure um, we'll follow this. Dan Patterson, thank you very much. Really appreciate your insight. And a quick note, Dan will join us again tomorrow night with more on QAnon. We'll discuss Republican primary winners who promoted the conspiracy theory and how it could shape November. Coming up after the break, we are just moments away from the first night of the RNC. Ahead, an update on how the Trump campaign is preparing in the final minutes. Stay with us. You're streaming Red and Blue. Big business, elite media, and major donors are lining up behind the campaign of my opponent because they know she will keep our rigged system in place. They are throwing money at her because they have total control over every single thing she does. She is their puppet, and they pull the strings.
the biggest names in politics. Whoa, that's news. Do you think that the president has the authority to send in active duty troops? Face the questions you want answered. Did the CDC let the American people down? Tell me about the decision. When was it made? Who made it? What is the next area that you are concerned about? What does that mean for the risk of reinfection here in the United States? You bring up a very good point, Margaret. Margaret, that's a great question. Face the Nation with Margaret Brennan on CBS. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative. Da, 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 da. And truly original <laughs> recording. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. We're just minutes away from the Republican National Convention's official kickoff. Here's another look at the key speakers tonight. They include the president's son, Donald Trump Jr., and former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley. The president is also expected to make an appearance in tonight's broadcast, as well as each night after. Let's bring in CBS News campaign reporter Nicole Skanga with another look at what we can expect. Hi there, Nicole. So in an unusual move, the president is expected to appear every night of the Republican convention. Typically, presidential nominees appear at their own political convention on the final night to accept the nomination. Why is the campaign pushing for so much airtime? Well, Elaine, of course, we did see former Vice President Joe Biden every night during last week's Democratic National Convention. But yes, this amount of airtime is unprecedented. We saw the president today dropping in his own GOP nominating convention roll call in Charlotte, North Carolina, for a surprise visit for 55 minutes. And we talked about earlier how Donald Trump is really the made-for-TV candidate and president. But part of the reason he's appearing so much during this GOP convention is also because this is very much the party of Trump. In fact, according to our latest CBS News Battleground Tracker poll, more Republicans say that being a Trump supporter is very important to their political identity, 58 percent, than say that being a Republican is important to their identity. And so this is a party that has really coalesced around the incumbent president, uh, save a few anti-Trumpers who we've heard from over the past few days. Days. This party is with the president, and for that reason, they are going to try to put the candidate in front of the lights and on stage as much as possible. All right, well, more than 70 Republican speakers are expected to take the stage in support of the president. What message will they try to convey? Well, the overall theme from the Republican National Committee is honoring the great American story. Tonight's name is Land of Promise. We're going to have Land of Opportunity tomorrow, Land of Heroes, Land of Greatness, finally on Thursday. But what this all means, the Trump campaign has told us in conversations with CBS News that they're trying to create a patriotic message that celebrates America's founding. Uh, we'll hear from Vice President Mike Pence at Fort McHenry on Wednesday. Of course, we know Fort McHenry was the place that inspired Francis Scott Key to write the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, but there is also a second message that uh, Republicans are trying to convey, and that is that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are wrong for America. And they're trying to shift the focus here from the referendum on President Donald Trump's uh, handling of the coronavirus that this campaign has been and on to why he should be the pick come 2020, that he's shooting jobs into the economy despite the record unemployment we've seen amid this pandemic, that he'll continue to lower taxes and a message of energy independence. We'll also hear from some everyday Americans among these 70 speakers, so folks that have received PPP loans amid the coronavirus pandemic, supporters of school choice, a nurse that supports telehealth, things of that nature. All right. Well, we've been speaking about the president's fighting for you second term agenda. What more can you tell us about why the campaign decided to lay out these policy points? How did they plan to achieve them? Yeah, well, right now, this second term agenda is really just a list of about 50 bullet points. You know, the sections are jobs, eradicate COVID-19, end our reliance on China, drain the swamp, defend our police. So in many ways, they just sort of sound like slogans of the Trump campaign. Some of the bullet points are frankly unclear. Hmm. Teach American right. exceptionalism. Uh, Nicole Skanga, thank you very much.
Oh, sorry, sorry to cut you off, Nicole. I'm having some audio issues here, but let's go ahead and tune in to the Republican National Committee's mostly virtual convention. A country where we are judged by our character with dignity and respect for all. The belief that all are created equal, that lives matter irrespective of race, creed, or color. Committed to excelling beyond our dreams, limited only by our imaginations, where rugged individualism and American exceptionalism inspire the best in each of us. Lift off. And when we see injustice to one, we act to fix it for all. This is our story. We journey together. We stand in the breach to preserve a way of life that, while imperfect, has brought prosperity, honor, and dignity to generations past and will for generations to come. Four years ago, we faced an historic crossroad. Career politicians promising change every election, but delivering emptiness. We chose a different path, a man who is not a politician, a man who cares, a man who loves America and all Americans, a man who works tirelessly for you, even tonight during this nomination. The results? Jobs were created, embracing the undeniable greatness of diversity, prosperity, safe communities, protecting and serving, caring for one another. Still, politicians spun their deceptions and obstructed progress, fanning the flames of lawlessness. We all know that it is easy to criticize. It takes a true leader to solve problems. COVID-19, while others criticized without solutions, President Trump's swift action saved lives. And as leading Democrats want to keep businesses closed down, our president is leading the way for a full economic recovery. We are America. Despite unpredictable events, we as Americans work together to overcome challenges, write our own stories. The legends for our posterity. America, land of promise, land of opportunity, land of heroes, land of greatness. Join us over the next four nights as we write the next chapter of our journey and share our vision as the greatest country with the greatest citizens that attain the greatest achievements. From Washington, D.C., welcome to the 2020 Republican National Convention. Tonight, celebrating America as the land of promise. Let us pray. And pray we must, as grateful citizens of a country we boldly claim to be one nation under God. Pray we must, praising the Lord for a country where freedom of religion is so cherished, where, where both Republicans and Democrats begin their conventions, heads bowed in prayer. Pray we must, conscious of those suffering from COVID, and those unwearied frontliners who care for them and all of us. Pray we must that all lives may be protected and respected in our troubled cities and the police who guard them, in tense world situations where our men and women in uniform keep the peace, for the innocent life of the baby in the womb, for our elders in nursing care and hospice, for our immigrants and refugees, those lives threatened by religious persecution throughout the world or by plague, hunger, drugs, human trafficking, or war. Pray we must in thanksgiving, in thanksgiving, dear God, for democracy, 
as we ask your hand, Almighty Father, upon this convention and the nominees of both parties, and his wisdom upon an electorate so eager to perform its duty of faithful citizenship. Pray we do, for we dare claim, in God we trust. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. It is an honor to be with you tonight. My name is Charlie Kirk. I run the largest pro-American student organization in the country, Turning Point USA, fighting for the future of our republic. Speaking to you in my personal capacity tonight as a 26-year-old, I see the angst of young people as well as the challenges facing new parents. I am here tonight to tell you, to warn you, that this election is a decision between preserving America as we know it and eliminating everything that we love. For decades, ruling class leaders in both parties sold out our future to China, to faceless corporations and to self-serving lobbyists. They did it to preserve their own power and enrich themselves, all while rigging the system to hold down the good, decent middle-class patriots striving to build a family and pursue a decent life. All of this changed dramatically in 2015 when a billionaire named Donald Trump put his own life of luxury on the line. From that moment he came down that famous escalator, he started a movement to reclaim our government from the rotten cartel of insiders that have been destroying our country. We may not have realized it at the time, but Trump is the bodyguard of Western civilization. Trump was elected to protect our families from the vengeful mob that seeks to destroy our way of life, our neighborhoods, schools, churches, and values. President Trump was elected to defend the American way of life. The American way of life means you follow the law, you work hard, you honor God, you raise your kids with strong values, and you work to create a civil society. The American way of life means you speak your mind without retribution, without being kicked off social media by a self-righteous censor in Silicon Valley. It means you can freely practice your religion and that church is more essential than a casino. And it means that we judge people on their actions, not on their immutable characteristics. The American way of life is being dismantled by a group of bitter, deceitful, vengeful activists who have never built anything in their lives. They have us locking up pastors while releasing violent criminals from prison. We are kicking doctors off of social media, yet promoting Chinese state-funded propaganda on major tech platforms. This election is the most critical since 1860 when a man named Lincoln was elected to preserve the Union from disintegration. This election is not just the most important of our lifetime, it is the most important since the preservation of the Republic in 1865. By re-electing Trump, we will ensure that our kids are raised to love our country and respect its founding fathers, not taught to hate or be ashamed of them. We will build monuments to heroes, not burn down our cities. We will be a country that rises to higher heights, that dreams big, thinks big, and achieves the impossible. A country that values our remarkable journey, the complexities of our past, but clearly communicates to the next generation that we have to be grateful, not angry, that we live in the United States. We will be a country that makes it easier to have many children, live quiet and peaceable lives, and worship your God without a tyrant getting in the way. We will be a country that has its best 100 years ahead. We will build a future where America remains the greatest country ever to exist in the history of the world. All of that is within our grasp if we secure four more years for the defender of Western civilization, our champion, 
my friend, the 45th president of the United States, President Donald J. Trump. I'm Rebecca Friedrichs, a veteran California public school educator. I'm here to give voice to America's great teachers because our voices have been silenced for decades by unions who claim to represent us. They do not. When other dedicated teachers and I served within the unions, we spoke up in defense of children, parents, scientific fact, and American values. For our trouble, we were brutalized, booed off the platform, barred from committees, shouted down, and even spit upon by union leaders. This is how unions treat devoted teachers. But what's even worse is how their agenda of control deceives Americans and our children. They've intentionally rewritten American history to perpetuate division, pervert the memories of our American founders, and disparage our Judeo-Christian virtues. Their lenient discipline policies morphed our schools into war zones, and they back defunding police and abolishing ICE. Unions collect billions annually from unsuspecting teachers and push this radical agenda into our classrooms against our will. Why? The only way to keep a free republic is with a well-educated, moral citizenry that can self-govern. Unions are subverting our republic, so they undermine educational excellence, morality, law, and order. That's why they spend hundreds of millions annually to defeat charter schools and school choice, trapping so many precious low-income children in dangerous, corrupt, and low-performing schools. To fight back on behalf of children and America, brave teachers brought a lawsuit against unions. And do you know who intervened against us? The Obama-Biden administration and California Attorney General Kamala Harris. They argued against us at the U.S. Supreme Court. Their comrades labeled us spawns of Satan and slandered us in mainstream media. No matter their abuse, we'll keep fighting for the country and children we love, just like President Trump. He's breaking the union's grip on our schools. That's why unions have tried to destroy him since the day he was elected. But President Trump isn't afraid to fight for what's right. He won't back down. His courage gives great teachers renewed hope. He's even proposed education freedom scholarships to return control to parents, protect religious liberties, and empower kids to escape dangerous, low-performing schools. The Republican platform supports educational freedom. The Democrat Party does not. Democrats stand with deceptive teachers unions who pick on loving teachers and little kids. President Trump stands with America's families, great teachers, and most importantly, our children. So America's great teachers, let's stand with President Trump in protection of the kids and country we love. so grateful to speak with you today. My name is Tanya Weinrice. I am from Montana where I live with my husband, my hero, a Marine and retired police officer. My husband and I own Mountain Mud Espresso. We are not some multinational corporation. Our success is not measured by stockholders, but by our neighbors, the people we see at church and at jujitsu school with our son. Mountain Mud Espresso is the American story, a story not just for entrepreneurs, but for millions of hardworking men and women who are building their American dream every day. A few months ago, like so many businesses, we got the crushing news a large event we were serving was canceled because of the virus. 
our business was on the brink, threatened to be shut down from losses that were not our fault. I was scared. I thought of our 50 employees, the Mountain Mud family, and when I thought of their jobs, I thought of their rent being due, their kids, and I felt personally responsible. I'm not too proud to admit that I fell on my knees and prayed, Lord, what do I do? His words rang clear, keep on working, it will be okay. I had faith, and let me tell you, you have to have faith when your husband is a Marine and a police officer who was shot at on the job. And when you run a business, a little faith goes a long way. Faith in Jesus and faith in America. But I'm worried we have a generation of Americans who have been told that the American dream doesn't exist. That's a lie. I know because I live that dream. It's why I feel so strongly that we need a president who believes in the American dream like President Donald Trump, now more than ever. I am so thankful that my prayers for help were answered. My company was one of the first to receive a PPP loan, and praise God, it has been a lifesaver. Not only were we able to keep every single employee, but we've been hiring weekly ever since. I feel for local businesses across America who are under assault from shutdowns, from riots, and now facing the terrifying prospect of Joe Biden coming after everything we've built. I am so grateful we have leaders like President Trump standing up for local businesses like mine. Thank you, President Trump. It is exciting to be part of the great American comeback story. I'm Congressman Matt Gates. I'm speaking to you from an auditorium emptier than Joe Biden's daily schedule. But we are a nation of full hearts and clear minds. We see the choice clearly, strength or weakness, energy or confusion, success or failure. President Trump is the first president since Reagan not to start a new war. Biden has foolishly cheerled decades of war without winning, without end. President Trump knows we are strongest when we fight hardest, not in distant deserts, but for our fellow Americans. We must fight to save America now, or we may lose her forever. Joe Biden might not even notice. Settle for Biden. That's the hashtag promoted by AOC and the socialists. The Woketopians will settle for Biden because they will make him an extra in a movie written, produced, and directed by others. It's a horror film, really. They'll disarm you, empty the prisons, lock you in your home, and invite MS-13 to live next door. And the police aren't coming when you call. In Democrat-run cities, they're already being defunded, disbanded. Blaming our best and allowing society's worst? That's the story they write in Hollywood. That's if the lights even stay on in California anymore. A state that cannot keep power running for its own people should not send its junior senator to be vice president. They used to write only in fiction, but nightmares are becoming real. Cops killed, children shot. At the Democrat convention, they say, if you vote against Trump, it will all stop. Appeasement is never a winning strategy. No, we won't settle for violence in our neighborhoods or at our border. We won't settle for decades of bad decisions by basement-dwelling Joe Biden. We settle a continent. We know that the frontier, the horizon, even the stars belong to us. Donald Trump, like all builders, is a visionary. That which is built in the mind is even more powerful than the brick and mortar that holds it together. First comes the mind, then the making. First comes the vision, then the work. Washington, Lincoln, and Jefferson are immortal precisely because of the pull they have on our imagination. You cannot cancel a culture that loves its heroes. The dangerous left need America to be weaker to accomplish their goal of replacing her. We know that to make America great again, we must first make something of ourselves. That is the meaning of true strength. My great-grandfather was a railroad man. As a Florida man, I watch our rockets routinely send the brightest beyond the heavens with our flag and our hope. America is the greatest country that has ever existed. 
Don't let any celebrity, athlete, or politician tell you otherwise. President Trump sometimes raises his voice and a ruckus. He knows that's what it takes to raise an army of patriots who love America and will protect her. We must win this election if we cherish our country as much as we should, for there is no place to run, no refuge for freedom should we fail. America is not just an idea or a constitution, it is our home. We must protect our home with unbreakable made in America strength, strength I see every day in President Donald Trump. Thank you. My name is Kim Klasik, and I'm running for Congress in Maryland's 7th District. And like Shirley Chisholm, I'm unbought and unbossed. Let me remind you, the Democrats have controlled this part of Baltimore City for over 50 years, and they have run this beautiful place right into the ground. Abandoned buildings, liquor stores on every corner, drug addicts, guns on the street, that's now the norm in many neighborhoods. You'd think Maryland taxpayers would be getting a whole lot since our taxes are out of control. Instead, we're paying for decades of incompetence and corruption. Sadly, the same cycle of decay exists in many of America's Democrat-run cities. And yet the Democrats still assume that black people will vote for them, no matter how much they let us down and take us for granted. We're sick of it. We're not gonna take it anymore. The days of blindly supporting the Democrats are coming to an end. In Baltimore, we have the highest number of black Republicans in the entire country running for office this election cycle. Joe Biden believes we can't think for ourselves, that the color of someone's skin dictates their political views. We're not buying the lies anymore. You and your party have neglected us for far too long. We want safety in our neighborhoods. We want to make the most of the federal opportunity zone I'm standing in right now in West Baltimore. We want higher paying jobs and more business opportunities. We want lower taxes, we want school choice. We want a chance to get ahead, not just get by. That's what President Trump promised and that's what President Trump delivered. I want Baltimore to be an example to Republicans around the country that we can compete in our inner cities if we reach out to the citizens and deliver real results. President Trump is bringing this country back roaring. He's bringing the American spirit to life for all Americans. So I'm asking you to help President Trump complete this great American comeback. And then I'm asking you to help me start this great Baltimore comeback. Thank you and God bless America. Good evening. I'm Ronna McDaniel, Chairwoman of the Republican National Committee. And on behalf of everyone in our party and President Trump, thank you for tuning in as we kick off this historic convention. As we speak to you tonight, we send our thoughts and prayers to those facing terrible fires in California, recovering from storms in Iowa, and preparing for hurricanes in Louisiana and the Gulf Coast. Democrats started their convention last week with Eva Longoria, a famous Hollywood actress who played a housewife on TV. Well, I'm actually a real housewife and a mom from Michigan with two wonderful kids in public school who happens to be the only, only the second woman in 164 years to run the Republican Party. And unlike Joe Biden, President Trump didn't choose me because I'm a woman. He chose me because I was the best person for the job. Four years ago, President Trump started a movement unlike any other. And over the next four days, we will hear from a few of the millions of hardworking, everyday Americans who have benefited from his leadership. If you watched the DNC last week, you probably noticed that Democrats spent a lot of time talking about how much they despise our president. But we heard very little about their actual policies. Policies that would have been unthinkable a decade ago. Policies like banning fossil fuels, eliminating private health insurance, taxpayer-funded health care for people who come here illegally, and defunding the police. Their argument for Joe Biden boiled down to the fact that they think he's a nice guy. 
Well, let me tell you, raising taxes on 82% of Americans is not nice. Eliminating 10 million good paying oil and gas jobs is not nice. Policies that force jobs to flee our country or allow abortion up until the point of birth are not nice. The truth is, there's only one person who has empathized with everyday Americans and actually been fighting for them over the past four years, and that is President Donald Trump. In the nearly four years I've worked on behalf of President Trump, I've seen up close a man who has a deep love for family, a man who has reverence for the office of the presidency, a man with an incredible respect for law enforcement and our military, I've seen private moments where he comforts Americans in times of pain and sadness. Now everyone knows he can be tough. He's tough when he takes on China, tough when he works to fix our unfair trade deals, tough when he fights to secure our borders. President Trump is always going to be tough when he is fighting for the American people because nice guys like Joe cared more about countries like China and Iran than the United States of America. Tonight begins a new chapter in the great American story, a story that has inspired the world for generations. And when we reelect President Trump this November, the best is yet to come. This election is the most important in our lifetime. Your vote counts more than ever. If you want to check your voting status, secure your ballot, or register to vote, text VOTE to 88022. Earlier today, President Trump and Vice President Pence came to North Carolina to thank our delegates for unanimously renominating them to a second term. Our official roll call and the business of our Republican convention was conducted today in Charlotte. We have created a short video to symbolize the excitement for President Trump across all 50 states and territories. Thank you for watching. God bless you and God bless the United States of America. The great state of Alabama. Alaska. American side boy. Arizona. Arkansas. California. Colorado. Connecticut. Delaware. District of Columbia. Florida. Georgia. Guam. Hawaii. Hawaii. Idaho. Illinois. Indiana. Iowa. Kansas. Kentucky. Louisiana. Maine. Maryland. Massachusetts. Michigan. Minnesota. Mississippi. Missouri. Montana. Nebraska. Nevada. New Hampshire. New Jersey. New Mexico. New York. The North Carolina. North Dakota. The Northern Mariana Islands. Ohio. Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Puerto Rico, Rhode Island, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Tennessee. The United States Virgin Islands, Utah, Vermont, Virginia, Washington, Virginia. Washington. West Virginia, Wisconsin, Wyoming. We're excited to nominate Donald J. Trump and Vice President Mike Pence for four more years. Thank you for all you've done to make America great again. It is our privilege to nominate you for four more years. And we know the best is yet to come. Trump 2020! Four more years. Four more years! 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 I didn't back down from my promises, and I've kept every single one. This current administration had made hope possible. We want this nation to continue to 
be the beacon of hope for the world. How many people said they're going to leave America if Donald Trump was elected? They're all still here and they're not going anywhere because we are in the land of the free. We will never, ever sign bad trade deals. America first again. America first. America's great USMCA trade bill. This is a big win for the United States of America. This is a great trade deal. We are going to lift the restrictions on the production of American energy. We will create millions of more jobs. Hope to me is the belief in a better tomorrow and creating a better future for our children. When I look in the eyes of my grandchildren, I want them to know that their papa was not silent. We will rescue kids from failing schools by helping their parents send them to a safe school of their choice. He saved me, thanks to him. I'm here. To me, he's giving people hope, what he's doing for the poor people, what he's doing for everybody. We are going to appoint justices of the United States Supreme Court who will uphold our laws and our Constitution. By supporting law enforcement is so important for keeping America great. As long as I'm president, I will never defund your police, that I promise you. It's time to deliver a victory for the American people. We are going to start winning again. It's called Promises Made, Promises Kept. Amy Ford. I've been a registered nurse for 17 years. I'm from the small town of Williamson, West Virginia, where I've lived my entire life, the daughter of a nurse and a coal miner. Even though I was the youngest of four children, I was always somewhat of a caretaker. It came natural for me. So it felt right to follow in my mother's footsteps and become a nurse. And this March, when COVID-19 sent our country into crisis, I knew I had to help any way that I could. I deployed to New York in April and then to San Antonio, Texas, working as a COVID relief nurse in both states. As I contended with the challenges of treating our patients who had their worlds turned upside down, I noticed a positive change in our healthcare system. President Trump recognized the threat this virus presented for all Americans early on and made rapid policy changes. And as a result, telehealth services are now accessible to more than 71 million Americans, including 35 million children. Prior to COVID, telehealth was not covered or reimbursed under Medicare, Medicaid, or CHIP. This left our most vulnerable populations with no other choice but to have an in-person office visit with their physicians increasing their risk of exposure to COVID-19 exponentially. The expansion of telehealth services has also resulted in the integration of video visits between patients and their families, allowing loved ones to have contact and visualization, as well as a better understanding of care. Telehealth has been essential during this pandemic. I don't want the media taking my personal story and twisting it, so let me be clear. As a healthcare professional, I can tell you without hesitation, Donald Trump's quick action and leadership saved thousands of lives during COVID-19. And the benefits of that response extend far beyond coronavirus. Telehealth will continue to aid many that are just unable to find transportation or way to the doctor for regular checkups. This is especially true in rural America. I live in a town of about 2,000 people we do not have buses, trains, trolleys, or Ubers available to us. 
In addition, the unavailability of services can also hinder treatment for many. So increased access to telehealth for millions of Americans has truly been life-saving, and we have President Trump to thank. From the very beginning, Democrats, the media, and the World Health Organization got coronavirus wrong. The World Health Organization said, authorities have found no clear evidence of human-to-human -human transmission. Overall, most people should not be terribly concerned about it. Everything is fine here. We do want to say to people, come to Chinatown. Here we are. Come join us. We don't even think it's going to be as bad as it was in other countries. Go about your lives. Go about your business. One leader took decisive action to save lives, President Donald Trump. Banning travel from China and coronavirus epicenters, Biden charged xenophobia. But President Trump was right, signing the CARES Act, providing immediate relief to American families, workers, and businesses, declaring a national emergency, tapping into $42 billion in existing emergency funding, quickly getting crucial personal protective equipment to the states, signing the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, ensuring that American families and businesses impacted by the virus receive the strong support they need, launching Operation Warp Speed to fast track a vaccine in record time. He said everything that I could have hoped for, promise made, promise kept. He is ready, willing, and able to help. He has been responsive. He's done a lot of good things. What the federal government did was a phenomenal accomplishment. In our hour of need, you all literally are helping us in a big way. We were at the edge, and this is life or death stuff, and we're forever thankful for that. Soon, we will emerge safer, stronger, and greater than ever. I am Dr. G.E. Golly, an oral and maxillofacial surgeon and chancellor of a large academic medical and research center in Louisiana. I feel uniquely positioned to share how President Trump's decisive leadership led to a rapid and efficient response to the coronavirus pandemic. I know this as a health professional and as someone who has recovered from COVID himself. The COVID-19 pandemic exploded into our great nation with an intensity unparalleled in history. But our medical investigation and drug development systems were not designed for a pandemic. The devastating effects of the coronavirus demanded immediate changes at the regulatory level. A prompt response led by President Trump cleared away the red tape that usually makes drug approvals a long and drawn out process. By harnessing the resources of the federal government in the private sector, President Trump's Operation Warp Speed is accelerating the testing, supply, development, and distribution of therapeutics, diagnostics, and very shortly, effective vaccines to counter COVID-19. Let me give you three clear examples of how President Trump's leadership removed regulatory barriers so COVID patients could have faster access to effective therapies and diagnostics. First, on February 26, two phase three clinical trials studying remdesivir were initiated. Just two months later, the FDA approved remdesivir for emergency use to treat COVID-19. Normally, this is a three to five year process. The amazing speed with which this happened in a safe but efficient manner is unheard of. Second, the FDA granted expanded access to COVID-19 convalescent plasma. Within 24 hours of this approval, we were administering convalescent plasma and remdesivir to a critically ill patient, a former Army Ranger and physician. Had it not been for the rapid deployment of these medicines, this patient, who is my colleague and friend, would have surely died. And third, at the end of July, I developed a fever and cough. I reached out to our testing team and received one of the Abbott Rapid Tests, yet another tool quickly approved by this administration. 
Within 15 minutes, my test came back positive, and within four hours, I was receiving my remdesivir doses, followed by an infusion of convalescent plasma. As a physician, I've seen firsthand how these breakthroughs have saved countless lives. As a patient, I've benefited from the expedited therapies made possible by the swift action of this administration. President Trump truly moved mountains to save lives and he deserves credit. Thank you, President Trump, for providing timely access to critical diagnostics and therapeutics during this pandemic. Thank you, Mr. President, for your strong leadership in these challenging times. When the China virus invaded our country, we launched the greatest mobilization of American society since World War II. Patriots of every race, color, and creed rallied together to defeat the invisible enemy and save the lives of their fellow citizens. Today, our hearts overflow with appreciation for the incredible frontline workers who risk their own health and safety to keep America strong and safe. When crisis came, millions of everyday Americans rose to the challenge. In their actions, we see true greatness of the American character. We always find a way to victory. History will remember and celebrate the heroes of 2020 for as long as our great American flag waves over the land that we love. To every frontline worker, I offer the salute of a nation that is forever in your debt. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless America. These are my friends. These are the incredible workers that helped us so much with the COVID. Uh, we can call it many different things, from China virus. I don't want to go through all the names because some people may get insulted, but that's the way it is. These are great, great people, doctors, nurses, a firemen, a policemen. We want to thank you all. You have been incredible, and we want to thank you and all of the millions of people that you represent. Thank you all very much. Great job. Thank you. Thank you all very much. So tell me a little about your stories. How about we'll start with you? I'm a postal worker. Delivered to the senior community during COVID-19. Good. And we're taking good care of our postal workers. Absolutely. <laughs> that I can tell you. Believe me, we're not getting rid of our postal workers, you know? They'd like to sort of put that out there. If anyone does, it's the Democrats, not the Republicans. I want to thank you very much and thank everybody in that whole beautiful post office system. We appreciate it. Thank you. How about you? I'm a trucker. Good. I own a small business in Ohio. Great. Uh, Hull and steel mostly. Um, you know, some of our customers actually made hospital beds with uh, some oh, wow. of the material. That's fantastic. Well, congratulations. I love the truckers. You know, they're on my side. Thank you. Mr. I think Bell. all of them, frankly. I think pretty much all of them. How about you? I'm a custodian at the post Good. office as well. What do you do exactly? Clean up everybody's you know, mess and everybody's germs and all that. Can I tell you, I, that, that world, that profession will never be out of business. You yeah, know that, right? Sure. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. For Thank you. Me. And how about you? Um, I'm a registered nurse, President Good. Trump. I uh, work at a New Jersey hospital. It's called Virtual Willingboro Hospital. Right. Um, I also represent an organization of professional nurses. It's called the National Association of Catholic Nurses. Very good. But I want to tell you, sir, as a nursing supervisor, I am so in awe of your leadership. Honestly, uh, I know many people have said often interesting things, but it takes a true leader to be able to ignore all that stuff and do what is right and not be offended by all the words being said. Yeah. And you really do show that positive spirit to us. And as nurses, I appreciate that. But just as an individual, I'm grateful for that. Well, I'm for the nurses. I'm for the doctors. I'm for everybody. We just have to make this China virus go away, and it's happening. Please, go ahead. Uh, I'm also a nurse. I represent Genesis Healthcare, which is a skilled nursing facility Good, sure. company. Um, I want to thank you and your administration for all the supplies and support and right. funding that you've given the skilled nursing units. Um, without that, we couldn't do as well as we have done. Um, I spent some time in New Jersey. I live in West Virginia. Went to New Jersey and, and did some work there. And we finally started to see things change and turn around. I appreciate what you said because we have delivered billions of dollars of equipment that governors were supposed to give and in many cases they didn't get. So the federal government had to help them and all of the people that did this incredible work, they never got credit for it. But you understand where it came from. Thank you very much. Thank you both. It's really nice. Please, go ahead. 
I'm a police officer in Inglewood, Colorado, and I contracted COVID in late March and recovered. That means we don't have to be afraid of you at all. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I'm good to Once go. you're recovered, you know, we have the whole thing with plasma happening. Mm -hmm. That means your blood is very valuable. You know that, right? <laughs> Thank you very much. Great. Please. I'm a detention deputy at the Kern County Sheriff's Department out in California. Great. And uh, I also contracted COVID um, into March and recovered from that also. How long was your problem? Um, I was sick about 10 days, really bad. I got everything besides a cough, um, but recovered. I was off work for a month and a half, and I work in our local county jails. Did they do anything specifically to help you recover? They gave me Z-Packs, medication, cough syrup. Okay, and I won't even ask you about the hydroxychloroquine <laughs> because it's, uh, it's a shame what they've done to that one, but, but I took it. I took the Z-Pack also and zinc. I want to thank you all very much. It's an honor to have you in the White House. You're fantastic people, and the people you represent, you represent an incredible group of people, and uh, we love you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good evening. I'm Congressman Jim Jordan, representing the 4th District of Ohio. The Republican Party is the pro-America party. President Trump is the pro-America candidate. This election is about who can preserve the values, principles, and institutions that make America great. Don't believe me? Look at what's happening in American cities. Cities all run by Democrats. Crime, violence, and mob rule. Democrats refuse to denounce the mob, and their response to the chaos? Defund the police, defund Border Patrol, and defund our military. And while they're doing all this, they're also trying to take away your guns. Look at the positions they've taken in the past few months. Democrats won't let you go to church, but they'll let you protest. Democrats won't let you go to work, but they'll let you riot. And Democrats won't let you go to school, but they'll let you go loot. President Trump has fought against each of their crazy ideas. He's taken on the swamp, all of the swamp, the Democrats, the press, and the never Trumpers. And when you take on the swamp, the swamp fights back. They tried the Russia hoax, the Mueller investigation, and the fake impeachment. But in spite of this unbelievable opposition, this president has done what he said he would do. Taxes cut, regulations reduced, economy growing, lowest unemployment in 50 years, out of the Iran deal, embassy in Jerusalem, hostages home from North Korea, a new U.S. MCA agreement, and of course he's building the wall and rebuilding our economy as we speak. I love the president's intensity and his willingness to fight every day in Washington for our families. But what I also appreciate about the president is something most Americans never get to see, how much he truly cares about people. Our family has seen it. Two years ago, our nephew Eli was killed in a car accident. He lived a mile up the road from us, grew up wrestling and training with our boys, was a high school state champion, varsity athlete for the University of Wisconsin. It was a Saturday morning, three days after the accident. I walked to the car to head up to Eli's parents' home when the president called. We talked about a few issues, and then he asked how the family was doing. I said, they're doing okay, Mr. President, but it's tough. The president said, yeah, losing a loved one is always difficult, and it's really tough when they're so young. I then said, Mr. President, I'm actually walking into their house right now. Obviously, they don't know that I'm talking to you, but if you'd be willing to say hello to Eli's dad, you'd make a terrible day a little less terrible. What's his name, the president asked. I walked through the door and said, Todd, the president wants to talk to you. For the next five minutes, family and friends sat in complete silence as the president of the United States took time to talk to a dad who was hurting. That's the president I've gotten to know the last four years. The president who shared private moments like this with soldiers, victims of violent crime, and people who've had businesses destroyed by the mob. That's the individual who's made America great again and who knows America's best days are still in front of us. And that's why I'm busting my tail to help him get reelected. I'm asking you to do the same. Thank you, and God bless our country. I'm not an actor, a singer, or a politician. I'm Herschel Walker. Most of you know me as a football player, but I'm also a father, a man of faith, and a very good judge of character. I've known Donald Trump for 37 years, and I don't mean just casual ran into him from time to time. I'm talking about a deep personal friendship. I watched him as an owner of a professional football team. Right after he bought the team, he set out to learn. He learned about the history of the team, the players, the coaches, every detail. Then he used what he learned to make the team better. 
I watched him in the boardroom. He can be in the middle of a big meeting, but if one of the kids was on the phone, he dropped everything to take the call. He taught me that the family should be your top priority. I watched him treat janitors, security guards, and waiters the same way he would treat a VIP. He made them feel special because he knew they were. He understands that they are the people who make this country run. They clean, they cook, they build, they drive, they deliver. He told me, Herschel, make an effort to get to know people. Remember their names. That stuck with me. One time, I planned to take his kids to Disney World with my family. At the last minute, Donald said he'd like to join us. So there he was, in a business suit, on uh, It's a Small World Ride. That was something to see. It just shows you what a caring, loving father he is. It hurt my soul to hear the terrible names that people call Donald. The worst one is racist. I take it as a personal insult that people would think I've had a 37-year friendship with the racist. People who think that don't know what they're talking about. Growing up in the Deep South, I've seen racism up close. I know what it is, and it isn't Donald Trump. Just because someone loves and respects the flag, our national anthem, and our country, doesn't mean they don't care about social justice. I care about all those things. So does Donald Trump. He shows how much he cares about social justice in the black community through his actions. And his actions speak louder than stickers or slogans on a jersey. He keeps right on fighting to improve the lives of black Americans and all Americans. He worked night and day. He never stops. He leaves nothing on the field. Some people don't like his style, the way he knocks down obstacles that get in the way of his goals. People on the opposing team didn't like when I ran over them either. But that's how you get the job done. I pray every night that God gives him more time. Give him four more years. He has accomplished so much almost all by himself on a constant attack. But there's still more work to be done. If you love America and want to make it better, Donald Trump is your president. He's my president. And I'm blessed to call him friend. Good evening. I'm Natalie Harp a formerly forgotten American from California. In the classic Jimmy Stewart film, It's a Wonderful Life, George Bailey is given a great gift, the chance to see what the world would be like without him. Tonight, Mr. President, we'd like to give you that same gift because without you, we'd all be living in Pottersville, sold out to a crooked Mr., or I should say, a crooked Mrs. Potter, with no hope of escape except death itself. I should know because I wouldn't be alive today if it wasn't for you. About five years ago, I was the victim of a notoriously deadly medical error. I survived, but only to be diagnosed with a rare and terminal bone cancer. You know, the Democrats love to talk about healthcare being a human right, but a right to what? Well, I'll tell you. To them, it's a right to marijuana, opioids, and the right to die with dignity a politically correct way of saying assisted suicide. I was told I was a burden to my family and to my country, and that by choosing to die early, I'd actually be saving the lives of others by preserving resources for them rather than wasting them on a lost cause like myself. And when I failed the chemotherapies that were on the market, no one wanted me in their clinical trials. I'd make them look bad. They didn't give me the right to try experimental treatments, Mr. President, you did. And without you, I'd have died waiting for them to be approved. Now with the coronavirus, everyone knows what that feels like to be waiting for a cure. But we've only been waiting a few months. Just imagine what 2020 would have looked like fighting for your life without Donald Trump fighting for it too. In January, there would have been no China travel ban. Millions would have died. Millions more would have been infected for there be no record levels of testing no right to try treatments, no fast track for a vaccine, nor Operation Warp Speed ready to deliver it. And without Donald Trump as our patient advocate for the past four years, well, the opioid epidemic would have stolen even more lives from even more families. Kidney patients would have no future except dying on wait lists for there be no initiative to increase donations. There'd still be no accountability at the VA and our brave veterans would still be suffering long wait times with no choice nor access to faster care. 
insulin and other drug prices would have continued to rise, while a record number of generic drugs would still be stuck in the pipeline. There'd be no price transparency. We wouldn't have health plans up to 60% cheaper than Obamacare, and we'd still be stuck with that infamous individual mandate. And God forbid what the next four years would look like. For in Joe Biden's America, China would control our drug production. We'd be one step closer to government-run health care. We wouldn't just be unable to keep our doctors. We'd be lucky if we could see any doctor. And even then, some of us would be denied care. For in socialized medicine, you don't beat the odds, you become the odds. And I would lose my right to try, just like Charlie Gard, that terminally ill British baby whose government-run healthcare system decided it was too expensive and too cruel to keep him alive. You see, Mr. President, you've done so much more than your promises made and promises kept. For numbers, only tell part of the story. We are the rest of it. Facts with faces of Americans who would still be forgotten if you and our favorite First Lady hadn't given up your own wonderful life so we could have the chance at one. George Bailey's father was right. All you can take with you is that which you've given away. And Mr. President, that makes you the richest man in the world, for you have used your strength to make America strong again. Sacrifice the life you built to make America proud again. And you risked everything to make America safe again. It's a wonderful life. You made America great again. And on November 3rd, we are going to keep America great. America. My name is Vernon Jones, and I'm a state representative from the great state of Georgia. As you can see, I'm a man of color, and I'm a lifelong Democrat, too. You may be wondering, why is a lifelong Democrat speaking at the Republican National Convention? And that's a fair question. And here's your answer. The Democratic Party does not want black people to leave their mental plantation. We've been forced to be there for decades and generations. But I have news for Joe Biden. We are free. We are free people with free minds. And I'm part of a large and growing segment of the black community who are independent thinkers, and we believe that Donald Trump is the president that America needs to lead us forward. This is no time for sleeping in the basement. Joe Biden has had 47 years to produce results, but he's been all talk and no action, just like so many of the Democrats who've been making promises to the black voters for decades. We've been their captive audience. When President Trump sought to earn the black vote, the Democratic Party leaders went crazy. Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer literally started wearing kente cloths around the, the, the U.S. Capitol, as if pandering were enough to keep us satisfied. Let me tell you why I'm supporting our president. I grew up in the South, in Laurel Hill, North Carolina, Scotland County, the Green Pond community to be exact. My parents, Robin and Rufa Jones, built with their own hands a four-room cinder block home with no indoor plumbing. They had very limited education, but they instilled in us a strong work ethic that drove me from those tobacco fields of North Carolina to those hallowed halls of the Georgia General Assembly. My parents taught me if I believed in God, worked hard and treated every person fairly, there was no limit to what we could achieve. I attended North Carolina Central University, an historical black college. For generations, HBCUs have been the incubators that develop black scholars in math and science and religion, engineering and politics. They have been important springboards for the black success. 
but Democrats haven't treated them that way. When President Trump took office, he changed everything. He delivered historic funding to HBCUs, and he guaranteed it for 10 years, something that has never happened in the history of this country. That gave our HBCUs stability, the chance to grow, and produce the next generation of black leaders. That's right, Donald Trump did that. He's also supported school choice to ensure that no child, no matter their race or zip code, is left behind. Every child should have access to a quality education. But education is just the beginning. The president also built the most inclusive economy ever with record low unemployment for African Americans and record high participation in the workforce. He put opportunity zones in the Trump tax bill that would drive investment into our communities for decades to come. He put the interests of American workers, and especially black workers, first. That's right, Donald Trump did that. He delivered historic criminal justice reform. He ended once and for all the policy of inc incarceration of black people, which has decimated our communities, caused by no other than Joe Biden. Democrats wouldn't do it, Obama didn't want to do it, and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris definitely wouldn't do it. But Donald Trump did it. He's also working every day to make our community safer. As a former executive of DeKalb County, Georgia, I directed one of the largest public safety departments in the Southeast. I've seen tragic shootings on both sides, officers killing citizens and citizens killing officers in the line of duty. Police officers are our fellow citizens. They live in our country. They have families, too. They live in our communities. Unfortunately, Democrats have turned their backs on our brave police officers. They call it defunding. And it's a danger to our cities, our neighborhoods, and our children. Isn't it ironic that Democrat politicians have personal security to protect them? So why don't they forego their security and replace them with social workers, especially since that's what they want for you and me? Our police need more funding, not less, for frequent psychological examinations, for non-lethal remote restraint technology, and for more de-escalation and use of force training. These are the common sense solutions that President Trump supports. True, sincere police reform. That's right, Donald Trump did that too. Education, jobs, safety, security. On issue after issue, and in just a single term, he destroyed these negative forces that have victimized the black community for decades. He gave us the opportunity to rise. Now, you know, when I made the public announcement of my support for President Trump, all hell broke loose. I was threatened, called an embarrassment, and asked to resign by my own party. Unfortunately, that's consistent with the Democratic Party and how they view independent thinking black men and women. But I'm here to tell you that black voices are becoming more woke and louder than ever. The Democratic Party has become infected with a pandemic of intolerance, bigotry, socialism, anti-law enforcement bias, and a dangerous tolerance for people who attack others, destroy their property, and terrorize our own communities. That's what this election is all about. And that's why right now, more than ever, more than ever before, America needs Donald Trump in the Oval Office for another four years. God bless you and vote Donald J. Trump. Thank you.
In 2018, a gunman walked into Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, and changed my life forever. My name is Andrew Pollock. His name isn't worth saying. One of the seniors walking in the hallways that day was my beautiful daughter, Meadow. She was just months away from graduating and beginning a new life. We were so proud of the woman she had become. But in the hallway on that third floor, the gunman saw Meadow and shot her down the hallway, hitting her four times. After she was shot and on the floor, she crawled over to another student, a freshman girl, to protect her. She draped her body over her, and then the scumbag gunman shot my daughter at point-blank range five more times, killing Meadow and the girl she was shielding. She had a whole life ahead of her, and in that life, she could have done anything and been anything. So many moments that I waited so long for were taken from me. I didn't get to drop her off at college. I didn't get to walk her down the aisle. But every moment was taken from her, and for what? I never wanted this to become a political spectacle, but it did. I never wanted to meet the president like this, but I did. I was invited to the White House. The truth is, I had just buried my daughter that week. I really wasn't interested in public events like a tour or a photo op. I was interested in answers and solutions. So if the president wanted to meet me personally, I said I'd go. They said, of course, that was his plan. At the White House, my family and I sat with the president in the Oval Office and told him about Meadow. I told him what we knew. I told him that his administration needed to take a closer look at what went wrong and why. And I got to see who President Trump really is. He's a good man and a great listener, and he cuts through the BS. Then the president did what he said he would do. He took action. He formed a school safety commission that issued dozens of recommendations to make schools safer. But I'll bet you never heard about that. Instead, the media turned my daughter's murder into a coordinated attack on President Trump, Republicans, and our Second Amendment. In fact, when President Trump asked me and other parents of children that were murdered in school shootings to join him as he announced the commission's findings, the media's first question wasn't about protecting kids. Shockingly, they asked about the government shutdown. President Trump turned to me appalled and said, Andy, can you believe these people? We're trying to talk about school safety, and this is what they do. But I could believe it. After my daughter's murder, the media didn't seem interested in the facts. So I found them myself. I learned that gun control laws didn't fail my daughter. People did. The gunman had threatened to kill his classmates before. He had threatened to rape them. He had threatened to shoot up the school. Every red flag you could imagine. But the school didn't just miss these red flags. They knowingly ignored them. Far-left Democrats in our school district made this shooting possible because they implemented something they called restorative justice. This policy, which really just blames teachers for students' failures, puts kids and teachers at risk and makes shootings more likely but it was billed as a pioneering approach to discipline and safety. I was just fine with the old approach to discipline and safety. It was called discipline and safety. But the Obama-Biden administration took Parkland's bad policies and forced them into schools across America. When President Trump rescinded Obama's guidance on restorative justice policies, he put an end to that. And that meant the world to me. It's hard to tell how much Mr. Biden understands about what happened at Parkland. Mr. Biden has campaigned on bringing back restorative justice as part, of, as part of his unity platform with Bernie Sanders and has pledged to implement in school districts across America. But he doesn't even seem to know when the shooting happened. He said that he was vice president when it happened, but he wasn't. Mr. Biden may not know when my daughter was murdered, but I do. February 14, 2018. Mr. Biden may not know that these policies make shootings more likely, but I do. Mr. Biden may not know who was vice president that day, but I do. 
It wasn't Joe Biden. It was Mike Pence. Thank God. And I know who the president was, too. It wasn't Barack Obama. It was President Donald J. Trump, and he took action. I truly believe the safety of our kids depends on whether this man is reelected. I hope you'll join me in helping to make that happen. Mr. President, myself and millions of Americans appreciate you and love you. God bless America and God bless our president, Donald J. Trump. Thank you. A curfew now in effect for the city of St. Louis. Protests in St. Louis turned violent. Mark McClowski says he and his family have been threatened with violence. Under Missouri law, you have a right to defend your home and the lives of your family. A search warrant has been executed at the home of Mark and Patricia McCleskey. The husband and wife attorneys charged with pointing guns at protesters. They were simply trying to protect their home. Good evening, America. We are Mark and Patty McCloskey. We're speaking to you tonight from St. Louis, Missouri, where just weeks ago you may have seen us defending our home as a mob of protesters descended on our neighborhood. America is such a great country that not only do you have the right to own a gun and use it to defend yourself, but thousands of Americans will offer you free advice on how to use it. At least that's what we experienced. What you saw happen to us could just as easily happen to any of you who are watching from quiet neighborhoods around our country. And that's what we want to speak to you about tonight. That's exactly right. Whether it's the defunding of police, ending cash bail so criminals can be released back out on the streets the same day to riot again, or encouraging anarchy and chaos on our streets, it seems as if the Democrats no longer view the government's job as protecting honest citizens from criminals, but rather protecting criminals from honest citizens. Not a single person in the out of control mob you saw at our house was charged with a crime. But you know who was? We were. They've actually charged us with felonies for daring to defend our home. On top of that, consider this. The Marxist liberal activist leading the mob to our neighborhood stood outside our home with a bullhorn screaming, you can't stop the revolution. Just weeks later, that same Marxist activist won the Democrat nomination to hold a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives. In the city of St. Louis, that's the same as winning the general election. That Marxist revolutionary is now going to be the congresswoman from the first district of Missouri. These radicals are not content with marching in the streets. They want to walk the halls of Congress. They want to take over. They want power. This is Joe Biden's party. These are the people who will be in charge of your future and the future of your children. They're not satisfied with spreading the chaos and violence into our communities. They want to abolish the suburbs altogether by ending single family home zoning. This forced rezoning would bring crime, lawlessness, and low quality apartments into now thriving suburban neighborhoods. President Trump smartly ended this government overreach, but Joe Biden wants to bring it back. These are the policies that are coming to a neighborhood near you. So make no mistake, no matter where you live, your family will not be safe in the radical Democrats America. At this moment in history, if you stand up for yourself and for the values our country was founded on, the mob, spurred on by their allies in the media, will try to destroy you. You've seen us on your TV screens and Twitter feeds. You know that we're not the kind of people who back down. Thankfully, neither is Donald Trump. President Trump will defend the God-given right of every American to protect their homes and their families. But more than that, Trump's vision for America is a country where you have an opportunity to work hard and build the life you dream of with a job you love, with your children being educated in great schools, in a community where your family can play in the backyard without fear, worship in a church without shame, and express your beliefs without retribution. Trump brought us the greatest economy our country had ever seen. 
the Democrats have brought us nothing but destruction. When we don't have basic safety and security in our communities, we'll never be free to build a brighter future for ourselves, for our children, or for our country. That's what's at stake in this election, and that's why we must reelect Donald Trump. God bless you, God bless the president, and, and God, God bless, bless the United, United States. States. Good evening, America. I'm Kimberly Guilfoyle. I speak to you tonight as a mother, a former prosecutor, a Latina, and a proud American. And yes, a proud supporter of President Donald J. Trump. Why? Because he is the president who delivers for America. He built the greatest economy the world has ever known for the strivers, the working class and middle class. As commander in chief, he always puts America first. President Trump is the law and order president. Now presidential leadership is not guaranteed. It is a choice. Biden, Harris, and the rest of the socialists will fundamentally change this nation. They want open borders, closed schools, dangerous amnesty, and will selfishly send your jobs back to China while they get rich. They will defund, dismantle, and destroy America's law enforcement. When you are in trouble and need police, don't count on the Democrats. As a first-generation American, I know how dangerous their socialist agenda is. My mother, Mercedes, was a special education teacher from Aguadilla, Puerto Rico. My father, also an immigrant, came to this nation in pursuit of the American dream. Now I consider it my duty to fight to protect that dream. Rioters must not be allowed to destroy our cities. Human sex drug traffickers should not be allowed to cross our border. The same socialist policies which destroyed places like Cuba and Venezuela must not take root in our cities and our schools. If you want to see the socialist Biden-Harris future for our country, just take a look at California. It is a place of immense wealth immeasurable innovation, an immaculate environment. And the Democrats turned it into a land of discarded heroin needles in parks, riots in streets, and blackouts in homes. In President Trump's America, we light things up. We don't dim them down. We build things up. We don't burn them down. We kneel in prayer. And we stand for our flag. This election is a battle for the soul of America. Your choice is clear. Do you support the cancel culture, the cosmopolitan elites of Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and Joe Biden, who blame America first? Do you think America is to blame? Or do you believe in American greatness? Believe in yourself, in President Trump, in individual and personal responsibility. They want to destroy this country and everything that we have fought for and hold dear. They want to steal your liberty, your freedom. They want to control what you see and think and believe so that they can control how you live. They want to enslave you to the weak, dependent, liberal, victim ideology to the point that you will not recognize this country or yourself. From the beginning, when President Trump spoke about making America great again, he was speaking about that shining city on a hill and restoring the beacon of light that once shined so bright. His promise was to put America first, and he has. When President Trump cut middle-class taxes, putting tens of thousands of dollars back in the pockets of working-class Americans, that beacon began to flicker once again. When President Trump commanded the defeat of ISIS, took out al-Baghdadi and Soleimani, and paved the way for peace in the Middle East, that beacon started to glow.
when he negotiated historic trade deals with Canada, Mexico, Japan, and China, bringing back thousands of manufacturing jobs to America, that beacon shined bright once again for the world to see. America, it's all on the line. President Trump believes in you. He emancipates and lifts you up to live your American dream. You are capable, you are qualified, you are powerful, and you have the ability to choose your life and determine your destiny. Don't let the Democrats take you for granted. Don't let them step on you. Don't let them destroy your families, your lives, and your future. Don't let them kill future generations because they told you and brainwashed you and fed you lies that you weren't good enough. Like my parents, you can achieve your American dream. You can be that shining example to the world. Manifest and be the change in this country that you dream, that you hope, that you believe in. Stand for an American president who is fearless, who believes in you, and who loves this country and will fight for her. President Trump is the leader who will rebuild the promise of America and ensure that every citizen can realize their American dream. Ladies and gentlemen, leaders and fighters for freedom and liberty and the American dream, the best is yet to come. I'm Congressman Steve Scalise. We're facing some tough challenges in America. This isn't the first time we've been here. I've worked closely with Donald Trump over the last few years, and if there's one constant theme to how he approaches problems, it's how much he cares about the hardworking people that Washington left behind. I've seen this firsthand. After I was shot on a baseball field by a leftist gunman, first responders rushed me to a hospital where I battled for my life. That same night, Donald Trump came to the hospital along with First Lady Melania Trump. They consoled my wife, Jennifer. They were there for my family in my darkest hours. Donald Trump would call to check on me throughout the following weeks just to see how I was doing. That's the kind of person he is. That's the side of Donald Trump that the media will never show you. Look, there's a lot at stake. This is an election between a party that wants to burn down the foundations of our country to the ground and a party that wants to rebuild and protect our great nation. The left wants to defund the police. This is personal to me. I wouldn't be here without the bravery and heroism of the men and women in law enforcement who saved my life. President Trump stands with those brave men and women. Joe Biden has embraced the left's insane mission to defund them. There won't be an America to leave to our children and grandchildren without those brave law enforcement officers and first responders. Joe Biden's made a career in Washington for 47 years, promising things he's never delivered. In just three short years, President Trump has delivered huge wins for American families. While Joe Biden made hollow promises when he chaired the Senate Judiciary Committee, Donald Trump took action and delivered criminal justice reform. Joe Biden claims to care about the working man, but millions of good manufacturing jobs were shipped overseas during the Obama-Biden years to countries like China, Donald Trump brought those jobs back. I've seen how deeply President Trump cares about rebuilding our evaporating middle class. President Trump pledged to give the forgotten men and women of America a real shot at the American dream. And again, he delivered. The lowest unemployment rate in over 50 years, women creating small businesses at record pace, wages rising, the fastest, by the way, for lowest income levels. What can Joe Biden say to that? What has Joe Biden done in his 47 years in Washington that can compare to that? President Trump has delivered for the hardworking people of this great nation. It's going to take that kind of bold leadership to get us out of this COVID crisis. After President Trump saved lives by shutting down flights from China and Europe, he's now focusing the full weight of the government on a revolutionary plan to cure this virus by cutting red tape and empowering scientists to create a vaccine. 
This is visionary leadership in action at a time when we can't afford another 47 years of hollow promises. America's been through tough times before. Who better to lead us out of these times than the president who already built the strongest economy our country has ever seen? Donald Trump did it before. Donald Trump will deliver for us again. God bless you and God bless these United States of America. I'm Sean Parnell, and it is an honor to be here. In 2006, the Army sent me to Afghanistan as a young platoon leader placed in command of Americans from every corner of our planet. All right. Uh, we are watching, of course, the Republican National Convention the very first night. And we want to uh, dip in for some analysis here just for uh, a few moments. Let's turn to our Caitlin Huey Burns, CBSN political reporter who's been watching along with us. And Caitlin, I want to ask you, first of all, about what we saw just a few moments ago from Andrew Pollack, uh, the father of the Parkland victim uh, named Meadow. Uh, he was very forceful in talking about how President Trump has been a leader, he feels, uh, that has been there for him and for the other families. I'm wondering what else you heard in Andrew Pollack's remarks tonight. That's right. And this comes a week after we saw the Democrats make the issue of, uh, of, of gun safety uh, a big part of their um, platform as well. So it does raise the question, though, about what the president has done on these issues of gun safety, uh, having promised many times to uh, do something about these shootings and never has, ne never has pushed for legislation and never has brought it uh, home. Uh, so that's one component. But it's really interesting to listen to kind of the first half of what we heard tonight from kind of everyday Americans and some, some other compelling characters, uh, figures, and then uh, hearing what we just heard from people like Kimberly Guilfoyle and some others who are really driving home at what the message is coming from Republicans, which is that Democrats trying to paint them with a broad brush, they're all socialists, they're going to take away everything that you know and work for. That's really the message here um, coming from Republicans. And we kind of saw Democrats try to um, prepare for that last week by um, featuring former Republicans in their in primetime speaking slots, um, not giving a lot of time to people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. They kind of knew these attacks were coming and tried to kind of pre-butt them. And so that's kind of what we're seeing tonight, especially in that speech from uh, Guilfoyle. Uh, and, and it also comes against the backdrop of, of what this administration is dealing with. You know, I, I was thinking back to 2016, the convention that uh, Trump had. He gave a very pessimistic view of the country then and where things were going, um, that's kind of flipped now because he's in charge and is responsible for how things are going. So as much as they want to uh, denigrate California and disparage these cities where we've seen big protests in the wake of uh, racial injustice, um, it kind of, these, the speakers kind of seem to be leaving out that, that Trump is president uh, during this time. Um, and so this is, I think, what we're, we kind of heard from the president earlier today when he was in North Carolina, um, the things that he wants to talk about. While Republicans say that they want to focus on the economy, and Trump still leads Biden on the economy, even after everything. Uh, he still um, has solid numbers on the economy. Um, people seem to be giving him um, the benefit of the doubt that the economy was good before uh, the pandemic hit, although the pandemic has shown how uh, the economy does not work for everybody, clearly. Um, but because because of everything that's going on, it seems like they're trying to uh, put this all on Democrats and the opposition. So you're hearing a lot of Joe Biden's name brought up tonight. Um, Caitlin, I also want to ask you about a couple of speakers that we saw earlier, Mark and Patty McCloskey as well, uh, addressing uh, this convention, talking about this was the couple in St. Louis uh, that uh, waved guns at, at demonstrators. And we heard them talk about uh, the situation from their perspective. And um, they also talked about the suburbs themselves. This is something we saw President Trump 
tweet about, and we've seen him continue to tweet about. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that notion of the suburbs in the president's view, in the view of the McCloskeys, being quote unquote sort of vulnerable uh, to various elements. Can you give us a little bit of context for what we saw and heard tonight? Sure. Well, earlier today, we were talking about what the president might say or do, what the RNC had planned to do to address um, the racial injustice that we've seen in this country, especially in the wake of, of protests that we've seen around the country. And so it's very telling that they chose these two speakers um, who uh, to, to have this primetime position, really. I think that speaks to what um, the, the president has been saying, which has been um, the Democrats are trying to come in and uh, kind of ruin everything that you know about the suburbs. Um, he's made very racist attacks, uh, used racist rhetoric, and you saw that reflected uh, here today. And kind of the context for that is that uh, we see that Donald Trump is, is losing uh, sub suburban voters, especially suburban women, uh, to Joe Biden in polls. And we saw that in 2018, that Republican voters in the suburbs flipped from Republican to Democrat in those 2018 midterms, largely because, they said in exit polling, it was um, they, they didn't like Trump's behavior and his rhetoric. Uh, and so you're kind of seeing a continuation of that and something that is certainly boosting uh, Joe Biden at this point. We saw a lot of uh, Democrats win in Republican-held seats in House races in 2018. It helped Those kinds of areas helped to um, win Democrats the majority in the House. Uh, and so the president kind of knows that this is um, where his vulnerable spots are. Um, but using this kind of language and this kind of rhetoric and using the, this couple as an example, um, I think really contradicts a lot of what we've been hearing from some of these voters. Um, we've talked before about how we've seen Black Lives Matter protests in some of these very suburbs, in suburbs that you wouldn't traditionally think uh, would would have and be supportive of something like this. So um, the, the, the suburbs are changing. The president knows that. But the way in which he is trying to target these voters, to me, seems more of a way to um, uh, speak to his base of support than actually try to convert some of these voters. All right, Caitlin Huey Burns for us. Caitlin, thank you. Let's return you now to the convention. I was so afraid. I believed I would die here. American hostages, forgotten and wasting away in far off prisons, wrongfully detained by foreign governments. Americans were beaten, abused, starved, and left for dead until President Donald Trump stepped in. The free American hostages are finally back on U.S. soil after being held captive in North Korea. We're following some breaking news in Turkey where an American pastor, Andrew Brunson, has been released. An American jailed in Egypt is back in the U.S. this morning after an intervention by the Trump administration. A tough and skilled negotiator, President Trump successfully won the release of detainees and prisoners, among the most of any president in American history. While families waited in despair for news of their loved ones. President Trump provided a new spark of hope by bringing our hostages home. We have Danny Birch back home where he should be. He was in Yemen in a very horrible situation. Yesterday, the United States government secured the release of Caitlin Coleman, Joshua Boyle, and their three children. Today, we are bringing home another American citizen. We just had news that Turkey released a prisoner that we were trying to get to the United States. Under this administration, America has not and will not turn its back on our people. President Trump will bring them Diplomacy, negotiation skills, perseverance, faith, the ingredients of hope when there is no hope. No American should ever be left behind. Priority, freeing American hostages. We have six incredible people who were held hostage by various countries 
And I'm very pleased to let everybody know that we brought back over 50 hostages from 22 different countries. We worked very hard on it, Ambassador O'Brien and others. And I will tell you, we, uh, we're very proud of the job we did. But I'd like to ask maybe uh, Pastor Brunson to say a few words so we can go through and just give us a little history of what happened and how is life treating you. I was held in Turkey uh, for two years. And uh, you took unprecedented steps, actually, to secure my release. And your administration really fought for me. And I, don't, I think if you hadn't done that, I may still be in Turkey. Good. So I'm very for grateful. 28 for years, right? They had you there we're, for, we're, they had you scheduled for a long time, Andrew. Yes. We had to get you back. And I, I have to say that, to me, President Erdogan was very good. And I know they had you scheduled for a long time, and you were a very innocent person. And uh, he ultimately, after we had a few conversations, he agreed. So we appreciate that, and we appreciate the people of Turkey. And you still appreciate the people of Turkey, I understand, right? We love the Turkish people. We still That's great. Us. It's great to have you back, Andrew. Thank you. Please. Mr. President, thank you for having me. Thank My you. name is Sam Goodwin. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. I was held in Syria for 63 days. And uh, I'm, I think I speak for my fellow former hostages and detainees here when I say I'm as grateful as I've ever been for anything to be home safely. And uh, thank you for the invitation and opportunity to be here. Uh, particularly, Ambassador O'Brien was incredibly supportive and helpful to my family. And I uh, can't say enough nice things about him. Thank you for promoting him. Good. And uh, just really happy to be here, so thank you. We got you back. You got me back, yeah. We got you all back. And we have some more that we're working on right now to get back that we better do. Please, go ahead. My name is Michael White, Mr. President. I do, once again, it's an honor to be here, honor to meet you in person. Basically, what had happened with me is I went traveled over to the country of Iran. It turned out it was a major, major trap, and I was uh, apprehended there. I went through a lot in their injustice system, in the Iranian justice system. Iran is an oppressive, extortionist, terrorist regime. You know what I'm talking about. Um, but what you did, sir, is you were able to get me out of that prison in record time. It was amazing. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Really appreciate it. All mine. Please. Yeah, my name is Josh Holt. This is my wife, Tammy. Yes. Uh, we were held hostage in Venezuela for two years. I know very well. <laughs> um, and you, you helped us get out. Uh, and Senator Hatch worked with you very well on that as well. Um, and it was a, a great honor to be able to meet you right when we got back. And I remember a lot of people asked me, what was it like meeting President Trump? And I just said, I was, I was blown away. I'd just gotten released after two years. Then I'm shaking the hand of the president in the Oval Office. So I don't really remember a whole lot of it. So it's nice to meet you again. And uh, it's been great. It's been great to be back, helping people through situations that they've gone through. and. Now we have to start our family. Well, the great people of Utah really wanted me to do something about the two of you, and we were able to do it. And a little bit of a miracle, I think, frankly. It was. Because it was a very hostile period. And uh, we appreciate everybody working so hard with us, but we were able to get you both back. And are you living in Utah now, I yeah, hope? We're still living in Utah. That's good. We'll say hello to the folks in Utah, because they're great people. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Please. I'm Brian there. Spent an unexpected trip there in India. I was not going to India. I was going through India to Nepal, where yeah. I've been working for the last 18 years. But on behalf of my family and myself, thank you, uh, President Trump, for getting us out and getting us home. The darkest moment of our whole time together, uh, your letter to my wife came. And it really gave her the hope and the peace. And That's great. From that time forward, as more people got involved, especially the ambassador there, in uh, India, things became more peaceful, and, and the hope uh, was there for the last four months that we really wouldn't get to come home because they had planned on keeping me for uh, three to five years. The, the original charge thing was three to five years, right. and, and that was cleared, and then they came up with new charges to do a seven-year uh, term. Well, India pre responded very well to my request, Good. so we appreciate that. And we I appreciate, appreciate everything y'all did. Thank you all for being with us. We have a few more people we want to get back, and we will get them back, and they'll be back very soon. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Great stories. Hello. My name is Maximo Alvarez. I live in Miami, Florida, not far from the state of Florida, which is in just a 90-mile white blue strip on a map for me. It divides freedom from fear. It divides the past from the present, from the future. I know all about the past. I'll never forget my own. My family 
has fled totalitarianism and communism more than once. First my dad from Spain, then from Cuba. But my families don't run away. By the grace of God, I live the American dream. The greatest blessing I ever had, my dad only had a sixth grade education, told me, don't lose this place. You'll never be as long as me. I'm speaking to you today because my family is done abandoning what we rightfully earned. There's no place to hide. I'm speaking to you today because President Trump may not always be politically correct. He's in fact a successful businessman, you know, your average career politician. Our president is just another family man, a friend, a most important our elected commander-in-chief who puts America first. Keep in mind the other guy running for president is mostly concerned about power. Yes, yes, power for them, but not for the benefit of all Americans. I'm speaking to you today because I have seen people like this before. I've seen movements like this before. I've seen ideas like this before. And I am here to tell you, we cannot let them take over our country. I heard the promises of Fidel Castro, and I can never forget all those who grew up around me, who look like me, who suffered and starved and died because they believed those empty promises. They swallowed the communist poison pill. If you have a chance, Go to the Freedom Tower in Miami. Stop and listen. You can still hear the sounds of those broken promises. It is the sound of waves in the ocean carrying families clinging to pieces of wood. Families with children who can swim, but willing to risk everything to reach this blessed land. It is the sound of tears hitting the paper of an application to become an American citizen. Most heard and liked the promises, but soon after, they experienced the reality. Look at them, listen to them, learn the truth. Those false promises spread the wealth, free education, Free health care, defund the police, trust the socialist state more than your family and your community. They don't sound radical to my ears. They sound familiar. And Fidel Castro was asked if he was a communist. He said he was a Roman Catholic. He knew he had to hide the truth. But the country I was born in is gone, totally destroyed. When I watch the news in Seattle, Chicago, Portland, and other cities, when I see the history being rewritten, when I hear the promises, I've heard echoes, I've heard echoes of the former life I never wanted to hear again. I see shadows I thought I had outrun. My parents only wanted one person to decide my fate, me. Not some party member, not some government official, not some bureaucrat. In America, I would decide my own future. I am so grateful to America, the place where I was able to build my American dream through hard work and determination. President Trump knows that the American story was written by people just like you and I, who love our country and take risks to build a future for our families and neighbors. I may be a Cuban born, but I am 100% American. This is the greatest country in the world. And I said this before. 
if I gave away everything that I have today, it would not equal 1% of what I was given when I came to this great country of ours. The gift of freedom. Right now, it is up to us to decide our fate and to choose freedom over oppression. President Trump, he's fighting the forces of anarchy and communism. And I know he will continue to do just that. And what about his opponent and the rest of the DC swamp? I have no doubt they will hand the country over to those dangerous forces. You and I will decide. And here's what I've decided. My decision is very easy. I choose President Trump because I choose America, I choose freedom. Well, I still hear my dad. There is no other place to go. Thank you, and may the good Lord bless America. Democrats are just going more and more left. Many positive about socialism, liking it more than capitalism. Many of the ideas we fought for that were considered radical are now mainstream. The compromise that uh, they came up with, if implemented, will make Biden the most progressive president uh, since FDR. The radical left has taken over the Democratic Party, and Joe Biden is marching in lockstep with them. Biden and the far left are promising to crush middle class families with trillions in new taxes. If you elect me, your taxes are going to be raised, not cut. Promising amnesty and health care for 11 million illegal immigrants. Citizenship for 11 million undocumented folks. Promising to shut down energy exploration, killing jobs, and hurting America's economy. I we're going to end fossil fuel. In Joe Biden's America, the radical left get whatever they want, and you get to pay for it. They've already taken over Joe Biden and the Democratic Party. Don't let them take over America. Good evening. I'm Nikki Haley, and it's great to be back at the Republican National Convention. I'll start with a little story. It's about an American ambassador to the United Nations, and it's about a speech she gave to this convention. She called for the re-election of the Republican president she served, and she called out his Democratic opponent, a former vice president from a failed administration. That ambassador said, and I quote, Democrats always blame America first. The year was 1984. The president was Ronald Reagan, and Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick's words are just as true today. Joe Biden and the Democrats are still blaming America first. Donald Trump has always put America first, and he has earned four more years as president. It was an honor of a lifetime to serve as the United States Ambassador to the United Nations. Now, the UN is not for the faint of heart. It's a place where dictators, murderers, and thieves denounce America and then put their hands out and demand that we pay their bills. Well, President Trump put an end to all of that. With his leadership, we did what Barack Obama and Joe Biden refused to do. We stood up for America, and we stood against our enemies. Obama and Biden let North Korea threaten America. President Trump rejected that weakness, and we passed the toughest sanctions on North Korea in history. Obama and Biden let Iran get away with murder and literally sent them a plane full of cash. President Trump did the right thing and ripped up the Iran nuclear deal. Obama and Biden led the United Nations to denounce our friend and ally, Israel. President Trump 
moved our embassy to Jerusalem, and when the UN tried to condemn us, I was proud to cast the American veto. This president has a record of strength and success. The former vice president has a record of weakness and failure. Joe Biden is good for Iran and ISIS, great for communist China, and he's a godsend to everyone who wants America to apologize, abstain, and abandon our values. Donald Trump takes a different approach. He's tough on China, and he took on ISIS and won, and he tells the world what it needs to hear. At home, the president is the clear choice on jobs and the economy. He's moved America forward, while Joe Biden has held America back. When Joe was VP, I was governor of the great state of South Carolina. We had a pretty good run. Manufacturers of all kinds flocked to our state from overseas, creating tens of thousands of American jobs. People were referring to South Carolina as the beast of the Southeast, which I loved. Everything we did happened in spite of Joe Biden and his old boss. We cut taxes, they raised them. We slashed red tape, they piled on more mandates. And when we brought in good paying jobs, Biden and Obama sued us. I fought back and they gave up. A Biden-Harris administration would be much, much worse. Last time, Joe's boss was Obama. This time, it would be Pelosi, Sanders, and the squad. Their vision for America is socialism, and we know that socialism has failed everywhere. They want to tell Americans how to live and what to think. They want a government takeover of health care. They want to ban fracking and kill millions of jobs. They want massive tax hikes on working families. Joe Biden and the socialist left would be a disaster for our economy. But President Trump is leading a new era of opportunity. Before communist China gave us the coronavirus, we were breaking economic records left and right. The pandemic has set us back, but not for long. President Trump brought our economy back before, and he will bring it back again. There's one more important area where our president is right. He knows that political correctness and cancel culture are dangerous and just plain wrong. In much of the Democratic Party, it's now fashionable to say that America is racist. That is a lie. America is not a racist country. This is personal for me. I am the proud daughter of Indian immigrants. They came to America and settled in a small southern town. My father wore a turban. My mother wore a sari. I was a brown girl in a black and white world. We faced discrimination and hardship, but my parents never gave in to grievance and hate. My mom built a successful business. My dad taught 30 years at a historically black college. And the people of South Carolina chose me as their first minority and first female governor. America is a story that's a work in progress. Now is the time to build on that progress and make America even freer, fairer, and better for everyone. That's why it's so tragic to see so much of the Democratic Party turning a blind eye towards riots and rage. The American people know we can do better. And of course we value and respect every black life. The black cops who've been shot in the line of duty, they matter. The black small business owners who've watched their life's work go up in flames, they matter. The black kids who've been gunned down on the playground, their lives matter too. And their lives are being ruined and stolen by the violence on our streets. It doesn't have to be like this. It wasn't like this in South Carolina five years ago. Our state came face to face with evil. A white supremacist walked into Mother Emanuel Church during Bible study. 12 African Americans pulled up a chair and prayed with him for an hour. 
Then he began to shoot. After that horrific tragedy, we didn't turn against each other. We came together, black and white, Democrat and Republican. Together, we made the hard choices needed to heal and removed a divisive symbol peacefully and respectfully. What happened then should give us hope now. America isn't perfect, but the principles we hold dear are perfect. There's one thing I've learned. It's that even on our worst day, we are blessed to live in America. It's time to keep that blessing alive for the next generation. This president and this party are committed to that noble task. We seek a nation that rises together, not falls apart in anarchy and anger. We know that the only way to overcome America's challenges is to embrace America's strengths. We are striving to reach a brighter future where every child goes to a world-class school chosen by their parents, where every family lives in a safe community with good jobs, where every entrepreneur has the freedom to achieve and inspire, where every believer can worship without fear and every life is protected where every girl and boy, every woman and man of every race and religion has the best shot at the best life. In this election, we must choose the only candidate who has and who will continue delivering on that vision. President Trump and Vice President Pence have my support and America has our promise. We will build on the progress of our past and unlock the promise of our future. That future starts when the American people re-elect President Donald Trump. Thank you, good night, and may God always bless America. Good evening, America. I'm Donald Trump, Jr. We're here tonight to talk about the great American story, to talk about this country we all love, this land of promise and opportunity, of heroes and greatness. Just a few short months ago, we were seeing the American dream become a reality for more of our citizens than ever before. The greatest prolonged economic expansion in American history, the lowest unemployment rate in nearly 50 years the lowest unemployment rates ever for black Americans, Hispanic Americans, women, and pretty much every other demographic group. And then, courtesy of the Chinese Communist Party, the virus struck. The president quickly took action and shut down travel from China. Joe Biden and his Democrat allies called my father a racist and a xenophobe for doing it. They put political correctness ahead of the safety and security of the American people. Fortunately, as the virus began to spread, the president acted quickly and ensured ventilators got to hospitals that needed them most. He delivered PP&E to our brave frontline workers, and he rallied the mighty American private sector to tackle this new challenge. There's more work to do, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Job gains are outpacing what the so-called experts expected. But Biden's radical left-wing policies would stop our economic recovery cold. He's already talking about shutting the country down again. It's madness. Democrats claim to be for workers, but they've spent the entire pandemic trying to sneak a tax break for millionaires in Democrat states into the COVID relief bill. Then they attacked my father for suspending the payroll tax for middle-class workers. In fact, if you think about it, Joe Biden's entire economic platform seems designed to crush the working man and woman. He supported the worst trade deals in the history of the planet. He voted for the NAFTA nightmare. Down the tubes went our auto industry. He pushed for TPP. Goodbye, manufacturing jobs. Beijing Biden is so weak on China that the intelligence community recently assessed that the Chinese Communist Party favors Biden. They know he'll weaken us both economically and on a world stage. Biden also wants to bring in more illegal immigrants to take jobs from American citizens. 
His open border policies would drive wages down for Americans at a time when low-income workers were getting real wage increases for the first time in modern history. He's pledged to repeal the Trump tax cuts, which were the biggest in our country. After eight years of Obama and Biden's slow growth, Trump's policies have been like rocket fuel to the economy and especially to the middle class. Biden has promised to take that money back out of your pocket and keep it in the swamp. That makes sense, though, considering Joe Biden is basically the Loch Ness Monster of the swamp. For the past half century, he's been lurking around in there. He sticks his head up every now and then to run for president. Then he disappears and doesn't do much in between. So if you're looking for hope, look to the man who did what the failed Obama-Biden administration never could do and built the greatest economy our country has ever seen. And President Trump will do it again. We will be stronger than ever because when we put our mind to it, there is no obstacle that America can't surmount. Except there's a difference this time. In the past, both parties believed in the goodness of America. We agreed on where we wanted to go. We just disagreed on how to get there. This time, the other party is attacking the very principles on which our nation was founded. Freedom of thought, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the rule of law. Thomas Jefferson famously said, I have sworn upon the altar of God eternal hostility against every form of tyranny over the mind of man. Our founders believed there was nothing more important than protecting our God-given right to think for ourselves. Now, the left, they're trying to cancel all of those founders. They don't seem to understand this important principle. In order to improve in the future, we must learn from our past, not erase it. So we're not going to tear down monuments and forget the people who built our great nation. Instead, we will learn from our past so we don't repeat any mistakes, and we will work tirelessly to improve the lives of all Americans. Joe Biden and the radical left are now coming for our freedom of speech. They want to bully us into submission. If they get their way, it will no longer be the silent majority. It will be the silenced majority. This has to stop. Freedom of expression used to be a liberal value at least before the radical left took over. Now the Republican Party is the home of free speech, the place where anyone from any background can speak their mind and may the best ideas win. People of faith are under attack. You're not allowed to go to church, but mass chaos in the streets gets a pass. It's almost like this election is shaping up to be church, work, and school versus rioting, looting, and vandalism or, in the words of Biden and the Democrats, peaceful protesting. Anarchists have been flooding our streets, and Democrat mayors are ordering the police to stand down. Small businesses across America, many of them minority-owned, are being torched by mobs. The Democrat mayors pretend it's not happening. They actually called it a summer of love. And that brings me to another important principle. Every American must be free to live without fear of violence in your country, in your communities, and in your homes. All men and women are created equal and must be treated equally under the law. That's why we must put an end to racism, and we must ensure that any police officer who abuses their powers is held accountable. What happened to George Floyd is a disgrace, and if you know a police officer, you know they agree with that too. But we cannot lose sight of the fact that our police are American heroes. They deserve our deepest appreciation. Because no matter what the Democrats say, you and I both know when we dial 911, we don't want it going to voicemail. So defunding the police is not an option. Everything starts with safety and security. You can't have anything else without it. You can't focus on building a better future for your children without the peace of mind that they can study safely in their classrooms, play safely in their neighborhoods, and sleep safely in their beds. But safety is only the beginning. Trump's America is a land of opportunity, a place of promise. I was fortunate enough to grow up in a family that could afford the best schools and the finest universities. 
But a great education cannot be the exclusive right of the rich and powerful. It must be accessible to all. And that's why my dad is pro-school choice. That's why he's called education access the civil rights issue, not just of our time, but of all time. It is unacceptable that too many African-American and Hispanic-American children are stuck in bad schools just because of their zip code. Donald Trump will not stand for it. If Democrats really wanted to help minorities and underserved communities, instead of bowing to big money union bosses, they'd let parents choose what school is best for their kids. They'd limit immigration to protect American workers. They'd support the police who protect our neighborhoods. They'd learn how to negotiate trade deals that prioritize America's interest for a change. They'd end the endless wars and quit sending our young people to solve problems in foreign lands. They'd cut taxes for families and workers. They'd create opportunity zones that drive investment into inner cities. In other words, if Democrats cared for the forgotten men and women of our country, they'd do exactly what President Trump is doing. America is the greatest country on earth, but my father's entire worldview revolves around the idea that we can always do even better. Imagine the life you want to have, one with a great job, a beautiful home, a perfect family. You can have it. Imagine the country you want to live in, one with true equal opportunity, where hard work pays off and justice is served with compassion and without partiality. You can have it. Imagine a world where the evils of communism and radical Islamic terrorism are not given a chance to spread, where heroes are celebrated and the good guys win. You can have it. That is the life. That is the country. That is the world that Donald Trump and the Republican Party are after. And yes, you can have it. Because unlike Joe Biden and the radical left Democrats, our party is open to everyone. It starts by rejecting radicals who want to drag us into the dark and embracing the man who represents a bright and beautiful future for all. It starts by reelecting Donald J. Trump, President of the United States. Thank you and God bless America. Catalina Lauf. I work in the political space. And I'm Madeline Lauf, and I'm the founder of Begin Health, a children's nutritional company. We grew up in a really small town outside of Chicago. Our mom's from Guatemala. Our dad's a small business owner from Chicago, and so we brought two different cultures together to create us. A little bit of crazy and um, a little bit of fun, yeah. I guess. <laughs> They taught us the values of hard work, liberty, to love this country unapologetically. Our dad is a beekeeper and just had so many different things out in the countryside and it was just such a sweet point. We grew up selling honey yeah. at, at farmer's markets, so yeah. my line was, uh, have you ever been stung by a bee? Yeah. <laughs> but really it was teaching us again, entrepreneurship, small business, self-reliance, and that we're the ones that need to put in the hard work to get what we want. You know, my mother being from Guatemala, escaping what she had there growing up in poverty and coming here to the United States, being able to fulfill her destiny and be somebody that she couldn't there in her home country. And they really instilled in us the sense of um, purpose, but also uh, self-accountability and that we had to strive to do the things that we wanted and it was up to us to make those things happen. In America, there's no ceiling of opportunity. You know, you define your own destiny through personal responsibility, through hard work, through having a moral value system. That's the American dream, and President Trump's providing that for everybody. Look at my business, Begin Health. As a small startup that is growing and launching, we are constantly trying to innovate, and the big challenge that COVID brought that we just didn't see coming was that just almost everything kind of just shut down. And when you are a small startup and you have limited funding and the funding is really only to kind of get you to that next milestone, 
we were really struggling. And so we were able to apply for a PPP loan, which really helped allow us to continue hiring and working and developing our products so that we could ultimately still launch. It's now more than ever so important to have a president and an administration that understands that small business is the backbone of our economy. Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was huge. Manufacturing, deregulation, fair trade. These are things that affected real Americans. We have a champion in the Oval Office who has this business background. He actually understands the need for small businesses like my sisters to survive. We aren't the stereotypical conservative. I mean, we're, we come from Hispanic descent and we're millennial women and that's not what the media wants. And so somebody like AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, this far left, these women come out with these very, very destructive political ideologies that are trying to infiltrate millennials and the next generation. I've decided to step up and say, well, we need a counter voice to these women. There has been an assault on capitalism, just generally. And I think it's very scary to imagine a Biden world where the progressive wing ideas are starting to take front and center stage. You know, that will really choke the American economy. There will be over-regulation, over-taxation. It's very hard to innovate through those two things. And ultimately, what's really sad is the thought of you know, making all of us dependent on the government, and we are not going to allow that. I've seen a lot of moderates, a lot of people now changing over because of everything that's been happening. This is a taste of Biden's America. I mean, this the rioting, the crime, freedom is at stake now, and this is going to be the most important election of our lifetime. We want to preserve the America that our mother came here for having a thriving economy that is keeping America great, and President Trump has delivered on that promise. He's truly fighting for the American people. We're the greatest country in the world, period. On our worst day, we're still the greatest country in the world. And in order to preserve that, it's by putting America first, having a thriving economy, having happiness. Good evening. I'm Senator Tim Scott from the great state of South Carolina. To all of you tuning in and participating in the political process, God bless you. This isn't how I picture tonight, but our country is experiencing something none of us envisioned. From a global pandemic to the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, 2020 has tested our nation in ways we haven't seen for decades. But regardless of the challenges presented to us, every four years, Americans come together to vote, to share stories of what makes our nation strong and the lessons we have learned that can strengthen it for further generations. Because while this election is between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, it is not solely about Donald Trump and Joe Biden. It's about the promise of America. It's about you and me, our challenges and heartbreaks, hopes and dreams. It's about how we respond when tackling critical issues like police reform, when Democrats called our work a token effort and walked out of the room during negotiations because they wanted the issue more than they wanted a solution. Do we want a society that breeds success or a culture that cancels everything it even slightly disagrees with? I know where I stand, because you see, I am living my mother's American dream. My parents divorced when I was seven years old, and we moved in with my grandparents into a two-bedroom home with me, my mom, and my brother sharing a room and one bed. My mom worked 16 hours a day to keep food on the table and a roof over our heads. She knew that if we could find the opportunity, bigger things would come. I thought I had to use football to succeed in life, and my focus on academics faded away. My freshman year, I failed out. I failed four subjects, Spanish, English, world geography, and even civics. Trust me though, after seven years in the Senate, I know I'm not the only one in Congress who failed civics. 
But even while I was failing the ninth grade, my mother always said to me, Timmy, if you would just shoot for the moon, even if you miss, you'll be among the stars. She never lost faith in me, even when I lost faith in myself. Because of her encouragement, I went to summer school and caught up. The next year, I met my mentor, John Moniz, a Chick-fil-A operator. John saw something in me that I could not see in myself and started teaching me valuable life lessons. Like having a job would be a good thing, but creating jobs would be even better. That having an income could change my lifestyle, but creating a profit could change my community. He planted the seeds of what would become Opportunity Zones. This initiative that the president and I worked together on is now bringing more than $75 billion of private sector investment into distressed communities. I took those lessons to heart and started putting the pieces of my life back together. I realized a quality education is the closest thing to magic in America. That's why I fight to this day for school choice, to make sure every child in every neighborhood has a quality education. I don't care if it's a public, private, charter, virtual, or a home school. When a parent has a choice, their kid has a better chance. And the president has fought alongside me on that. Later in life, I started my own small business. That's why I know it is critical for us to have a tax code that encourages growth. We actually saw revenues to the Treasury increase after we lowered taxes in 2017. Rest assured, the Democrats do not want you to know that. After starting my small business and spending some time in local government, I decided to run for Congress in 2010. The district is based in Charleston, South Carolina, where the Civil War started, against a son of our legendary Senator, Strom Thurmond. You may be asking yourself, how does a poor black kid from a single parent household run and win in a race crowded with Republicans against a Thurmond? Because of the evolution of the Southern heart. In an overwhelmingly white district, the voters judged me not on the color of my skin, but on the content of my character. We live in a world that only wants you to believe in the bad news, racially, economically, and culturally polarizing news. The truth is, our nation's arc always bends back towards fairness. We are not fully where we want to be, but I thank God Almighty we are not where we used to be. We are always striving to be better. When we stumble, and we will, we pick ourselves back up and try again. We don't give in to cancel culture or the radical and factually baseless belief that things are worse today than in the 1860s or the 1960s. We have work to do, but I believe in the goodness of America. The promise that all men and all women are created equal. And if you're watching tonight, I'm betting you do too. Over the past four years, we have made tremendous progress towards that promise. President Trump built the most inclusive economy ever. Seven million jobs created pre-COVID-19 and two thirds of them went to women, African-Americans, and Hispanics. The first new major effort to tackle poverty in a generation, Opportunity Zones. We put hard-earned tax dollars back in people's pockets by cutting their taxes, especially for single-parent households like the one I grew up in, cutting single mothers' taxes 70% on average. President Trump supported these tax cuts for those single moms and other working families and signed these policies into law, and our nation is better off for it. So I'm going to ask you, the American people, not to simply look at what the candidates say, but to look back at what they've done. This election is about your future 
and it is critical to paint a full picture of the records of Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Joe Biden said if a black man didn't vote for him, he wasn't truly black. Joe Biden said black people are a monolithic community. It was Joe Biden who said poor kids can be just as smart as white kids. And while his words are one thing, his actions take it to a whole new level. In 1994, Biden led the charge on a crime bill that put millions of black Americans behind bars. President Trump's criminal justice reform law fixed many of the disparities Biden created and made our system more fair and just for all Americans. Joe Biden also failed our nation's historically black colleges and universities, heaping blame on them as they fought to ensure our young folks had access to higher education. Once again, to clean up Joe Biden's mess, President Trump signed into law historically high funding for HBCUs, as well as a bill to give them permanent funding for the first time ever. And now Joe Biden wants to come for your pocketbooks. Unless, of course, you're a blue state millionaire. I'm serious. That's one of their solutions for the pandemic. They want to take more money from your pocket and give it to Manhattan elites and Hollywood moguls so they get a tax break. Republicans, however, passed President Trump's once-in-a-generation tax reform bill that lowered taxes for single moms, working families, and those in need. So when it comes to what Joe Biden says he'll do, look at his actions, look at his policies, look at what he already did and what he didn't do while he's been in Washington for 47 years. Ladies and gentlemen, people don't always see those failures because they think we're having a policy debate on two sides of an issue. That is not what is happening. Our side is working on policy while Joe Biden's radical Democrats are trying to permanently transform what it means to be an American. Make no mistake, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris want a cultural revolution, a fundamentally different America. If we let them, they will turn our country into a socialist utopia. And history has taught us that path only leads to pain and misery especially for hardworking people hoping to rise. Instead, we must focus on the promise of the American journey. I know that journey well. My grandfather's 99th birthday would have been tomorrow. Growing up, he had to cross the street if a white person was coming. He suffered the indignity of being forced out of school as a third grader to pick cotton, and he never learned to read or write. Yet, he lived long enough to see his grandson become the first African American to be elected to both the United States House and the United States Senate in the history of this country. Our family went from cotton to Congress in one lifetime. And that's why I believe the next American century can be better than the last. There are millions of families just like mine all across this nation full of potential seeking to live the American dream. And I'm here tonight to tell you that supporting the Republican ticket gives you the best chance of making that dream a reality. God bless you. And Father, please continue blessing the United States of America. God bless. All right, you have been listening to day one of the Republican National Convention. There is a lot to unpack, and we're going to do that right after a quick break. Stay with us. You're streaming CBSN.
Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Time. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original That's recording. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah. The more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You were donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Even really young kids are feeling what's going on right now. How should parents be talking to them about this whole question of racial justice? How do we embrace this moment and turn it into real change? What we really must focus on is moving from protesting to policy. Join Gail, Anthony, and Tony on CBS This Morning. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. You can watch CBSN 24-7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. You can watch CBSN 24-7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day. everyone, I'm Elaine Quijano. Thank you for joining us for our special coverage of day one of the 2020 Republican National Convention. It was the Republicans' turn to present their case to Americans Monday night about why President Trump should remain in the White House for the next four years. The Republican National Convention kicked off earlier in the day in Charlotte, North Carolina, where delegates participated in an in-person roll call and officially renominated President Trump and Vice President Mike Pence. The theme for the first First night was Land of Promises. Speakers praised President Trump's leadership and his handling of the pandemic. While most of them criticized the Democratic Party's presidential nominee, Joe Biden, and attacked his proposed policies. Florida Congressman Matt Gates likened the prospect of Joe Biden's election to a horror movie while he praised President Trump's vision for the country. The president and his supporters also touted his response to the coronavirus while standing alongside frontline workers in the White House. A nurse from Virginia and a COVID-19 patient also praised his leadership on the pandemic. Former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley embraced President Trump's vision for the future and denounced Democrats' position on foreign policy. And the president's eldest son, Donald Trump Jr., defended his father's record on the economy. He tried to remind voters of the country's gains before the coronavirus pandemic struck. Here's some of what you may have missed. 
If you watched the DNC last week, you probably noticed that Democrats spent a lot of time talking about how much they despise our president. But we heard very little about their actual policies. The truth is, there's only one person who has empathized with everyday Americans and actually been fighting for them over the past four years, and that is President Donald Trump. Settle for Biden. That's the hashtag promoted by AOC and the socialists. The Woketopians will settle for Biden because they will make him an extra in a movie written, produced, and directed by others. It's a horror film, really. They'll disarm you, empty the prisons, lock you in your home, and invite MS-13 to live next door. And the police aren't coming when you call. In Democrat-run cities, they're already being defunded. Look at what's happening in American cities. Cities all run by Democrats. Crime, violence, and mob rule. Democrats refuse to denounce the mob, and their response to the chaos? Defund the police, defund Border Patrol, and defund our military. And while they're doing all this, they're also trying to take away your guns. Look at the positions they've taken in the past few months. Democrats won't let you go to church, but they'll let you protest. Democrats won't let you go to work, but they'll let you riot. And Democrats won't let you go to school, but they'll let you go loot. The Democratic Party does not want black people to leave their mental plantation. We've been forced to be there for decades and generations. This is no time for sleeping in the basement. Joe Biden has had 47 years to produce results. But he's been all talk and no action, just like so many of the Democrats who've been making promises to the black voters for decades. Then the president did what he said he would do. He took action. He formed a school safety commission that issued dozens of recommendations to make schools safer. But I'll bet you never heard about that. Instead, the media turned my daughter's murder went to a coordinated attack on President Trump, Republicans, and our Second Amendment. I truly believe the safety of our kids depends on whether this man is reelected. Whether it's the defunding of police, ending cash bail so criminals can be released back out on the streets the same day to riot again, or encouraging anarchy and chaos on our streets. It seems as if the Democrats no longer view the government's job as protecting honest citizens from criminals, but rather protecting criminals from honest citizens. These are the policies that are coming to a neighborhood near you. So make no mistake, no matter where you live, your family will not be safe in the radical Democrats' America. Rioters must not be allowed to destroy our cities. Human sex drug traffickers should not be allowed to cross our border. The same socialist policies which destroyed places like Cuba and Venezuela must not take root in our cities and our schools. Anarchists have been flooding our streets and Democrat mayors are ordering the police to stand down. The Democrat mayors pretend it's not happening. They actually called it a summer of love. And that brings me to another important principle. Every American must be free to live without fear of violence in your country, in your communities, and in your homes. In much of the Democratic Party, it's now fashionable to say that America is racist. That is a lie. America is not a racist country. We seek a nation that rises together not falls apart in anarchy and anger. We know that the only way to overcome America's challenges is to embrace America's strengths. Let's bring in Caitlin Huey Burns, Lonnie Chen, and Antoine Seawright. Caitlin is our CBSN political reporter. Lonnie is a Republican strategist and former policy director for Mitt Romney's presidential campaign. And Antoine is a CBS News political contributor and Democratic strategist. Wonderful to see you all. Thank you for being here on day one of the convention. I just want to start off by going around and getting initial takes from everyone, starting with you, Caitlin. What stood out to you from day one of the Republican convention? 
A couple of things stood out to me. First, if you were listening to the speeches from Nikki Haley and uh, Senator Tim Scott, who had an incredibly compelling line about his family witnessing going from cotton to Congress in one lifetime, that was extraordinarily uh, compelling and thoughtful uh, and, and really spoke to um, Tim Scott as, as a person and, and what he represents. Um, compare that to some of the speeches that you heard earlier in the night from people like Kimber Kimberly Guilfoyle, uh, the couple in Missouri, um, two very different views. And I was actually thinking back to 2016 when I was at a Marco Rubio event in South Carolina covering an endorsement that he got from Nikki Haley and Tim Scott. They joined him on stage there in Greenville four years ago. And Nikki Haley proclaimed that group as the future of the Republican Party and said that it looked like a Benetton commercial. Um, so, wow, things have, have really changed over the past four years that uh, these are two figures who are supporting. Uh, Donald Trump. Um, but what we heard tonight uh, was a response to um, basically what was interesting to me was that um, Republicans kind of acted as if the president were not the president, that he was running against Joe Biden, who was president. Um, the way in which they talked about how um, cities are, um, you know, overrun with protesters and, and the like, and how the country is turning into to socialism, um, kind of acted as if Donald Trump were not in charge right now, and kind of ignored the, the fact that there is a pandemic going on. So a lot of the speakers were trying to get the audience to focus on what the economy looked like before the pandemic. Now, that could be a produ an effective argument because we see in polling that Trump does lead Biden on the economy. Um, but many of the speakers kind of acted as if everything was fine just until the pandemic. And we know also that voters are judging Trump's handling of the pandemic poorly. And that's also helping Joe Biden's rise in some of these battleground state polls. Right, a pandemic in which we now know, according to Johns Hopkins, there are more than 5 million confirmed cases in the United States, more than 177,000 deaths across the country. Uh, Lan Hee Chen, what stood out to you? I think what you saw tonight, Elaine, was a tale of two different conventions. I think in the first hour, you saw an effort uh, on mm -hmm. the part of the Trump campaign and the RNC <laughs> to speak to the base of support for President Trump. Uh, you saw a number of speeches that really tried to animate and mobilize that base. Uh, and I think that was one of the things that they wanted to do coming into this week, to make sure that the president's supporters were able to hear enough red meat, so to speak, to get them excited and interested to turn out and, and to mobilize ahead of the November elections. Uh, I think that the second hour, the, the hour uh, that just ended, was really more about trying to expand the president's electoral base, to figure out a way to speak to voters that maybe uh, are undecided or voters who are trying to figure out exactly who they support. Maybe they're disaffected by the far left, in particular the influences of people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Bernie Sanders, and they're looking for an alternate vision. And I think you saw some of that presented by Tim Scott and Nikki Haley and others. So the effort to draw that contrast, to demonstrate that President Trump can be a leader for that part of the country that isn't yet decided on who they're going to vote for. I think that was what you saw in that second hour. So very different convention um, orientations, speaking to different goals, looking to get different things done, uh, but I think both effective in their own way. Antoine Seawright, from your perspective, what did you see and hear as the message? I saw the biggest disconnect of reality I've ever seen in my life and felt like, in fact, I felt like I was living on another planet watching that convention speak. First of all, let's start with the diversity. You can make an honest comparison of the diversity you saw all of last week uh, from the Democratic convention compared to the lack of diversity you saw tonight with the Republican convention. I saw validators of the president uh, clearly with a message trying to connect where there was no connection. It is very clear from the speakers and from the rhetoric, they realized, like most of us, the president is on political life support, and they were trying to do everything they can to bring validation of why he deserves a second term. 
I did not hear the reality that we're living through the worst pandemic since 1918. I did not hear from anyone of how this virus has disproportionately impacted African Americans and, and other communities and how the Republican Party would provide answers to that. I did not even hear, as Caitlin pointed out, uh, in a different way of how the simple fact that they are in charge of both the Senate and the White House, but yet they are positioning their arguments as if Joe Biden somehow was the president of the United States. And with all due respect to Nikki Haley and Tim Scott, I'm from South Carolina, so I know their body of work and their records like no one else on this uh, on within this group here tonight. And so some of the arguments I heard from them were just the same tired Republican arguments we hear uh, convention after convention, day after day, doing their best trying to defend the president. And while Tim Scott had a great line about his story of, you know, from cotton to Congress, with all due respect, the party he is a part of and the president that he's advocating for wants to suppress the vote of cotton pickers like my grandparents, if they were still alive, and even today, people who look like me. And so I don't buy into the arguments. And for Nikki Haley to mention the Emmanuel 9, I'm old enough to remember it was in 2014 in the middle of a very heated governor's race. She did not want the Confederate battle flag to come down off of the Capitol. Sadly, it took nine people dying in a church in Charleston in order for that flag to be removed. And so the disconnect of reality, I heard it and I was able to see it on full display tonight. Um, you know, I want to come back to Tim Scott in a moment, but I want to turn back to, to uh, this notion of sort of systemic racism. Uh, if we can control room, let's play SOT 12. This is Nikki Haley. We heard a little bit of this off the top of the show, uh, but I want to go ahead and listen to this SOT, and then, Caitlin, I'm going to ask you a question on the other side. We live in a world that only wants you to believe in the bad news, racially, economically, and culturally polarizing news. The truth is, our nation's arc always bends back towards fairness. We are not fully where we want to be, but I thank God Almighty we are not where we used to be. We don't give in to cancel culture or the radical and factually baseless belief that things are worse today than in the 1860s or the 1960s. All right, so that wasn't exactly the thought I was looking for, but while we have that thought of play, I do want to ask about the overall tone here, Caitlin, because clearly, uh, as we heard from that soundbite from Senator Scott, there was an attempt on the part of some speakers, including Senator Scott, to sort of paint this very optimistic, uh, kind of uplifting picture, something that we know the president himself uh, has tried to do at various turns. Can you talk to me a little bit about that, though, because it did sort of stand in sharp contrast to some of what we heard earlier from other speakers about sort of a very kind of stark vision, very sort of negative kind of images of what could happen under a Biden presidency. That's right. And, and Tim Scott it has a very moving story. He is a historic figure in his own right. And there was a strategic uh, play to have him given this primetime speaking spot, because that's the message that the team wanted to convey. Um, it's interesting hearing, though, what he was saying was a lot of what the other Republican speakers were saying as well, which is, because the, the Trump administration is in charge and because there's a pandemic uh, with no clear end in sight, because the economy is really in shamble, shambles because of that pandemic, and we've seen layers upon layers upon layers of kind of how that is affecting people, um, they have to be able to point the finger at, at someone else. And so you're hearing Republicans do that tonight by um, kind of blaming it all, or not blaming it all, but, but kind of trying to get an audience to imagine what an alternative would be. Um, last week, Democrats kind of saw that coming, and that's why you saw them feature former Republicans in their convention speeches and give limited time to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, because they knew they would be um, described in broad terms as socialists and of the AOC mold. So they tried to kind of pre-butt that. And I think we saw that uh, tonight through a, a lot of these speeches, and especially through the speeches that focused on socialism. 
Yeah, and Lonnie, I want to get your take on this as well. Just this overall notion of trying to paint this optimistic picture and at the same time, the very nature of conventions themselves now in this year in 2020 have been fundamentally altered because of the reality of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, how challenging is that in this kind of, um, you know, format where they obviously are trying to focus on the good they say the president did uh, before the pandemic, and yet just by virtue of the format, it seems to underscore the very gravity of what is facing Americans every day. Well, there are challenges, Elaine, in two respects. First of all, quite obviously, talking about the format and the way in which this convention has to be pulled off. Uh, people have to recognize the incredible toll that COVID-19 has taken on American society over these last several months. And the necessity of the format speaks to some of the challenge created by that. But also looking ahead, point uh, painting an optimistic picture at a time when the virus is still very much a part of people's lives, if not directly, certainly they're feeling the impacts of it, whether economic or their kids not being able to go to school or looking ahead, thinking about when life will return to life as normal. I think all of those questions are implicated by, uh, by what's going on right now. So there is a huge influence and a very difficult task that Republicans and Democrats had the same challenge last week. I do think that what we saw today was high production value, an effort to turn people's attention to uh, maybe what could be instead of what is or what was. And I think that's the best one can do under the circumstances. Yeah. Um, I want to turn to, um, if we can, Antoine, uh, let's listen to this uh, sought from Donald Trump Jr., some remarks that he made. Uh, we've had this discussion about race and policing in this country. There's been so much uh, debate over the role of police in communities nationwide. Let's go ahead and listen to what some, some of Donald uh, Trump Jr. said about this, and, and we'll take a, a uh, just a, a kind of survey, uh, starting with you, Antoine, what you, what you made of it. We must put an end to racism, and we must ensure that any police officer who abuses their powers is held accountable. What happened to George Floyd is a disgrace, and if you know a police officer, you know they agree with that too. But we cannot lose sight of the fact that our police are American heroes. They deserve our deepest appreciation. Because no matter what the Democrats say, you and I both know when we dial 911, we don't want it going to voicemail. So defunding the police is not an option. So, Antoine, we know that Joe Biden has said that he does not support this notion of defunding the police. What did you hear in those remarks from Donald Trump Jr.? I heard someone who sounds very fluent and privileged. The truth of the matter is, no matter how the Republicans, including Donald Trump Jr., try to distract us from the reality, uh, in a real way, black and brown people uh, have been impacted by police violence more so than any other constituencies uh, in the country. That is fact. That is not a matter of opinion. I'm also old enough to remember his father uh, at a gathering, I think it was last year, maybe the year before last, uh, urging uh, police officers to be uh, more rough. Uh, with those they have in custody. And so a lot of the violence and a lot of the things we see and hear and hear about in this country as a result of the lack of leadership at the top. And so when I hear Donald Trump say things like he said tonight, I would just ask him to remember people are more convinced by what you and your father do versus what you say. Um, Caitlin, let me ask you, you know, we all remember, of course, uh, those demonstrations, uh, some of which continue in the wake of George Floyd's death. And there was a time when it was thought there could potentially be some movement on legislation, some sort of police reform legislation. Uh, remind us what happened there, and is there any kind of sense that there may be kind of uh, movement on this issue uh, in this, you know, in this year, because you have a lot of folks who were very hopeful at one point, and you don't seem to hear too much about it now. 
That's right. It seems like a distant memory when the House came up with a, the Democrats in the House came up with a policing proposal and the White House also came out with a proposal. Um, as everyone on this panel knows, the worst thing for legislation on Capitol Hill is time. And quite frankly, lots of time has passed and there hadn't been I think for something like this, there needed to be some leadership from the White House to be able to bring a lot of these different factions together. Uh, so that has really fallen to the wayside. And the arguments on, on all sides of this have kind of become entrenched. Um, you have, as you heard tonight, several speakers uh, talking about this defund the police aspect um, and really kind of playing playing that up, even though Joe Biden does not support defunding the police and supports rearranging some, some funding, which is kind of at the, the heart of that. Um, but it does show kind of how this, as well as lots of other really tough issues, have become politicized and polarized um, and, and even more difficult to gain any traction on, especially in an election year. Hey, you know, hey Elaine, I'm can I just remind get... people? Yeah, go ahead, Antoine. Can I just remind people that it's been the House Democrats that have led on these issues and most of the answers to some of the problems, to most of the problems we face in this country, the legislative answers lie in Mitch McConnell's Senate, led by the Republicans with no leadership from the White House. So when you think about gun violence, i.e. the Charleston massacre, the Charleston loophole, that bill been passed by the House, sits in the Senate. Police reform passed by the House, sit in the Senate. There's not an issue that we face in this country. Uh, for the most part, that legislation has not been passed that does not sit in the Senate in which we see no leadership from the majority party, uh, including the president of the United States, trying to deliver on these issues. That's why these arguments fall on really cold ice for me tonight from some of these validators of the president. So, you know, I was going to ask uh, Lonnie about the idea of the gap. Uh, what does it say that there has not been movement? Because I believe it was Senator Scott himself, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, at the time when it seemed there could potentially be some movement when negotiations on this issue of perhaps some sort of police reform legislation uh, seemed to be at their apex, I believe it was Senator Scott, Lonnie, right? And, and uh, what does it say about the gulf between the way in which some Americans view this issue, that it is a... Uh, as we heard from Donald Trump Jr., perhaps, you know, a problem with individuals versus the view of others who say there are systemic institutional problems that exist uh, that must be addressed in this kind of comprehensive way. Um, it would seem to be the two sides are very far apart, Lonnie. Two sides are very far apart. And I, and I think what you're seeing is you're seeing how political polarization has an impact on uh, on our ability to get things done. I think that's why Americans are frustrated. They don't understand why it is that we can't get common sense things done, whether it's with respect to uh, legislation on guns, legislation on climate, legislation on immigration, even getting a stimulus package done to deal with the economic impacts of the coronavirus. All of these things point to the significant amount of disagreement between the two sides, not only on basic principles, but really on tactics as well. I mean, if we look to, for example, the coronavirus legislation as an example, uh, those efforts were stymied by the fact that you had Democrats wanting to shoot the moon, in essence, wanting to put everything they could into a package, which they knew that Republicans would never expect. It was an insincere argument to begin with. And there are probably examples of that writ large as well in other issue areas. So that the idea that one party alone is to blame or one party's lack of leadership is to blame on this uh, is a misapprehension of what's going on. What you have is both sides deciding rather cynically that in an election year, they're not interested in really working together to get things done. And so things that are urgent priorities, like, for example, addressing some of the issues that were surfaced by uh, by the protests following George Floyd's murder, some of those issues haven't been addressed. And I think that is the price that Americans are paying for the kind of polarization we're seeing. But All right, we've seen how night Night one has gone, and I want to look ahead just a little bit here, Caitlin, before I let you all go. Uh, you know, we have a sense now how this is going to work, uh, or at least we think we do, <laughs> um, having gone through the first night. Mm. What is it that you're going to be looking forward to here as the week progresses? 
Well, I would point to what we saw in polling uh, this weekend from our CBS polling that showed 90 percent of Republicans want to hear a positive vision from Donald Trump and Mike Pence. So I'm curious how uh, they do, if and how they do that, and especially if and how they address the pandemic going on right now. I'm also really interested to hear about the economic arguments, because you heard from some of the speakers tonight picking up on Joe Biden's comments a couple days ago during an interview in which he said that he would be guided by the science, and if the science led to shutting down the economy again, um, he would follow the science. Some of the Republicans tonight picked up on that. Um, when we look at, at polling, it, it's really interesting to see that Donald Trump still leads on the economy, but people's views about the pandemic are kind of overriding that, that people who judge Trump, uh, give Trump bad grades on the the coronavirus pandemic and his handling of it um, are, are supporting Joe Biden. So I'm interested to see whether and how they can kind of thread that economic point, which is one of the few strong suits or cards that the uh, administration has to play. All right, we look forward to that. Caitlin Huey Burns, Lonnie Chen, and Antoine Seawright, thank you all very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. That does it for our coverage of day one of the Republican National Convention. Join us here again tomorrow for day two. Our pre show starts right here at 8 p.m. Eastern. Make sure to download the free CBS News app so you can continue watching updates from the RNC for the rest of this week. We'll have more news after a break. Stick with us. You're streaming CBSN. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative. Da, 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 da. And truly original That's reporting. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. COVID has taken the lives of tens of thousands of Americans. Rural areas like this here on Navajo Nation are especially hit hard. 15 to 30 percent of our Navajo citizens don't have running water. In any indigenous reservation, there is a shortage of physicians. Native Americans are amongst the most vulnerable and hardest hit by COVID. Yeah, the more we lose our elders to COVID-19, the more we lose our language and our way of life. We need to bring awareness to the attention of Washington, D.C. and United States citizens that there is a need to focus on the first citizens of this country. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Even really young kids are feeling what's going on right now. How should parents be talking to them about this whole question of racial justice? How do we embrace this moment and turn it into real change? What we really must focus on is moving from protesting to policy. Join Gail, Anthony, and Tony on CBS This Morning. CBSN Los Angeles. Get local news, breaking news, anytime, anywhere. It's easy to find us, and it's free. Download the CBS News app on your favorite devices. CBSN Los Angeles, streaming 24-7. You can watch CBSN 24-7. I've got an amazing story to share with you. I understand you have some breaking news. How does it all play out? It's quite an adventure here at CBSN. It's been a day.
Over 600 wildfires have erupted across California due to dry lightning storms and record high temperatures. Jonathan Vigliotti reports on the worst of the fires. Tonight, wildfires have displaced more than nearly 200,000 Californians. Almost a million and a half acres the size of the Grand Canyon are in the firefighting lines. Much of it so rugged, the attack can only be by air. Included in the carnage, the state's oldest skyscrapers. These redwoods have lived hundreds of years, and we're told hundreds of them have been destroyed in what has been a historic and deadly nine days. Fire crews say it could take weeks to extinguish all of the flames. Overnight, 10 more fires started after lightning struck again. It's, it's a tough day today. It's possibly with the hot, dry winds that may hamper some of our control efforts. Tough day and risk for 14,000 firefighters deployed, 96% of California's fighting force, up against the unimagined flaming roads. A firefighter videotaped this driving near Santa Cruz. Statewide, 12,000 structures have been destroyed and another 30,000 threatened. California's Supreme Court has overturned the death sentence of the man convicted of killing his wife, Lacey Peterson. The pregnant school teacher was murdered on Christmas Eve more than 15 years ago. Her husband, Scott Peterson, was found guilty. He has been housed on death row at San Quentin State Prison since 2004. The court threw out the death sentence Monday after it found a series of, quote, clear and significant errors that undermined his right to an impartial jury. The decision leaves Peterson's murder conviction in place, but orders a new penalty phase trial. Prosecutors will be allowed to seek another death sentence during that trial. Peterson maintains his innocence. Wisconsin's governor is sending up to 200 National Guard troops to the city of Kenosha to manage protests. The demonstration started after police shot a black man in the back several times. Two of the officers involved have been placed on administrative leave. And a warning to viewers, the following footage is disturbing. Mola Lenghi reports. This 20 seconds of video taken by eyewitness Rayshawn White shows the moment 29-year-old Jacob Blake was shot in the back by a Kenosha police officer. At least seven bullets were fired. You can see as he walked to the driver's side of an SUV, an officer grabbing Blake's shirt as he got inside. Rayshawn White describes what happened before he started filming. One officer had him in a headlock. He was pulling his arm. The other officer had him in a headlock punching him in his ribs and he kind of maneuvered out the way and the female officer tased him. Police were responding to a domestic disturbance call on Sunday evening. Somebody says Jacob Blake isn't supposed to be there and he took the complainant's keys 